cut off his turban? I think the way he handled it, yes. and I've never been a New Democrat, <laughs> um, but I was proud of the manner in which he ha handled it. And frankly, it's instances like that is probably one of the reasons why he's seen his support grow in this campaign. Of course, no one likes um, the, the, the type of uh, vitriol you see in instances like that, um, but we expect our political leaders to respond in a unifying manner with eloquence, and I think in that instance he did. And so I look at shiny moments during the campaign, and I think that's one of them. All right. We have clearly a lot to talk about, and we're going to be here for many hours. But right now, we're going to put this conversation on hold, and I'm going to send it out to the field. Pam Seidel, my colleague, is standing by at a polling station right here in Toronto. Pam. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Yes, the polling stations are still open, as you probably are well aware. Uh, for another, I think it's about 24 minutes, actually. Uh, they close at 9.30. And for the most part, all reports are that things have been very going very smoothly as far as the voting process goes. We are at the Indigenous Community Centre here on Spadina Road, just north of Bloor, and there has been a steady stream, a lot of traffic going in and out. But when I spoke with uh, the staff, here they confirmed that there have been very few problems and that people have not had to wait long in order to vote. I also checked with a representative from Elections Canada earlier today and he agreed he said that as far as his information goes that has been the story across Canada that uh, really have, things have have been going pretty smoothly. You know you might not realize there are more than 70,000 polling stations across Canada where you can cast a ballot. So would not be surprising if there were a few glitches, but besides a short-lived power outage here in the city where a staff had to guide voters with flashlights uh, to uh, mark their ballots, a few other complaints. I think Elections Canada is pretty pleased with their record today. One of the most fascinating things is the number of people who have come in here that I have talked to who truly have not yet decided, even as they are going through these doors, have not yet decided who they are going to vote for. Coming up, we'll speak to a few of them. All right, Pam, many analysts will predict this election is going to be won or lost here in the GTA. This map that you see behind me here, this is 2015 Toronto, and you can see a liberal sweep here, all 25 ridings in red. Take a little bit further out, and we're going to look across the 905, and it's a fairly similar story where you see mostly liberal, and you'll see spottings of uh, green, blue, but fairly consistent here. We're going to be at the big board all night long. We're going to see how this map changes. But first up, here's a look at some of the key races we'll be watching. Olympic gold medalist Adam Vancouverden is hoping to make a splash as he dips his paddle into the political waters. Well, I'd love to be able to earn your support in this federal election. Now the retired running. kayaker is the new star candidate for the Liberals in Milton, where he'll be looking to unseat Deputy Conservative leader Lisa Raitt. And we've not been into the red parts yet. I'm going there tonight, though. So Raitt will be fighting for her political life. The veteran incumbent won this riding by a slim 5% margin in 2015. It's one of the most unique ridings in the country. 90% of voters in Brampton East are considered to be visible minorities, while 59% are considered immigrants. We're excited. With the incumbent not running again, it will be up to Maninder Sidhu to retain the seat for the Liberals. He'll face a tough challenge from Ramona Singh of the Conservatives. And don't forget the NDP. Leader Jagmeet Singh used to represent this riding provincially, and that means plenty of orange lawn signs have been popping up. Sticking with the 905, we'll be keeping our eye on several tight races in Mississauga. Liberal Sven Spangman will be looking to hold on to his job in Mississauga Lakeshore, a seat he stole away from the conservative Stella Ambler four years ago. Ambler is running again in a race that's been labeled too close to call. The neighboring ridings of Mississauga Aaron Mills and Mississauga Streetsville are also considered toss-ups. In both cases, the Tories are looking to snatch them away from the Liberals. It's an area that was once represented by late NDP leader Jack Layton. Toronto Danforth could also change hands tonight. The Liberals won this riding by just over 1,200 votes last time around, and NDP candidate Min Suk Lee is looking to steal it back from Julie De Bruzen. And forget about red, orange, blue and green, voters in markham Stouffville could opt for none of those traditional colours tonight. Incumbent Jane Philpott is running as an independent after she was booted from the Liberal caucus in the wake of the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Both the Liberals and Conservatives are targeting this riding. The Liberals have tabbed a longtime provincial politician Helena Jasek as their candidate. 
All right, and with that, we've got reporters in many of those key ridings tonight. We're going to begin with Mark McAllister, who's standing by in Whitchurch, Stouffville. Mark. Yes, Melanie, uh, here is a very interesting riding, as you just touched upon. It is one of those ridings that's not necessarily red or blue or orange because those colors are about black and gold right now, at least where I'm standing right now, where we're in the uh, Jane Philpott headquarters, and her campaign has been all about trust in the wake of that SNC-Lavalin uh, affair because she wants everybody to know that they can trust in her despite the fact that they may have lost trust in this liberal government. She's been going door to door throughout this entire campaign talking to people about how she thinks she can actually make a difference as an independent in the House of Commons. History says that that might not be a possibility, but she's doing everything she can to convince people they can trust her. She will do everything that she wants to do for them and that they may want her to do, and that she's done that already as an MP. The question becomes, can Helena Jacek, the liberal uh, candidate at this point, do the same thing? They more or less stand for the same types of things. Uh, the liberal candidate has also been an Ontario cabinet minister as well, and has more or less towed the same party line that was going on in Ottawa. So the question becomes, who can they trust the most? Who do they think is going to do the most work in Ottawa for them? It's going to be a very close call here this evening. We are at the Peacock Public House on College Street with Krista Freeland. Hopes to be toasting a Liberal Party victory tonight. Now, as you will recall, Krista Freeland has been an all-star member of Justin Trudeau's government over the last several years. She sticked hand the foreign affairs file, and she's also weaved her way through the politics of crafting a new agreement with the U.S. and Mexico after Trump ripped up NAFTA. Now, we are expecting many believe that this is a rock-solid riding for the Liberals, though her staff tonight telling me she's been out with volunteers still trying to pull the vote. And nothing is a sure thing. And she's up tonight against Claire Marie Tingling of the Conservatives. We have Melissa Jean-Baptiste Vajda of the NDP, and you also have Tim uh, Grant with the Green Party. Now, you, all, you also may remember in the last federal election, all 25 of Toronto seats went Liberal Red. About two-thirds of the entire GTA went Liberal Red. Now, that may be a challenge for the Liberals to do again this time. We will obviously be being a close eye all night long. Now, if Justin Trudeau does not fare well this evening, there's lots of rumblings that Krista Freeland could be the next leader of the Liberal Party, though. We have to see how everyone votes tonight. We'll be keeping a close eye. We'll be back here shortly. Well, that liberal wave swept through the GTA back in 2015, with a few exceptions, including right here in Milton. We are live in the riding of Conservative MP Lisa Raitt. She's also the party's deputy leader, and she's hoping to hold on to her seat here for a fourth term. Uh, but the liberals are hoping that uh, one of their star candidates can unseat her here in Milton. That's Adam Vancouverden, a former uh, Canadian kayaker, an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, his ground game has been very strong here. Whether or not that'll be enough remains to be seen. Now, Rate held this seat, or uh, rather represented this area since 2008. Uh, the, bounding, the boundaries have changed uh, in the last election, but uh, she is still here in Milton. And analysts say that what happens here in Milton could uh, sort of foreshadow as what's to come in the rest of the country. The GTA and the 905, of course, are very important in this election. So, you you know, if she's not able to hold on to her seat and the Liberals are able to take it, that could be the canary in the coal mine for the Conservatives. Now, we spoke with Rate uh, a couple of weeks ago during this campaign, and she felt uh, that when she won in 2015 by just five points, uh, which was one of the few ridings uh, that was taken by the Conservatives in that election in, in the 905, she felt that uh, at that time people were voting against her former leader, Stephen Harper, but she was able to hold on uh, because of local support. So we'll see if that remains true tonight. We'll bring you all of the latest from this writing to watch.
American Nativity Dad, also in Milton at the headquarters of the Liberal Party's or one of the Liberal Party's star candidates, Adam Vancouver. Did. And as Janella mentioned there, he does have some star power behind his name. And that's why this riding is going to be one that you really want to pay attention to tonight. Just a little bit more about Vancouver. Did. He is a decorated Olympian. Uh, he has represented Canada at four Summer Olympics. So uh, people do, probably would know his name. He's won gold before. He has a background uh, in broadcasting as well as marketing and business. And really, the Liberals are hoping that he provides an upset tonight. This riding has been traditionally a conservative stronghold. It's been blue for uh, more than a decade. But uh, as uh, Janella mentioned there, and what we're going to be looking for tonight is to see if uh, Adam's star power is enough to win this riding. The Liberals certainly hoping that it will be. And uh, it's definitely going to be an upset tonight if this riding turns red. Well, after the Liberals swept all 25 Toronto ridings, the NDP looking to take a couple of them back, including this riding of Toronto Danforth. I'm Tammy Sutherland. We're here at the Fox and the Fiddle on the Danforth at the viewing party for NDP candidate Min Suk Lee. She is a documentary filmmaker, a professor at OCAD, and she is looking to take this riding back for the NDP for the very first time since the 2015 election. And this, of course, has a a history of NDP ties, this riding with Jack Layton, the former NDP leader uh, holding this riding for years, right up until his death in 2011. And Min Suk Lee is going up against the Liberal incumbent Julie De Bruzen. She won for the first time in 2015, and she is looking to see if she can keep a hold on the riding. And this is just one of uh, a couple of Toronto ridings where the NDP could actually come in with a victory here. Davenport being the other one. Andrew Cash, who is a former NDP MP, he lost out in 2015 to Julie Zurijic, and she actually, uh, again, is running it, is a repeat of uh, the 2015 race. But again, with the NDP surge, Andrew Cash could come out in front there. And if the NDP is able to grab two seats here in the Toronto area, although it's just a small number, it would be a big jump for the Orange Party, of course. And so we'll be keeping an eye very closely on these races here at Davenport as well as right here at Toronto Danforth once the polls close. I'm Christina Howard, and I am in the riding of Scarborough Asian Court. Now, this is actually a liberal stronghold and has been since the riding was first created more than 30 years ago. The current incumbent, that's Jean Yip, well, this is where she anticipates having her celebration party. But as you can see, the Queen's Pub up in Scarborough, still very empty. All of her supporters just starting to trickle in. You can see a few of them, but most of them still out hitting the pavement, trying to get out the vote because in the last provincial election, the, the four Tories were able to capture this when Eris Babakin beat the incumbent uh, Liberal and stole this part, this seat from the Liberals, and it had been a Liberal riding both federally and provincially for decades. So the question here is, can Sean Hu, who is very popular in the community, he is a tax advisor and apparently very um, connected within the community and involved within this riding, can he capture this seat for the Conservatives? And if so, it would be a major loss for the Liberals and a massive upset. And it could be a sign of what could happen in one of Canada's most diverse ridings all across the GTA. And polls are closing in Ontario and Quebec at 9.30 in just a few minutes from now. We're looking forward to those results coming in shortly after. Meanwhile, lots of changes in Atlantic Canada. Remember, during the last election, it was a Liberal sweep. Look at that. The Liberals have lost eight seats in Atlantic Canada. The Conservatives are up six. The NDP is up one. And the Green is up one as well. Now let's look at one of the ridings in that the Liberals lost. New Brunswick Southwest. Former Conservative John Williamson regaining his seat in the House of Commons tonight. He was defeated in 2015 by Karen Ludwig. And we will continue to be watching the national results, but right now it's over to Mel. Thank you so much, Sin. And as those results do come in, you're going to want to stay on our website. Citynews.ca has an incredible tool for you here. Go to the main page, click on through. You're going to see a map, and already we're seeing the color changes here. Uh, you can follow the seat counts as well, but a nice little 
area here. You can type in your riding and follow along as those results do come in. We're also following what's happening on social media. So we have this neat tool here called Word Cloud. So our friends at Twitter Canada have been compiling what you are tweeting about. These are just some of the main words that are coming up. No surprise, Vote Canada and some of the parties as well. So stay with us here. Also use the hashtag CityVote2019 to join our conversation. Meanwhile, Artina Yazdani, she is standing by in the riding of Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. That is where the Conservatives looking for a win. Tina. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, really interesting GTA riding here. And that's because the MP who was elected here in 2015 as a Liberal actually crossed the floor last year joining the Conservative Party. Leona Alice Liv citing disagreements with the Liberal Party, such as their handling of crucial uh, uh, issues such as foreign affairs and the economy. She said she could better serve her constituents as a member of the opposition party, where she could vocally criticize the Liberals. So the move coming as a surprise to many in Ottawa. Of course, Conservative leader Andrew sure welcomed her into his caucus but we know a lot of voters here are now confused at a loss for what she stands for uh, we know that just two months before she crossed the floor she stood on a stage here in her riding with Justin Trudeau and praised him for his work and and how proud she was to work alongside him so a lot of voters feeling confused about what to do this time around we know that her uh, opponent in this riding liberal candidate Leah Roy Taylor is uh, looking to win here of course and we will be watching closely to see what happens. It could go either way because this riding has been a swing riding. In 2011, it was a conservative riding. It was then a liberal riding when Alice Liv beat the conservative incumbent by just a thousand votes. And then, of course, it's back to conservative now. So we will keep a close eye on this race and we will have the results as they become available. Richard Southern, we're here in North Etobicoke, and this is a, an election night party, maybe a bit different than what we're seeing play out across the country. We're in the middle of the Asian Buffet, a nice buffet restaurant on Rexdale uh, uh, Boulevard, the uh, chicken balls and uh, the sweet and sour sauce run of the hot lights, and this is where Renata Ford is having her election night party. She's hoping to serve up a big upset here in North Etobicoke. It has been a liberal stronghold going back uh, to the 60s. The incumbent, uh, Kirsty Duncan, is uh, a liberal. She's a member of Trudeau's cabinet, and she is ahead uh, in the polls. Uh, Renata Ford has no experience in politics, but she said it, she felt it was her destiny to run for the People's Party of Canada here in North Etobicoke. Uh, we're expecting her in at about uh, 9.30, and uh, there is no podium set up. We're just in the media in the middle of the dining room. We set our cameras up as everyone's enjoying their dinner. No supporters here just yet, but again, Renata expected soon. Reporting live next to the buffet in North Etobicoke, Richard Southern City News. I'm here at the Firkin on Bay Street where dozens of students are gathered here for a viewing party. Students from University of Toronto, Ryerson, all here watching the election results very closely. Well, the results as they come in. And I got a chance to speak with a number of students who are very excited about this election in particular, saying that their eyes are glued to what's happening right now. Earlier, I got a chance to speak with Danica McPherson, who is a nursing student. And here's what she has to say about the importance of voting. Well, my heart feels like it's pounding, but um, I feel like it's really important. I've been really actively trying to engage all of my friends or people that I know to get out and vote. And a lot of things um, affect, I would say, like millennial and the younger generation growing up. So, I mean, I talk to my mom all the time and she had different circumstances when she was growing up. We even talked about the housing market and I'm like, it's really challenging for us. And there's certain issues that really matter to our age demographic. And if we don't turn out to the polls, and we don't actively engage, then how are we going to achieve the things that we want and the things that we need? Um, and there's a lot of struggles. For example, I have a lot of coworkers that struggle with childcare, um, maternity and paternity leaves, and these are things that are important to us. And unless we turn out to the polls, even tuition in school, like it's hard to survive in our city. I'm born and raised in Toronto. I love it, but it's an expensive city. And um, unfortunately, people are leaving and moving to go to more affordable places. I would love to stay here, but I think I think to get what we need and get what we want, we have to be politically engaged to make those changes happen. A lot of strong opinions, that's for sure. Stick with us. I will continue to speak with students here, and you'll get to hear what they have to say throughout the show. Back with my panel, Mayor Patrick Brown, I'm going to start with you. 
How would you rate Andrew Scheer as leader of the Conservative Party and, and how he has been through the last 41 days? Do you think he made some tactical errors? Was he going too far, uh, Red? Should he have been a little bit more moderate to win over more of the country? I think it's been a tough campaign for both Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau. I think they, they both made mistakes. It's unusual that the major political parties lose support during a general election campaign. Both of them. Uh, I think it's unheard of. of. Uh, so they, he's obviously made mistakes. Uh, uh, he's benefited from the fact that the Prime Minister has made some huge mistakes as well. And so I think that's why it's such a close election. They both fumbled the ball. Randy, what do you think? From a Liberal perspective, tell me about your thoughts on Justin Trudeau and his campaign. Where has he failed? And, and he's clearly lost a lot of support of this country compared to four years ago. You're right. But I, what I think is so interesting is that despite all the fumbles, despite blackface and SNC and all the regular and repeat fumbles that we have seen, Andrew Scheer hasn't managed to pick up a, a significant lead. And that is surprising to me because I honestly think that given uh, if, if there were any other politician facing some of the scandals that Justin Trudeau has faced, surely the opposition, uh, especially uh, after four years in government with lots and lots of policies that may or may not have you know, pleased many people across the country, surely Scheer should have done slightly better. And I, I would assume that you know, those of you across the aisle, would, speaking honestly, would acknowledge that to some degree. The fact that Justin Trudeau is fighting for his political life tonight, the mm -hmm. fact that the Dauphin is, is, is as tight of a race oh, as he is. <laughs> I was going to use There's that same one. Don't worry. <laughs> same wavelength. As, as the fact that he is hanging on to his, his party status, uh, his um, party's win, leadership, being prime minister, with the skin of his teeth, wasn't supposed to happen four years ago. No, four he was years supposed ago, to nobody be, thought he'd be He in this was situation. supposed to do politics differently. He was supposed to be sunny ways. He was supposed to be a progressive. He was supposed to be a feminist. Well, it turns out he's none of those things. Um, he is disappointed an extraordinary amount of constituents that have abandoned him in this federal election. And I'm not saying for a moment that Andrew Scheer is this panacea, but I will say this. Justin Trudeau has lived a lifetime with that name, propelling him into the position in which he is in for the most part. Andrew Scheer was Speaker of the House for nearly 10 years. He wasn't caught in a lot of the political hand-wringing that the, the uh, MPs like Patrick Brown, when he was serving as an MP in the, in the Conservative caucus, they had to go out and defend it. Andrew served as Speaker. And so he's to, in two years, he barely won his party's election, but he has put them to the point where they may relegate uh, the Liberals to a minority. No one would have thought that would have happened. Is that because Even of Andrew three Scheer? Months ago, is it because of Justin no Trudeau's failures? That, it's both. The fact it's that both. Andrew Scheer has been able to capitalize on those failures tells, should tell you a little bit about, uh, about his leadership. I can imagine a Stephen Harper in this position where uh, Justin Trudeau would have stumbled this hard with the SNC fiasco and then with the blackface fiasco and then saying something on the floor of parliament that I thought was just should have absolutely obliterated him as, as leader, which is diversity only works where the, when there's trust. I think if uh, Stephen Harper was still around, he would have eaten his lunch. And I think it, it kind of speaks badly of Sheer that, for the most part during this campaign, he's almost seemed like an automaton trying to approximate human emotions. He doesn't connect well with they people. They said the exact same thing about Stephen Harper. Um, yeah, and Stephen Harper actually won elections. That was the Three difference. Three Yeah, them. And, and handily. First uh, one was a minority. Handily though. a minority. And 2006 was, was a minority. But it wasn't as nailed Stephen Harper, Harper was also, Stephen Harper was also a very hardline policy. But that's because wonk. the NDP was stronger but than Stephen Stephen Harper was a hardline policy wonk. He knew what he was talking about. You don't get the impression with, from Andrew Scheer with the flip-flopping on his positions and being able to you know, say different things to different people and different promises and make promises that essentially amount to nothing. I, could, I couldn't even ask, I couldn't tell you if you were to ask three different people what the conservative platform is this time around, could they actually give you a coherent idea of what well, the platform is? Well, we certainly know what it would be for the NDP is that, that my taxes are going to go up and they're just going to bankrupt our country. Well, so, I mean, that's perhaps, the yes. What this actually comes down to is the fact that people just don't trust him, that despite the fact that they're unhappy maybe with some of the fumbles that Justin Trudeau has gone into, has, has experienced, that despite all of that, they're just not willing to cast their vote as you, as you would expect what's fascinating, for Andrew though, Scheer. is the leader of the opposition who has only been in that position for two years, has been attacked and has been held as accountable as the man who is currently the prime minister of this country. And that included in the debates, um, the very few debates well, that we saw, that because, job, because the liberal leader refused to actually allow Canadians to hear what he had to say and defend his own policies. But it's a valid point to raise that he was not in a position to be, um, you know, have the experience and have, you know, Canadians get to know him like Trudeau has 
has for so many years. And the leader of the NDP, who's been there for a very long time. Well, let's talk the about the leader of the been, NDP. The this, of the is NDP first, this, year. this is his first campaign as yeah, well, yeah. Jagmeet Singh. And let's talk Everybody about the NDP the and the Bloc Québécois rising from the mm -hmm. ashes. Which that is a huge yeah. surprise. Huge. huge surprise and really hurt the Liberals the most, of course. But it goes well, to sure. I mean, not if, the not polarization you, of this country. You know though. anything about uh, Yves Francois Blanchet? He's a. I, I would say actually he's probably like the the uh, the best politician in this entire race. He's done I mean, well. Whether, whether or not you agree with the views on Bill 21, which I absolutely do not, and, and he he does, I would say that uh, Blanchet has been able to speak to uh, speak to his people, speak to the Quebecois, in a way that I don't think even Gilles Deceppe managed to be able to. He's, he does, he's not committal on, for, ex, for example, the matter of whether there's going to be another vote on Quebec separation. Mm -hmm. But he does, I think, get the average person to understand that he feels their pain and he feels their alienation yes. and their disaffection from the process. Yeah. I think Jagmeet Singh has been able to begin doing that, but he was very late to the game. I think that if there's any politician in this entire race or any party leader that actually gets people, that would be Yves Francois Blanchet. That's a really but, but good you know point. What's yeah. interesting about the bloc's surge is you had the federal leaders being so careful, tiptoeing around mm. issues of equity with, with Bill 21. Bill 21. Yeah. And you know, Justin Trudeau, uh, Andrew Scheer, Jagmeet Singh should say this: this is not Canadian. Uh, they should be saying we're going to challenge this in the courts. They've all been so tepid on it, but they didn't want to offend uh, Quebecers they who want support the this bill. Seats. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: those voters are going to the Bloc Québécois. They mm -hmm. didn't need to be tepid. You should, when, when something's an issue of morality and, and standing up for Canadian, um, you know. Uh, the, the type of values that I think we share as Canadians and being proud of our diversity, proud of our mosaic, I think, I think there was a failure of, of the Federalist parties in Quebec and the Bloc Québécois eating their lunch. Interesting. But, okay, on that note, we're going to call it for just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back. We have so much to discuss, don't we? We could be here all night. Uh, we have reporters with the main party leaders across the country, of course. Let's start with Tara Overholt in Regina. I'm Tara Overholt and I'm live here at Andrew Shears headquarters in Regina and you could say that there's some nervous anticipation here. The people have just started to file in about 20 minutes ago and the anticipation is because anything can happen tonight. There could be a minority government perhaps for the Liberals and perhaps for the Conservatives. So anything is going to happen and those results are going to start to pour in in the next couple of uh, minutes as the polls in Ontario and Quebec and Alberta have closed, which means we're going to start seeing some results. Now, Andrew Scheer spent a lot of time in Ontario and Quebec looking for those votes. Alberta was pretty much a lock for the Conservative Party. The question is whether or not he got through and got his message through of austerity and, and budget cuts and to keep this country uh, out of out of debt we're going to stay here throughout the evening so make sure to stay with us on city news and we're going to have uh, live and updated coverage throughout the night I'm Travis Prasad, live in Burnaby, B.C. We're at the election night headquarters for Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. We're at the Hilton Hotel. It's in the riding that Jagmeet Singh won back in a by-election earlier this year. Singh is upstairs in a hotel room with friends and family watching the results come in. We're in a ballroom down here, and people are just starting to trickle in now. Uh, you see the MCs coming in and kind of rehearsing, practicing for tonight's festivities. There is very much a positive vibe here. They're saying... This campaign was a game changer for the NDP. We're expecting this room to get very busy as the night goes on. Singh spent the last final few days of his campaign in B.C. and there are a lot of battlegrounds here for the NDP. They have 12 seats. They're hoping to hang on to those and build off of that. But that could be tough. Here on the West Coast, the Greens are popular. And in a by-election earlier this year, they did take a seat away from the NDP on Vancouver Island. So we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. But there's no doubt that the campaign has been a positive one for Jagmeet Singh. He's very much been the story throughout the 40-day campaign. A lot of buzzworthy terms. He really showed who he was during the televised debates. He had some lines saying you can choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny, things like that that went viral on Twitter. He even had his own hashtags, juggernaut, uprising, 
and there's another one that I can't think of right now, but there are a few going around as we speak. So that campaign really took the NDP out of a seemingly tailspin earlier this year and have given it a bit of a jolt. So keep it on City News. We'll see if that popularity and that success throughout the campaign translates into votes at the ballot. I'm Tina Teneriello, and I am live at the Liberals' election headquarters. We're in downtown Montreal at the Montreal Convention Centre, and things are starting to heat up here with sort of the calm before the storm, but now that the polls have closed, people are starting to roll in, some Liberal supporters, some candidates, and we just heard some screams as Jeanette Petitpa, minister in Atlantic Canada, uh, was just pronounced re-elected. So the atmosphere is quite alive here. It's hard to see if that atmosphere will stay that way throughout the night, because it's hard to predict the outcome with the Tories and the Liberals neck and neck nationally in the polls. But definitely the Liberals will be watching Ontario very closely tonight, particularly the GTA. They say the GTA could make or break them. It went completely red in 2015, but then complete, completely blue in 2011. I want to bring in our political analyst, Kareem Boulos. Kareem, why is Ontario so important for the Liberals tonight? Well, it's a sheer numbers game. With 121 seats, 80 of which were Liberal, they stand to lose quite a bit if they start to slip in, in Ontario. And I think at the end of the day, they call it first past the post for the seats. Popular vote doesn't actually matter at this point. As as long as they get that majority in each of the seats to hold on to Ontario, the Liberals will be safe. All right, we can hear that uh, there are more people happy with those results that are coming in from Atlantic Canada. The other provinces to watch closely tonight are Quebec, where the Liberals are expected to lose seats to the Bloc Québécois. Big surprise there with gains in the polls projected to get 30 to 40 seats, and that will indeed hurt the Liberals. And also in B.C., with the NDP also surging in the polls. So stay with us. We'll be live all through the night. We'll bring you the results as they come in. As you just heard from Tina in Montreal, things air tight right here in the GTA. We are in Toronto, and we are in the riding of University. We are in the riding of University Rosedale, which is supposed to be a slam dunk for Krista Freeland. Though we're told she's still out pulling the vote tonight. Now, in earlier a uh, couple weeks ago, rather, she was crisscrossing the country, similar to Justin Trudeau. She was in her home province of Alberta. She was in Edmonton, and that speaks to her popularity within the party. And there's many political insiders who believe if Justin. Trudeau does not do well tonight. Christopher Freeland could be the next leader of the Liberal Party. That Christian Freeland, Freeland would be the, uh, you know, out of the gate, the top-ranked candidate to, to replace Mr. Trudeau. Uh, so I think, you know, the fact that she's uh, campaigning for other candidates uh, so far afield in Alberta, I think, speaks to her national reach, her national profile, and the extent to which candidates across the country see her as somebody who can give them a boost. Now, again, in the last federal election, all 25 Toronto ridings went Liberal red. They're going to try and pull the same rabbit out of the hat this time around. And as well as the GTA, about two-thirds of the entire GTA last federal election went to the Liberals. It's going to be a tense night tonight. We'll be keeping a close eye. I'm Tammy Sutherland here, and joining us now live is NDP MPP Peter Tavins for this uh, riding here, Toronto Danforth. And you have been out campaigning with the NDP candidate federally, Min Sook Lee. Uh, what is it that you think is different when it comes to this election versus 2015? It still seems like it's going to be a close race, well, but there's a different feeling here. Yeah, there is a real different feeling. I think there are two things. One, our national leader, Jagmeet Singh, has really caught fire with people uh, in a way that we didn't have in the last election. I think he's really energized young people and a lot of people who just like the idea that you have this politically conscious person of colour leading a national party. It makes a big difference. And at the same time, we've got Justin Trudeau, who made all kinds of promises in 2015, tried to come across as someone who is really progressive. But in the end, when it comes to the climate crisis, he bought a pipeline. When it came to actually changing the electoral system in Canada so that it would be fairer, he didn't do that. He hasn't actually acted for real reconciliation. And people have found their lives getting harder. It's hard to buy a house. It's hard to get a place to rent that you can afford. Uh, a variety of things have said to people, Justin Trudeau wasn't the guy we thought he was. And those two dynamics have had a big impact 
on people in this riding, and my guess is across the country. Now, are you concerned, though, with strategic voting that uh, people may not pick the NDP candidate and move on to the Liberals just to see if they can hold on to at least a minority government? Well, I've had that discussion with a lot of voters, and what I've said to them is that in this riding, the Conservatives get about 10 percent of the vote. So you're not blocking any Conservative if you vote Liberal here. But the other side of it is, when the Liberals get a majority, they get really lazy. They forget about the promises they've made. They don't actually take to heart the things they've said to people and act in their interest. If you vote NDP in this riding, you've got a good chance of putting a minority government in place where we can actually push the Liberals to do what they promised and do things that we promised that will actually make a difference in people's lives. And the candidate, Min Suk Lee, what is it about her that differentiates uh, herself from the from the Liberal candidate? And does the Jack Layton factor play a big role in this? Um, I guess two, a few things. First of all, yeah, Min Suk Lee is really this incredibly energetic person. She's been on the doorsteps now since April. She's been working it very hard. And I think because of her background in film, as you know, this riding has a lot of people in the film industry. Uh, strong background in film, strong background in social justice issues, not really the background of the incumbent MP. Um, and you're right, the Jack Layton factor is huge in this writing. People still remember the difference Jack made in our lives, the way he related to this community. And people want to see his kind of politics back in place. And they see Min Sook Lee as the person, the woman who can make that happen. And my last question, is there an issue here in Toronto, Danforth, that you think is a priority that uh, the, the MP for this area needs to tackle for the residents here? Well, there are a few, but I'll say off the top, the climate crisis is huge in this riding. I have, a pe I have people raise it with me even without asking them about it. It's really on people's mind. Housing is huge. Um, got a lot of tenants in this riding who are being pressed very hard and people trying to get into the housing market who are just locked out. I talk to young people who grew up here who know they can never buy a house here and they don't want to be separated from the community that they're connected to. So climate, housing, really bringing our Medicare system into the 21st century with pharmacare, those things are really big in people's minds and those are things the federal government can address. Thank you so much once Real again. Pleasure. Uh, that is uh, MPP for the uh, Toronto Danforth riding here, NDP Peter Tavins. And of course, we're keeping a very close eye on this riding as well as the Davenport riding when it comes to possible switches from red to orange. All right, let's check back in with Atlantic Canada, which is sending a number of new MPs to Ottawa. Let's take a look at the numbers right now. The uh, Liberals' 2015 sweep of the region is gone, with the NDP, Green and Conservatives picking up seats. Let's zero in on a couple of them now. In Newfoundland, a seat has gone to NDP former representative Jack Harris. He's re-won his old seat. He lost it back in 2015 to the Liberals. Now, as I mentioned earlier, New Brunswick Southwest has gone to former Conservative John Williamson. He's regained his seat in the House of Commons tonight. He was defeated in 2015 by Karen Ludwig. And a green seat in New Brunswick, Fredericton voting in first time MP Jenica Atwin. The Greens came in third in this riding last time round. Now Atwin has bested Liberal incumbent Matt DeCourcy. And I'm joined by my panel. Patrick Brown, I'm going to start with you because this is your last chat with us before you, you go off and back to Brampton, I believe. We, much has been said about the Ford factor, and you were the former provincial leader of the party. Do you think that Andrew Scheer has been hurt by the Ford factor? I don't think it's any surprise that the Doug Ford government is struggling in the polls right now. I think what has been surprising is that the premiers had the discipline not to engage in the campaign. I think a lot of people would, would not have expected that. Having said it's that, not in his character. Yeah, having said that, Justin Trudeau, I, I think it doesn't matter that, that Ford's not engaging. He's running against Doug Ford, and I think in Ontario, for, for the Prime Minister, it's working right now. Just this weekend, I opened up you know, our local paper in Peel, and the wrap is Liberal MPs will stand up for Doug Ford. They're campaigning against Doug Ford because that is electoral gold for them right now mm -hmm. in Ontario. Uh, and what's going to be really interesting is to look at the Ontario numbers. If Trudeau gets re-elected, because of Ontario, um, I think that's going to cause a lot of consternation at Queen's Park. Amongst the MPPs who are looking at their own ridings and seeing if they will pay the same price in a couple of years. Adrian? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a big reality there, and you sort of wonder. I mean, I always say this about conservatives: they circle the wagons and point the guns inward. Mm -hmm. Whereas those on the left, they're very good at going behind the scenes, beating the heck out of each other, and right. and then coming up with sort of a united front. Um, perhaps it's their collectivist mentality and you know conservative so-called independent thought. But it's going to be a challenge to rationalize going forward for any federal conservative the so-called Ford factor. Um, the, the Premier and um, Andrew Scheer, there's some numbers out that have been floating around today. They looked at, you know, Doug Ford's popularity in the 905, which is where I think most of us anticipate this election will be decided ultimately. You know, Doug Ford's numbers are better than Andrew Scheer's. Or even the other side of it, Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer going into the federal election, their numbers are ostensibly the same going beginning of the election, and they are the same today. So. I think it's very early to tell, um, but there will be an element of people who were scared off by it. You know, Justin Trudeau came out in this, the beginning of this election and said, I'm basically running against Stephen Harper and Doug Ford. And he mentioned um, and Doug Ford more than Stephen Harper. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so Doug, that matters. Doug Ford it's is going the best to matter. thing that ever happened to Justin Trudeau in this election, quite honestly. 121 seats in Ontario. 100 percent. And if we all think about the 905 as the deciding factor as to which way the, the bellwether, as to which way this, this election will actually go, I think that uh, we can't discount the impact Doug Ford has had on this campaign. He takes on fights that he doesn't follow through on. He's, you know, the animus that, that you know, a large number of people uh, uh, you know, feel toward Doug Ford, I think, is going to have a huge impact. And the question is not just how does it fall in terms of your political affiliation, but does it motivate you to come out and vote? And I think that's what we'll be waiting to see when it comes to these 9 to 5 ridings. Andre? I think that if you are a voter in Atlantic Canada or you're a voter perhaps even in the prairies, you look at what Doug Ford said during the campaign and then what actually got accomplished once his party formed government. So during the campaign, he said that not one person will lose their job. Well, we know that to be false. Many people have lost their jobs under, this, under the Ford government. He said that uh, he will try to bring Ontarians together. That was also false. They picked a completely unnecessary fight against parents of children with autism. Mm -hmm. Everything from the LCBO file to the carbon tax where literally millions of dollars were wasted uh, tilting at windmills. I think that if you're somebody who believes that the Conservatives uh, at a federal level have been adopting that template. For example, Andrew Shear says that there are cuts that are going to happen, but we're not going to end up losing jobs. Well, what did the Ford government say in Ontario? That uh, foreign aid will be pulled back by 25 percent. Well, look at the fight that we've had regarding refugees and immigrants in Ontario. So I think that the there is a decisive Ford factor here. And it's, well, if you want to get a preview of what this government would look like if the Conservatives were to form government, just look to Ontario. And how happy are we here with that? Patrick Brown, I'm going to give you one last question before you leave our panel and our chair tonight. Do you think you, you were considered a softer conservative than Doug Ford and Andrew Scheer? Do you think that uh, they've gone too far to the right? I mean, you had a different plan to fight the climate change. Do, 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 what do you think would win over more Canadians? Well, I've said it many times, I'm a big admirer of former Premier Bill Davis, and I think you know, he created the Ministry of the Environment. There's no reason the environment can't be an issue that unifies people. I think climate change has been a big issue in this campaign. I think there's nothing inconsistent with being a Conservative who's a Green Conservative. You look at in the UK, where David Cameron championed climate change, and I, I do think uh, um, this is going to be an internal debate that Conservatives have to have in the years ahead um, you know and there are people in the federal conservative party who have been uh, articulating a, a different approach uh, Michael Chong uh, being uh, being one of them having said that I think these type of discussions won't happen until after an election mm -hmm. during an election period I think people rally together and um, it's it's interesting I'm sorry I've got to call it there and throw okay. it to my colleague Pam Seidel who's live at the polling station Pam Thank you very much, Cynthia. Yes, the polls are now closed here in Toronto just about 20 minutes ago. It did not take long here on Spadina Road at the Indigenous Community Centre uh, for volunteers to take down all the signs, turn off the lights and uh, lock the doors. So yes, the final ballots have been cast. And what I found really interesting is the number of people I spoke to earlier tonight that even as they were walking through these doors still did not know who they were going to vote for. 
I'm indecisive even now as I'm going in. Oh, are you? Yeah, I'm going to just decide it as I'm, <laughs> as I'm looking at the paper. I don't really know yet. I don't, you don't, I don't know. know. I know. I've narrowed it down to two, but I don't know for sure. Um, I think I'll know when I get in there. But <laughs> just like, yeah. Have your pan in like gut, Yeah, like a gut, like coin flip kind of moment. Oh. It was hard, actually, for me, because I had issues with, you know, with Liberal Party, you know, some of the promises they made and they broke, and uh, especially with the environment. <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure <laughs> until the last moment. Four, three. <laughs> Also interesting is how the environment and climate change continues to be a hot button issue for almost everybody I talk to in this election. So we'll certainly be looking forward to see how it all turns out. Okay, thank you so much, Pam. Uh, we are keeping a very close eye on what's happening across the GTA. Of course, it is too early to tell right now, but just want to bring you a bit of an update as to what's happening. York Center right now, we only have two of 190 reporting right now. And as you can see, the incumbent, Michael Levitt, uh, in the lead. But again, again, only two of 190 are reporting at the moment. Let's bring up Willowdale. Uh, Ali and Sassy, who's the incumbent liberal as well, only one of 197 reporting at this moment. Bring you up to Oshawa, where uh, this is a conservative riding, or at least the incumbent. Colin Carey was three of 240 reporting. You can see a significant lead, at least within here. And then uh, finally, want to bring you to uh, King Vaughn. Uh, we're watching this one as well. We, we do have a liberal incumbent, Deb Schulte. So 10 of 249 reporting at the moment. There's so much more to go. So we'll continue to watch all of these and across the GTA, the 905. Very, very important writings. All right, uh, let's check in now with Malia. I'm here at the Firkin on Bay Street where dozens of University of Toronto students are gathered here watching the election closely. There is some cheering, some booing, but definitely a lot of excitement. Joining me now is Kate Schneider, a UFT student and also one of the organizers of this viewing party. And this is also your first federal election that you voted in. So how did it feel for you to cast that ballot? Oh, it was great. It felt great to cast it. I mean, since uh, the start of high school, maybe even middle school, I've been super engaged in Canadian politics. So it was really, I've been waiting years and years to vote. So it was great to finally have that opportunity. And do you find that there's a lot of people like you that like that enjoy to vote and make it make a conscious effort to do that? Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of young people are very, very excited to vote for the first time. Um, contrary to the myth of young people being apathetic about politics, um, I've personally found uh, all the people I know are super engaged and really, really excited to exercise the right to vote. So, Kate, what are some of the issues that are very important to you when it comes to the federal election? Um, personally, I think the biggest issue, especially in this election, would be um, tackling the climate crisis. Um, and I think especially being in Toronto, uh, housing affordability is another one that's up there for me. Okay, so, I mean, I'm not going to ask you who you're voting <laughs> for, but which political party do you think aligns most, most with students? Personally, I think the NDP has put forward a really strong platform um, addressing things like climate, like the climate crisis and housing affordability, which I know other students also have as their uh, top issues. And for people who are in your age demographic who didn't vote this year, uh, what's your message to them? Um, I would just say I hope you get out and vote next time. Uh, voting is both a right, a privilege, and also a duty. Um, and I hope we can help them see that for the next election. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Thank and of you. course, we're going to be here throughout the show talking to a lot of the students that are gathered here and will share their message with you. Joining me from Jane Philpott's headquarters is Ian Lovett, the mayor of Wichert Stouffville. Obviously, uh, much talk about her running as an independent yeah. and how much difference that has made within this riding specifically. How have you seen things from your perspective? You know, I think, uh, you know, Jane obviously took a position on integrity in uh, resigning from the Liberal government. Well, certainly caucus and then getting kicked out, unfortunately. Um, I think that actually she is uh, the perfect person to represent us uh, as an independent, uh, cer certainly seeing how things are playing out and shaping tonight. Uh, 
she is in a tremendous position uh, to represent us and actually be required by whoever forms government to help actually shape policy moving forward. And so I think it's sim very similar to municipal politics. There's no parties involved. We're not told how to vote. We represent the constituents that elected us. And she's in, the, in this very same position. And we're, we're actually very excited about that. It's interesting speaking with the people that live here and talking to them about the potential independent candidate going to Ottawa. There's some skepticism. There's some people that back her based on the fact that she's doing this. Yeah. Um, what makes you convinced that she can make a difference as an independent MP? You know, I think uh, you just have to know Jane. I mean, and the people in this community do. She's been a doctor here for 20 years. Uh, certainly the position that she was put in when she was first elected as a rookie MP, uh, health minister, indigenous services, treasury board. I mean, who's ever done that before, right? I mean, it's just incredible trust that was placed in her by the government at the time. Uh, I think that she's going to be able to go with a, with you know, without the pressures of party politics, not being told how to vote on certain things, she can actually vote uh, based on the needs of her community and her constituents, which puts her in a unique position that many other elected officials this evening are not going to have. I appreciate you joining us. All right, thanks so much. Ian Lovett, the mayor of Wichert Stouffville. We'll be back in a little bit as the results roll in. It's a little close, too cl closer than it should be, but. I think I'm looking forward to it. Burn University right now, have you been able to help out on this campaign? Have you been able to canvas and knock on some doors with your mom? Entire reading week. Just had it for the last seven days. Canvas, canvas, canvas. It's like... We are live in Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, where a viewing party for Leona Alslev is being held. She's the incumbent in this riding. She first ran as a Liberal in 2015 when she was elected, and she crossed the floor last year joining the Conservative Party. So um, we're at a bar, a viewing party for her. It's uh, not too uh, busy yet, but it is filling up, and we are expecting her here in about an hour or so. Um, we know that this is a key battleground riding. It is a swing riding that has gone from Conservative to liberal and then back to conservative so it's a really important one to watch uh, when she first crossed last year it came as a surprise to many in ottawa an unexpected move after uh, she stood on st on a stage with liberal leader justin trudeau just two months prior to doing that and and praised him for his great work but just two months later she crossed the floor stating some disagreements over uh, their foreign affairs policies and their economy uh, di uh, differences on that issue so uh, she really wanted to make her voice heard on the opposition uh, team and that's what she did. A lot of voters though were, uh, were surprised by the move so we're waiting to see what happens here tonight. We're also expecting Aurora's mayor to show up so we will have an interview with him ahead on City News and we'll bring you the results as they come in. We're on College Street at Krista Freeland's party location tonight where they're hoping to toast a Liberal victory. I'm joined by former Liberal MPP Deb Matthews. Deb, thanks so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. A divisive campaign. Uh, if you listen to the polls, it's a tight race night. The GTA obviously being very, very important, especially for the Liberals. Yeah. Your feelings heading into tonight at the polls have closed here in Toronto just a few minutes ago. So this is always the hard part of the campaign, waiting for the results to commit. All the ballots have been cast and we're just waiting for the vote. So I'm optimistic we're going to have a positive outcome tonight. I'm very optimistic that Krisha will hold the seat, that we will um, we will do very well in, in the GTA. Uh, and nationally, I think, I think it's going to be a long night. I think uh, we may be uh, uh, talking about this over the next several days or weeks, but I think uh, Justin Trudeau has done a really good job talking about the issues that matter to people. Well, there are the critics who say, you know, he had a, a majority government uh, up until, you know, about a year ago, about ahead of the SNC-Lavalin stuff, he was a slam dunk, and then things have slowly slipped, and now we're in a neck-and-neck neck race with the Conservatives. What would you say to those critics? So, uh, yeah, it is a neck-and-neck, and, neck, and it's been neck-and-neck neck throughout the campaign. So, um, you know, I think this is when the people have to decide. It's been interesting watching how the smaller parties have done, how, how, how the NDP in particular sort of lost some ground at the beginning of the campaign and uh, certainly exceeded expectations. We'll see if that translated into seats. Uh, but it's very, very rare for uh, anybody to win two majorities in a row. 
them. We know how important the GTA is. I'm going to guess that you and some of your colleagues have been out pounding the pavement, pulling the vote. How hard have Liberals been working in the Toronto area, in the GTA, to pull the vote after a big, you know, red wave we saw in the last federal election? So we are all in. Provincial Liberals, Federal Liberals, all of us have been out knocking on doors, pulling the vote, hammering up signs. This is re really important for, for Liberals, people with Liberal values. Uh, we do not want to see an Andrew Scheer government, so we're really motivated by continuing to move forward with a more positive future. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, the provincial government, and we know that there's a Conservative majority right now at Queen's Park, uh, concerns for Liberals if there was Conservatives in Ottawa, Conservatives in Queen's Park. So I know there are lots of theories about that. I think people make a new decision every election. They, uh, there are very few people who would make that their voting decision, you know, whether they wanted a different party in power provincially than federally. I think people vote each election on the merits of that election. Thank you very much for your time. You. We'll be My keeping pleasure. a close uh, eye on the numbers. We might yeah. talk to you in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. So we are all eyes on the 905 right now. Just want to give you a quick snapshot of what's happening. Uh, Brampton West, only one of 199 polls reporting. So again, just the one, but we are seeing the incumbent, uh, Kamal Kerry, leading right now. Let's bring you up to another area in Brampton. Brampton Center, all of these, by the way, which we're showing you are current liberal ridings and the incumbent, one of 187 polls reporting at the moment, still in the lead here. Mississauga Center, this one is also interesting. Three of 230. Again, a liberal incumbent. Uh, it is very, very too soon to tell on this one. But this is the very interesting riding which we are watching. Sven Spengman uh, versus Stella Ambler, which we are assuming this is going to be a very tight one. Sven, of course, winning from Stella Ambler, took that as a liberal seat. She is hoping to reverse it, bring it back, and make that one blue. Only five of 246 polls reporting right now. We have a long night ahead. Cynthia. All right, let's take a look at some of the seat changes in Quebec now. Uh, of course, there are 78 seats in Quebec, so it's a highly coveted area. Between uh, the two provinces, Ontario and Quebec, there are enough seats to give a party a majority government. In fact, between Ontario and Quebec, you have some 59% of the vote. Some polling stations are already starting to report results. Let's take a look. Again, in Quebec, there are 78 seats up for grabs. In that province, three party leaders are fighting for their ridings. Let's see how they are faring. Starting with Justin Trudeau. So far, the results in Papineau. Uh, sorry, let me just find these. Here we go. Okay, let's keep going. We'll look at the People's Party leader, Maxime Bernier. He's trying to keep his seat in the riding of both... <laughs> Why are you laughing, Andre? I'm sorry. It's just funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he won that seat when he was still a conservative. Of course, that's Andre Domis heckling me from the side here. Outside of Montreal, bloc leader Yves-François Blachette is trying to unseat NDP leader Matthew Dubé. And now we also have a tight race for cabinet ministers in Quebec City, a liberal Families and Social Development Minister Jean-Yves Duclos is facing the former Bloc MP for the riding, Christian Gagnon. Okay, and now we are going to take it to Milton with Erica Natividad. Erica, what is happening there? Well, Cynthia, things are certainly starting to pick up here in Milton at the headquarters of the Liberal candidate Adam Vancouver did. And as you can see from the crowd here, uh, you see sort of how diverse Milton has become. The, chase of Mil uh, the face of Milton has changed quite a bit over the years. There's a lot of new families moving in here. And though this, this riding has been a Conservative stronghold for over a decade, tonight really is a toss-up. Adam Vancouver did a uh, bit of a star celebrity for the Liberal Party. He has uh, some, uh, some star power behind his name because he is a decorated Olympian. He represented Canada at four Summer Olympics. He's won gold, silver, and bronze, and he's taking that competitive streak now to the world of politics. So he also has a background in business, in marketing, and broadcasting. He's mentioned that uh, some of the main issues that he's concerned about are climate, uh, as well as affordable and safe housing, and uh, reducing poverty. So we're going to keep a close eye on what's happening here in Milton tonight. The Liberals really hoping for an upset here, and he's up against Lisa Ray, who is the incumbent. Lisa, one this riding by a very thin margin uh, back in 2015, less than 5%. So it really could end up going either way tonight, and it really would be an upset if this riding turns red. 
And we're also in Milton here in the riding of Lisa Raitt. As uh, you heard there from Erica, the Liberals hoping to unseat her. She's held this area since 2008. And I'm joined now by an area city councillor, Mike Cluett. Thanks so much for being with us. Obviously, you are a supporter of uh, the MP here. And yes. tell me a little bit uh, about uh, why you hope, you're hope you hoping that she's going to be re-elected here. Well, Lisa's been a fantastic uh, worker for the town of Milton uh, since she's been elected in 2008. Uh, while in government, she was able to uh, secure a lot of funding for some programs that we had here. Uh, the velodrome, the world-class velodrome we had for the Pan Am Games was as a result of the federal funding. Uh, we've been able to get a lot of uh, some other grants uh, for our arts and entertainment center, as well as uh, some green initiatives for the Milton uh, Sports Center as well. So she's a very uh, down-to-earth person. A lot of people uh, here in Milton like her and uh, she's been doing some very good work over the last 10 years and we want those 10 years of hard work to continue. Thanks so much. Uh, it remains to be seen whether uh, MP Rate will continue on in that position. She uh, ha won her seat by just five points in 2015, and uh, she's hoping that this will be her fourth time elected in here in Milton. We'll be watching those results come in as those polls are just closing. I think just one poll reporting here in Milton, so still a lot to see as to whether or not uh, uh, Lisa Rate will continue on as MP here in this riding. I'm in the riding of Toronto Danforth right now. We're at the party for NDP candidate Min Suk Lee, who is hoping to take this riding back for the NDP away from the Liberal incumbent Julie Dabruzin. And now we have uh, the councillor for the area for Ward 14, uh, Paula Fletcher here. Uh, you've been campaigning as well out with Min Suk Lee uh, throughout the day and throughout the, the weeks that have been leading up to this. What's the feeling here in the area just about what uh, she can offer? And whether or not people are may change over to the NDP. Well, we're just waiting to even get any results here tonight for a lot of the Toronto ridings, but it does look like Ontario is being gripped by the Ford factor, which is we have Doug Ford in the legislature, and there's real fear that we don't want to have a conservative government here. So that's going to taint all of the all of the results here tonight, I think. Yeah, so it's just going to be a wait and see and yes. wait and see. And when it comes to Toronto, uh, you know, right now we're looking at a possible minority government, whether it be the Liberals or the Conservatives. Uh, what do you think if there is a Conservative uh, minority government and uh, they can form government? What do you think will happen when it comes to Toronto and the promises that have been made for the federal government to support the city? Well, if there's going to be a minority, it really seems clear it will be a liberal minority. So I think that that will be good for Toronto. When Jack Layton had the minority government with Paul, um, last name Martin. for getting Martin, that's right. When he had that with Paul Martin, we got the gas tax. We really moved things forward in the whole country. So it's not the worst thing in the world if we have that. I don't think the Tories will have a minority government tonight. You're pretty confident. Based on the numbers that are coming based, based on these numbers tonight, I don't think that's a possibility. What do you think the city then needs from the federal government, whoever does form it? What is one of the priorities that we need in terms of contributions from the feds? We need housing. We need money for housing. We need money for transit really quickly because we are starved for good transit in the city. And uh, it just can't go on the way it's going on. All right, thank you so much again. That's Councillor Paula Fletcher uh, joining us here in the riding of Toronto Danforth as we await some of the numbers to come in to see whether or not the NDP can take this Liberal uh, riding back or if the Liberals can hang on. All right, Tammy, we are back with my panel of analysts, but we have a new person in our revolving chair. Mike Schreiner, leader of the Ontario Green Party. Thank you very much for joining yeah, us and giving pleasure. us your perspective on all of this. I'm going to let you take it away right now. What are you making of these numbers mm -hmm. so far? Liberals uh, coming in at 122, Conservatives 96. So well, I'm, I mean, I think we're looking at probably a liberal minority at this point, but I guess from a green perspective, I'm very excited to see that number in Fredericton, um, and hopefully we'll hold that seat, seat for absolutely. the first time well, ever. If you think about it, a year ago, the Greens had one seat, picked up a second seat in the by-election by earlier this year, and now if we can pick up Fredericton and potentially triple the Green Caucus after this election, that would be a big, big, big win for us. How do you think the Greens did under Elizabeth May in this election campaign over the last 41 days? 
You know, I think Elizabeth's run a solid campaign. Uh, I think one of the challenges we faced is I think most people thought climate was going to be the ballot question. And I know Elizabeth pushed hard. I know a ton of young people pushed hard for climate to be the ballot question. I'm not sure it actually was. And that threw the Green campaign off a little bit. But um, I think you're going to see historic numbers for the Greens in terms of popular vote and seat count. Let's talk about unity, and, and I'll, I'm going to get the rest of the panel in here as well. And, and in our first hour, we were talking about how the country seems so divided and, and so split on key issues like a pipeline, for example, mm -hmm. like a carbon tax. Do you see any way a minority government can navigate that and, and try and push something forward? Well, you know, I, I actually frankly believe if Greens are part of helping put together a minority government, it will work. Nobody thought the B.C. minority government uh, with the Greens and the NDP would last as long as it has. It's been a relatively stable minority government, even though it's very tight. I think the way the Greens as official opposition and PEI, another minority government, has handled that situation has been very responsible. So I think Greens are the are one of those kinds of parties that can get a minority government to work well together because the party does work across party lines very well. But Adrian, can any minority, whether it's Sheer or Trudeau, even though it's looking like it's going to be Trudeau, can can any one of them navigate trying to get a pipeline going oh, through? Oh no, look, I mean, the it's, Liberals it's, bought a four and a half billion dollar pipeline they can't get built. In a minority government situation, it's very process. You are basically hanging on to survive. You will have a few money bills that come forward. It's more just making sure that the, the finances of the government keep going forward and that you know people are getting their social security checks and, those, and CPP. Those are the sorts of things that um, a minority government, they're not going to be able to do any significant um, public policy initiative. It would be very hard care. to do that. What about pharmacare? Well, do you think we'll see. That could, I mean, uh, the Liberals came out and made an announcement about pharmacare only to distract themselves from the SNC-Lavalin scandal, but will they take um, uh, the, the recommendations that have come forward from... Um, he used to be the health minister here, Eric... Uh, Eric Hoskins. Hoskins. Hoskins, thank yes. you. Um, but that's somewhere where the NDP might come into to play. Like, will they help prop up um, the Liberals? But based on where we see things going right now, they may not even have enough cumulatively to get to 170 votes. Right. Okay. And we have to wrap in just a moment, but I'll let you two weigh in briefly. Uh, Andre. I would say um, it's great to see that there's more representation for the Green Party. But uh, earlier you said, Mike, that uh, climate may not have necessarily been the ballot question. Then I have to ask, well, what is the ballot question? Right. I think there's a couple of things that we have to look at. There, there, no, climate is a, it is a ballot question. And I think that if we don't have uh, a, a government this time around that is willing to uh, make some uh, very drastic changes and, uh, and, 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 and um, you know, create some moonshots for Canada on the climate file, we may lose this conversation for perhaps a generation. If we're not talking about income, income inequality, and part of that has to do with uh, pharmacare, because pharmaceutical dr like drugs in Canada are expensive, not, not as much as the United States, but it can impact family finances. Yeah, but going, if, going back to the Green in, Party for a second. Yeah, no, no, if we are the, Greens, the Greens don't just do well because the, yeah. the, green, the environment is a ballot question. Mm -hmm. The Greens do well when people are disenfranchised with other leaders of other parties. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that we might even see a bigger lift because, let's face it, um, voters were slightly disenfranchised with the leaders of the mainstream parties. And so I think that, you know, that's when people don't scrutinize who's in charge of the Green Party. They say, I need a fresh new I face. Then why I need a fresh new party. Andre, yeah. the Greens doing better. <laughs> yeah. uh, let, me, let me just interject. The Liberals are projected to win enough seats to form government, although it's not clear, yet clear if that will be a majority or minority government. So, Randy, how is Justin Trudeau going to navigate, if he can indeed cobble a government together, how is he going to navigate this political landscape that is so deeply divided? I think it's going to be really, really tough. But I honestly think that if anyone was going to be a unifier, it was going to be Justin Trudeau as opposed to some of the other leaders of the party at this point in time. I think that he's got a challenge before him, there's no question. And I agree with Adrian that really not much is going to get done. We've essentially pushed pause on progress in Canada right and now for the next probably 18 months and I honestly don't think we'll have major major policy initiatives what we'll see an election that? we'll see an election probably well, sooner so than you how think. How is Justin Trudeau <laughs> going to be the unifier when he looks at Saskatchewan, Alberta and Manitoba as ostensibly flyover provinces? Doesn't stop there, doesn't actually make any effort to ensure that their their economy is as healthy as potentially Ontario's or Quebec's. Oh, but there is a, this, is the, this is the Prime Minister that has actually 
risen um, has been responsible for the the rising sep um, separatist notion in in the province How of Quebec. Is he the for rising this? notion of separation in Western Canada. The absolute frustration. Adrian, you, get the the you get who outside was of the four one six. You get outside of the four one six, Andre, okay. and you actually talk to the average Canadian that is not living in the province of Ontario. Yeah. The frustration and the, the economy is palpable in terms okay. of how well they talk are not doing. Talk to somebody out in Edmonton, Alberta. How they feel about, about the climate How frustrating they are with in, central government. You know, and that's Western, 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 Canada, Western Canada can be a leader in the clean economy. And I think if Greens and the NDP are in a minority government with the Liberals pushing them on the climate issue, I think they can push for clean economy investments in Western Canada. Well, I don't know what you don't, what you think that our, our current um, uh, oil investors are not doing. Those that actually want to get our oil out of the ground. They do it ethically. You would rather them buy um, oil from Saudi Arabia? Is that what you want to no, continue no, Canada to do? Actually, 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 Elizabeth, 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 101 First Nations Elizabeth. communities were very much on board with ensuring that pipelines were going that to be developed. To them. And it was it those in the East us. that stopped it. Okay, but the ones Talk that, to the 101 so Aboriginal communities that we should just violate treaties have, with First Nations that communities? That have their the, uh, jobs. It doesn't matter what they... It doesn't matter whether they approve of it or not. Jobs. The fact is the land doesn't Talk belong to, to us. Any community that does not unanimously consent. Speak to the, to the Aboriginal chiefs and leaders that we're on board with it. All right, peace just board. for a moment. Okay. We have a shot here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I like I a good pet panel. Yeah. Uh, Andre, I'm just saying. Uh, we have a shot here of the Liberal Party campaign headquarters where there seems to be an air of excitement uh, after a Liberal minority win has been announced. Uh, we are waiting to see what uh, time the leaders, Justin Trudeau, might come forward. But right now, as you can see from the numbers on the screen, the Liberals appear to have 139 seats. Of course, they need 170 for a majority. Okay, so let me ask on one note, and Randy, I'm going to let you interject here. Uh, you're the most polite, Thanks. so you're getting the least in. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with all kindness to all my other panelists. Um, do you think Justin Trudeau can, can appease Alberta in any way? Because I think 60% were destined to vote for Conservatives. How is Justin Trudeau going to manage the entire company, country and keep Alberta uh, happy? Can he? I think that, like in any political campaign, there are some voters that are just lost to you. I think that the, it that's will be a big a, province it, to just be lost to you. Well, I mean, we're speaking with reality here. I think there are a lot of people in the province of Alberta that are not happy with Justin Trudeau. I think one of the only ways in which he can appease the voters out in Alberta is to bring into his tent some of the representatives, the local representatives, and the conser some of the conservatives' representatives to help him win over that province. And quite honestly, I think it's going to be a big uphill battle. He's not going to make everyone like him. That's never going to happen. And these votes here, what we're seeing right now with this minority government is emblematic of the fact that there is such division within our country right now. And I think it sets the stage for new leadership potentially within the Conservative Party to come up and rise up and maybe straddle more of a progressive angle and keep on the fiscal respons fiscally responsible agenda that might appeal to more voters than just the Alberta or Western voters. You know, one person he could reach out to actually is Preston Manning. Preston Manning is a prominent Conservative who has supported things like carbon pricing and has said Conservatives should be taking taking action on climate. I think climate is an issue we can unite around. There are market-based solutions to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities to create jobs and generate prosperity. And we need conservative leaders, particularly more progressive-oriented conservative leaders, to step up in Canada yeah. and say, we're going to take action on climate because the rest of the country has spoken right. and they want action and on climate. And the biggest disservice that the Conservative Party has done to the voter base is to make it binary, to say you're either a fiscal conservative or you're an environmentalist in, in favor of climate change. Or, well, we so, see so but that's actually change. just not accurate. But that's at the all. way they frame the issue. But, no, no, but conservatives don't frame it that way, Randy. It's, but it's they've come people with no platform on climate change. They, they, they are so they're the saying it doesn't matter. They are that's not but that's just a, that, that's actually but just I, a lie. That's you not true. That what, that's a what lie. is the conservative the, platform the, the on conservative climate change? Platform has, on climate change has been very straightforward. They're going to ostensibly do exactly what the liberals have done, which by the way will not even and not even recognize or or accomplish 
abolish the uh, the accord that they signed in the Paris Accord. Yes, he has said he will um, take apart the carbon tax because how much of our, take our carbon? The carbon, carbon, tax. Carbon, tax exactly. 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 carbon tax is a conservative how idea. Much exactly. of the carbon tax do you think will actually make a difference in our carbon footprint? The point Imagine is the zero. The point is the absolutely zero. And that's why will, people no, have but, had to but choose I think it's a fair between question being fiscally to ask. conservative or being progressive. But Mike was absolutely right. Virtually. Climate was absolutely not the ballot box okay. question Okay, and on election. that note, I'm throwing it over to <laughs> Melody. And Mel, you're taking a look. Save us, Mel. Take okay. a look at the numbers locally. <laughs> Listen, just for a little bit, but we will come on back to you. I just want to give you a snapshot of what's happening in Scarborough right now. Uh, we are watching all the ridings there, beginning with Scarborough Guildwood. We have eight of 184 polls reporting where the incumbent, John McKay, uh, right now in the lead for the Liberals. In fact, all of the ridings we're about to show you are all Liberal incumbents. Uh, Scarborough Centre polls reporting four of 189 with Salma Zahid in the lead here, bringing you up to another Scarborough. Uh, this one's coming up here. Apologies. Scarborough North, a 15 of 170 polls reporting right now. Sean Chen in this one. And we're going to bring you to Rouge Park, where we have two of 196. Still quite a bit to count here. Here's the interesting one that we do want to show you, and that is Scarborough Southwest. Apologies, I want to show you Guildwood in a second. But Bill Blair, of course, we will be watching this one. Uh, 10 of 196 polls reporting at the moment. This is the one here that we're keeping an eye on as well. Scarborough Agent Court, 15 of 191 polls are currently reporting right now, where Gene Yip is in the lead right now. Because of this one, this is the one that people are saying could teeter-totter between liberals, conservatives. Our Christina Howran is standing by in this very riding. I'm Christina Howard, and I am now speaking with Nathaniel Chan. And Nathaniel, both of your parents have been MPs for this riding. First, your father, who I'm sorry did pass away a few years ago, but now your mom, and she's in another race tonight. What? Are, what? Are, first off, what are your predictions for this evening? Is your mom going to be able to keep this a liberal stronghold? Uh, I, I'm looking. I think I'm thinking positive. I think I think I looked at the polls earlier, around 80 percent. So I like those odds. It's a little close, too cl closer than it should be, but. I, I think I'm looking forward to it. I'm here, so should be I should be looking for a good race. So what's it like to grow up? Because even before your father was involved in federal politics, you and I were speaking earlier, you said he worked for uh, former Premier McGinty. What's it like to grow up in a very political house? Very busy, always on the go, always running around knowing what's up to date. Radio, a lot of that. Policies and basically everything to do liberal so you get you get to get to like learn how to speak in front of a crowd how to um, I guess articulate your thoughts in a um, constructive manner but overall I'm gonna say it feels pretty normal but I've never known anything else so you're in university right now have you been able to help out on this campaign have you been able to canvas and knock on some doors with your mom Entire reading week. Just had it for the last seven days. Canvas, canvas, canvas. It's like maybe with a couple breaks of phone calls and sign management, but other than that, on the campaign trail. All right, so your prediction for tonight. What do you think is going to happen, not just in this riding, but all across the country? I think realistically, it's probably going to be a majority liberal. Uh, sorry, no, minority liberal. Minority liberal. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Nathaniel, and we'll throw it back to the desk. I'm Adrian in Toronto. We are at a pub on College Street. This is Krista Freeland's party. Well, where we're told she'll be here maybe in about half an hour to address the crowd now. This room tonight to start the evening was pretty tense. Everyone waiting to see what would happen. We all saw the polls neck and neck between the Liberals and Conservatives. As we have told you on City, we are calling a Liberal win, whether it's a minority or a majority is yet to be seen, though. This room right now, it's packed. I would say 85% are young volunteers. I'm joined by 17-year-old Madeline, you've been out almost every day on this campaign. Yeah, it's been a lot of work on the ground. Tell me just about how much work, especially right here in Toronto, where it's been pretty important, as I'm sure you've been told, 
for the Liberals to pull the vote? Yeah, I mean, we've been getting out uh, every day for months. I've been around since early August, and I know uh, the team has been working incredibly hard. My fellow volunteers have been working incredibly hard, and I couldn't be more proud of the people here. Taking nothing for granted. Thank you so much. Enjoy the evening. Now, the latest numbers, as you may have seen pop up on your screen, we've got Krista Freeland, more than about 300 votes ahead of NDP's Melissa Jean-Baptiste Vaja and Helen Claire Tingley. Now, of course, uh, this was supposed to be a seat that they will have, would win. It appears that Krista Freeland will take the seat. We're still waiting. Some more numbers are coming in. We're expecting Krista Freeland to take the stage behind me here tonight. We'll also be speaking with her. We'll have more just ahead. It's certainly a school night, but it certainly doesn't feel like it here at the Firkin on Bay Street. The alcohol is being consumed. Students are watching the election very closely, and there's a lot of mixed feelings right now. Joining me right here is Talia Holy, first-time federal election voter. How are you feeling currently? You are openly an NDP supporter. How are you feeling right now about how the NDP is doing? Um, well, right now we have a minority government situation that's being projected, which is always interesting because we don't know exactly what the results are going to be. Um, we'll find out in the next couple of days what our government is actually going to look like. I am frustrated, though, however, that the amount of support the NDP and both the Greens are getting isn't translating into actual seats under our first-past-the-post system. Now, at this time, we don't know if we're going to have a liberal majority or a liberal minority. How do you feel about either possibility? I would prefer a liberal minority because it would open up the possibility to the liberals being supported by another more left-leaning party. Um, however, I'm willing to accept whatever the results are today, and I'm glad that I don't have a conservative majority government. Now, you were telling me how uh, your mom is an immigrant and uh, from Sri Lanka, so could you tell me why you support the NDP? Uh, I support the NDP because they stand by the basic values that I agree with, but they also propose real solutions to the problems. Um, I found that parties like the Liberals have talked a big talk, but not really supported that with tangible policies. Well, I feel like the NDP proposed a very cohesive solution to a lot of the problems our society is facing today. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me, Talia. I will continue to talk to students here as the results continue to roll in. We're live in Milton with uh, Olympian turned pol a liberal political candidate, Adam Vancouver. And thank you very much for joining me, Adam. Now, it's still early days in the campaign. We can't declare this just yet, but you have a slight lead. How are you feeling right now? Uh, I'm feeling great. We had a really good day. You yeah. know, we knocked on a lot of doors today, like we do every day. We engaged a lot of our neighbors. We had good conversations, and we asked them what they wanted, and we reacted. You know, we made a, a platform like the Liberal does, based on what Canadians want, and I'm proud of that. How confident were you going into this campaign? It's not about confidence. Uh, you know, we work hard. You know, we get out there and we talk to more of our neighbors than any other campaign, and uh, you know, that gives me the confidence because I've got an amazing team, people that work hard every day. If I'm at the office three minutes late, then I've got beat there by 25 people. So. Um, Politics is a team sport, and I'm really, really lucky to have the best team in Canada. Well, so speaking of team, I mean, you, you do have a competitive edge here uh, because, uh, you know, you have your celebrity behind your name. Do you think that helped you uh, in this campaign? There's an incumbency factor, too. I, I'm not taking anything for granted. You yes. know, I knocked on a lot of doors and got myself out there. Um, <laughs> I don't think being Olympian is enough. I don't think you, you get elected because you have Olympic medals. Yeah. Um, if I get elected, I hope it's because I talk to more of my neighbours and talk to them about what they'd like to see happen here in Milton and across Canada. And I know that the Liberal Party is the one with the best platform. We're the only one that's got a, a feasible and uh, an ambitious plan about the environment. Uh, we've grown the economy in the last four years. We've got the lowest unemployment. And something that's really important to me, the lowest poverty rate in history in Canada. So, you know, these things um, are are evident that we've been doing a good job and we're going to keep this train on the tracks, clearly. Yeah, well, this, all eyes are on uh, Milton right now because, uh, you know, it's been it's been blue for over a decade now and, and you could be that person who turns it red. It was one of the few ridings in the last election that didn't turn red. What is it about you that you think uh, made the difference? It's, it's making me. the difference. It's not me. It's yeah. these people. It's all these people that knocked on doors for almost a year because Milton wants a progressive voice. Milton wants a unified voice to go up to Ottawa and bring our voice to Ottawa. Like you said, for 10 years, all we've had is Ottawa's voice in Milton, a conservative Ottawa voice in Milton telling us what the Conservative Party's doing. I didn't run for the Liberal Party. I didn't do this for Justin Trudeau. I did this for Milton, and I'm going to Ottawa on Milton's behalf. Well, Adam, good luck tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. All right, we'll be live in Milton all night, uh, sending it back to you now.
And we are back with some more results from Ontario and Quebec as polls continue to report. Okay, in Quebec, there are 78 seats up for grabs. You can see the Liberals are leading or have 34. That is down six. The uh, Conservatives are up nine, or have nine, excuse me, down three. The NDP have two, down 14. So there you go. That is Quebec. Again, 78 seats there. In Ontario, Vote Rich Ontario, which has 121 seats in play, the most out of any province. So the Liberals have 76 seats. That is down four. Conservatives, seven, 37, up four. And the NDP have seven, which is... I can't read that. Is that down one or up one? Help me out. It's down one. Down one. Can't read that one. Thank you very much. Again, between those two provinces, you have to remember that's 59% of the vote. And now let's look at the popular vote. Liberals in the lead, 35.9. Conservatives, 32. NDP, 14. The Greens, 7.9. And the Bloc, 6.9. People's Party, Maxime Bernier, who's fighting for his own seat in his riding, by, by the way, is just at one and a half. And they may have won the election, but lost the majority. Justin Trudeau's Liberals are trending towards a minority government, according to trends and early results. Okay, let's get back into our discussion. Adrian Batra, who yes, feels a little beat up at this table, I think, <laughs> but you're holding your own, and that's okay. I think this panel is reflective of where Ontario is in terms of its central left policy. Well, that's yes. why we have you here. Well, so you can you stand up for the conservative your, Thank you for having me as your token. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I think right. you hold your own here. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Much has been said, and earlier I asked, if Andrew Scheer went too far to the right. Mm -hmm. Do you think Trudeau has gone too far to the left? Has he, has he you know, followed in Kathleen Wynne's mm -hmm. footsteps? And she outmaneuvered the NDP and went yeah. even further left than the NDP. So it's, it's actually a very good question. Um, Justin Trudeau came in as Canada's most popular prime minister in history. His majority should have been guaranteed tonight. And he tonight. brought the Liberals and out of the ashes. He did, and he lo but he's lost um, uh, ground in every single region of this country. They've lost in every province so far. I think that their challenge is, um, in a minority government position, is how just much further they are prepared to tack to the left. Like, are they going to outflank the NDP? The NDP is crash and burn tonight. That so-called progressives, they have gone back to, to Justin Trudeau. They were not prepared to put their votes with Jagmeet Singh. Um, and that's actually a pretty good thing. That's got to make the Liberals feel pretty good about themselves. So there probably will be some sort of internal conversation with liberals that were uncomfortable with how sort of left Justin Trudeau went. Um, and I think that's a legitimate conversation that each party, frankly, should have on, on either extremes. Canadians aren't comfortable with that. Canadians don't like that. They don't like extremes. You can be a fiscal conservative and you can be socially uh, liberal. You can mm -hmm. be a fiscal conservative and you can be environmentally conscious. Right. Um, it's unnecessary for certain um, names and things to be hurled at other Canadians just because you don't believe or agree with their political party. And so I think Canadians are just sick and tired of all of this. I agree. Now, what do you you think a liberal minority is going to be able to accomplish when it comes to major policies like the pipelines Randy well, I think if they're being propped up by the NDP which is like which is likely we're gonna see a, a real shift to the left and that I think will reflect itself in terms of health care I think that that'll be one of the first things that the coalition probably tackles or the minority government tackles is, is pharmacare for probably example? I think that pharmacare will uh, we know that the part of the NDP platform was universal pharmacare I think that we'll probably see some form of far of some pharmacare plan being tabled and it will probably be pretty pretty drastic and to Adrian's point I think that you know we have to be careful where we end up because I, don't, I think that you know one of the risks of a minority government is that everybody gets a government that they didn't want. And so I think it's going to be, um, you know, it depends on what these numbers actually end up looking like. Um, but to some degree, what we've now elected is probably further left than what the majority of Canadians wanted to elect. And so, and so that, that'll reflect itself in terms of the policies that end up being proposed. On the screen, we have uh, the Liberal campaign headquarters where the party is clearly beginning. That looks like a very excited group of people. Uh, we can see on the screen 143 seats or leading for the Liberals versus 110 for the Conservatives. Mike Schreiner, do you think Justin Trudeau will... 
uh, change at all as a leader? Do you think he's been slapped down a little bit and, and might be a different uh, liberal leader? Well, I think he's going to have to change. I mean, I think one of the things that's hurt the liberals is not so much do they go left or right or whatever. I think it was actually broken promises. The Prime Minister said, you know what, we'll, this will be the last first past the post election. Mm -hmm. He broke that promise. Mm -hmm. He said he would balance the budget. He broke that promise. Um, he said that uh, he would be a leader on climate. And I think a lot of people feel he let people down on that. Um, ethical government, the whole SNC-Lavalin affair, I think it's those types of issues that really started to erode confidence and trust in the Prime Minister. I think that has more to do with it than where he positioned himself uh, in terms of policy. I do think to make a minority government work, and let's just be clear, some of Canada's best governments have been minority governments. I, I mean, going federally, to make that point. Yeah. Tommy CPP, yeah. health care, yeah. the flag, I love our flag, all minority mm -hmm. governments. So I think and minority government... we Exactly. Mm -hmm. Minority governments work, they can work well, and if the Prime Minister handles it properly, this could be a very effective government for Canada. So are you coming out of this with a Liberal minority with, with hope or with a little bit of despair, Andre? <laughs> Despair. Why would I despair? Listen, the only thing that the only thing that I personally care about is that uh, you know Canadians who um, are feeling the uh, the crunch from income inequality, the Canadians who can't afford to put a roof over their head, Canadians that will be highly affected by uh, the uh, the oncoming effects of climate change. I care that they are going to be taken care of. I care, for example, as uh, Randy brought up earlier, that the pharmacare pharmacare file gets covered, which I think will, uh, assuming that the numbers hold for tonight, uh, that probably will be the uh, the first issue that's addressed. I just, I'm a little bit weary of the, not wary, but weary of the whole left-right divide because Canada, I don't think, functions on necessarily on a left-to-right strata. Mm -hmm. it's, it's divided by regional interests. And I think that's going to be the challenge for the next government to, to manage, is how do you take care of regional interests? How do you take, how do you take care of Alberta, Adrian, you know, how do you, how do you satisfy their interests when you have oil workers that are clamoring for a pipeline, but environmentalists in Ontario, downtown Toronto, where we are, saying that we should not have a pipeline. How do you satisfy the, satisfy the interests of uh, the Bloc Québécois? I don't think that the NDP crashed and burned, let's say, on, on the progressive vote. It was actually the BQ that uh, ate up the NDP votes. So what interests have to be satisfied there in order for this government to hold? I think that's the question. There's but if also... we lost the middle ground in this country, I mean, there used to be sort of three parties in the Liberals. There was never a middle ground. Years ago, really I, I think middle. there was more of a middle than now. It's I think more, now it's that's a modern barley. invention, it, it often happens, you know, very similar to what happens in the United States. Mm -hmm. A particular leader, regardless of their plot, they, they uh, go for their party's nomination from a certain political angle, but they generally govern from, from the center. That's usually what you do to get reelected. But there's another aspect to a minority government that is important, and, and Mike brought it up with respect to the ethical nature of the current Liberal government. Mm -hmm. I mean, Justin Trudeau is the only Prime Minister in history to have broken the ethics law twice. twice. The SNC-Lavalin yeah. and the Aga Khan trip, which yeah. he forgot And who knows what's going to happen with the RMC investigation. But here's, the, investigation. The, here's mm -hmm. the opportunity that opposition parties actually have in a minority situation. The Liberals will not have majorities to shut down um, investigations. Mm -hmm. Justice Committee can potentially come back on an SNC-Lavalin and actually find out what truly happened. So there is mechanisms by which this government will still be held accountable. And that's where I think the, the NDP bloc um, and so far the One Green uh, and, and Tories can work together in, in sh to in hold a Liberal government to account, who do, does believe that you know they are the natural governing party of this country and that they're almost entitled to it. Um, and I think that will help um, in terms of just keeping them accountable uh, and maybe not uh, see the ethics scandals that we've had. Oh, look, we have Trudeau sitting with his family, his children, his son on his lap, uh, watching election results. I would imagine he's somewhat relieved at this hour, Randy. I think so, too. I think that everyone was predicting a very dire outcome mm -hmm. for the Liberal Party today. I also think that, um, you know, when we think about how the new how a new minority liberal government might play out that the face of the party is going to change substantially you'll recall that over the last four years it's been very much a justin trudeau led party mm -hmm. he's been at the very he, he his personal brand was the liberal brand and i think what we'll start to see now is he's going to have to prop up a lot of cabinet ministers to take on more of a uh, public facing role it's going to be less sort of led by one person less led by his personal brand and probably spread out quite a bit well that has been a large criticism of the liberal government that it was too central and it was too controlled by Gerald Butts and and Trudeau 
and that nobody else had a say in it. Well, it was a very tight center for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not just talking in terms of the way the mechanics of the party will work. I actually think that they're going to have to deliberately prop, prop up some of the cabinet ministers that have a lot of capital, like um, you know Christa Freeland mm -hmm. and others who you know. I would say generally have you know a, a su substantial amount of pop popular support. They have All to right. be careful mm -hmm. with that too because those could be potential leadership replacements. Yes, you know, yeah. in the future. and the knives might be out. Yeah. Although, yeah. as you pointed might out earlier, early. the Liberals go internal first. <laughs> yeah, they do, but okay. this is supposed to be majority for him. Right. All right. Yeah. We are going to take a pause for a moment. We'll come back with some more analysis in a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mike Schreiner, for sitting in our revolving chair for the last 45 minutes. And My we pleasure. much appreciate your insight into this evening. Much appreciated. And now, Mel, it's over to you. Cynthia, thank you so much. I want to bring you back here downtown Toronto to see how the race stands right now. Uh, some areas which could go from red to orange. Uh, looking at Davenport right now, we have 13 of 195 polls reporting. Uh, still seeing a lead for the incumbent, uh, Julie, but Andrew Nash not too far behind as it stands right now. Let's bring you to Toronto Centre, which is, of course, a very interesting riding. Uh, the riding of the late Jack Layton, where Julie DeBrosen is uh, currently leading with 17 of 200 polls reporting, but we know that Min Suu Kyi Lee right on the trail right now and this could potentially go orange as well. I want to bring you to a few ridings that we're watching where federal ministers, cabinet ministers uh, were here. Christopher Freeland, of course, a University Rosedale, 8 of 207 reporting right now. She is leading, but of course, um, quite a bit ways to go. Now let's bring you to some other ridings in the downtown core at the moment, including Toronto Centre, with 40 polls reporting of 257. Bill Morneau, uh, the incumbent. You can see the check mark right here, of course, uh, finance minister. And let's finally bring you to Toronto St. Paul's. Carolyn Bennett, 935, so in the lead of 12 of 208 polls reporting. And finally, one of the last ones we're watching in the downtown core at the moment, of course, is Spadina, Fort York, where Adam Vaughn, you can see 24 of 223 polls reporting. You can see the check mark. You know what that means. All right, let's check in with Mark, who is standing by in Markham Stouffville for a race that should also be quite interesting, Mark. It has been quite interesting, obviously, Mel, that the, uh, we've got an independent candidate in Jane Philpott, who was the MP, and she's trying to get in. However, the early polls are starting to show that she might be in third place at this point. As a result of that, we've got a very quiet room here, just hoping, wondering, and waiting. The early polls are, in fact, early, but right now it looks like it's a neck-and-neck -neck race between both Helena Jasic, the Liberal candidate, and Theodore uh, Antony, who is the Conservative candidate. Now, it's important to point out that Phil Pott won this 40 to 42% as a Liberal candidate the last time around. At this point, had her votes gone to one of those parties, gone to the Liberal Party, this might have been a runaway. However, it's splitting things. And as a result of that, there is some wiggle room there for the Conservative candidate to perhaps win this riding. Again, early going at this point, there is a calm among the crowd here in Stouffville, Markham Storeville, but uh, we're still watching and waiting at this point. A really tight race here in Aurora, uh, where the Liberal candidate and the Conservative candidate are neck and neck. Just a 200 vote difference, really, really close. Now, the incumbent is a Conservative candidate, Leona Alislev, who actually crossed the floor last year. She was first elected as a Liberal, but she joined the Conservative Party last year. And she's just 200 votes ahead of the Liberal candidate in this riding. And we want to show you the moment she crossed the floor in 2018. And when she first crossed the floor, uh, there, there was a lot of surprise and even confusion amongst voters here, and they're clearly showing that today. Uh, again, a really, really tight race here, but uh, this uh, crowd at this viewing party is cheering every time they see her name up there because she is still ahead by just around 200 votes, and it is still early. We're waiting to see what will happen here. Now, when she first crossed the floor, she cited some disagreements with the Liberal government, including uh, different issues like foreign affairs and the economy, and she said that she wanted 
wanted to speak, have a voice on the opposition's team. So that's why she did it. And uh, it seems that voters here are start, are questioning her tactics and her move. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens. But again, a really, really tight race and a key battleground uh, riding. There's about 115,000 voters in this riding and a 200 vote difference. So uh, uh, it should be an exciting night uh, as we follow along and, and see what happens. But I'm doing... And we will continue with some analysis right now. Okay, we have to welcome Kim Wright. Hello, Hello Kim Wright. She is in our revolving chair. She is a political analyst as well. What is your take so far? We'll give you the first say in this roundup. Liberals, 146 seats either declared or leading versus the Conservatives with 117. Yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting governing parliament. And, you know, I look at it much like I deal with my clients in municipal governments. How do you find common grounds? How do you find those areas where you can work together. There might be some give and take, but uh, certainly uh, the Prime Minister is, should be a bit chastened by uh, what he has seen by Canadians. Uh, he has an awful lot to account for for regional divisions that we're seeing and that we've been seeing throughout the night. Uh, but ultimately, how he manages to make a government work will be fascinating to watch unfold. We've seen this in British Columbia uh, where you can have actually a minority government that can work together, that can find those common grounds and actually will probably make it through most of their term of office. So it's not an automatic, we're back at this in 18 months. Okay, but do you think after such a toxic, divisive yeah. election that anybody can actually work together in Ottawa after this? Yeah, they this? all need to frankly just take a breath, take the weekend, pick up their signs, dust it off, see their families, uh, recalibrate who they are and what they actually want to talk about to Canadians. There has been a lot of toxicity in this uh, entirety of this it's campaign. the worst election I've seen for them. The, this lack of authenticity, there needs to be what is often called a thorough moral inventory and people of all political stripes frankly need to do it over the coming days and weeks before Parliament re reconvenes. Uh, then you can get down to what does a first hundred days look like? What does a new government look like? There are options and opportunities. Canadians have been pretty clear about the things that matter to them, in particular around health care. Uh, and they need to get on with that. There also needs to be a healing within the Federation of Canadian, of, of Canadian Council, which is all of the different provinces. How you deal with an intergovernmental agenda that not only includes provincial and territorial leaders, Indigenous communities, Communities and municipalities. That needs to become job one of the new prime minister. Andre, your thoughts? Do you think I, that's possible? I, I, what can they offer? Is that front ambassador agreement with that? <laughs> <laughs> For the first time tonight, I, yeah, I know. I think you've actually created consensus. That's actually amazing. That's the, what we do in my world. <laughs> I, I think. I think the uh, when you talk about the toxicity in the campaign, I don't know that all parties are necessarily responsible no. for that. I think we experienced what was possibly the first post-truth campaign. Canadian history. I mean, it, and it wasn't just one party that was putting out blatant falsehoods. I think there was enough blame there to go around. Yeah. And I think that that, uh, it depends on what voter turnout looks like uh, after this whole thing is wrapped up. But I think that actually turns off a lot of Canadians is, is hearing politicians essentially lie to them. Okay, I'm yeah. going to hold you there just for one moment because I have to do what we call a flash. <laughs> We're going to continue our analysis in a moment. No, I'm not flashing. We are just taking a brief pause to update our viewers on City TV. Good evening. Tonight, Canada has re-elected a Liberal government, but it's slimmer this time round, a minority. Coming up on City 2 News tonight at 11, we're looking at how the colours have changed across the GTA and voters sending plenty of new faces to Ottawa. We're also looking at who will hold the balance of power in this minority situation, how can the parties get along, and which issues will sow division. All right. Flash is over on City TV. We'll be joining that back at 11. So now we will continue online with our discussion of analysis. I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, all good. I was just, I was just saying that, uh, you know, we, I really hope that we don't see another campaign like this one uh, where candidates essentially, out of what seems to be sheer desperation, uh, essentially getting up in front of podiums and lying to voters. I hope that we don't see anything like that anytime soon. And I think that could bear out in the, uh, in the, uh, the total polling numbers. I think when you have young people that are not willing to come out and vote, um, that's, that is essentially what turns people off. 
I'm curious to see what the youth vote will be because I know yeah. in the last election it was what, up 18 points yeah, but uh, with hope for Trudeau. Large, that was in large part because of the marijuana, marijuana. legalization. Yeah. And I would say that to some extent, climate change t was supposed to take that on, was supposed to be the issue that brought some of the youth out to vote, I think, a little bit more. I don't know if, we w if we've seen that necessarily, and I don't know where that vote really coalesces, um, but it'll be interesting to see. I also think part of the reason we're seeing so much division and such a nasty campaign is partly because there's less of an appetite for long and thoughtful discussion, I think, when it comes to political debate. And that's maybe a generalization, but most of us are digesting our news in short bits and, sn and snippets online. Um, and so let's face it, the more extreme headlines grab attention, the more extreme conversations grab attention, and that's, that ends up you know, generating a discourse in that direction. And yeah, I think so that's where we're going. We cover the soap opera, right? Also a You're lot saying of, we should never tweet. But there's also no, a not lot saying of that, people but what we end up tweeting are these are sort of more salacious things that grab attention yeah. as opposed to thoughtful So maybe Kim Campbell was right all those years ago that oh. the elections are no time to actually have a thoughtful, a thoughtful sort of discussion. Policy but, discussion. You know, but, you know, we, we always hear this, that, you know, we're not talking about the issues. We're not... Frankly, all the political parties, you know, like them or not, they all put out policies. They all put out things, talking points, messaging, um, you know, things that are, are generally important to Canada. We didn't see the leaders be able to debate those um, properly. We didn't see that we weren't afforded that opportunity to, um, you know, hold anyone's really feet to the fire and be accountable in any meaningful way. They but they, but they were, but the we debates, were barely yeah. talking about these things. But they were there to be talked about, to be and, sure. But it's a lot easier to talk about days of our lives type of thing. The soap opera. And yes. that, that's the types of things that I think turn off Canadians. Well, they make for great headlines and they're great for panels. But ultimately, there were a lot of people in this campaign, Andrew Scheer and uh, Justin Trudeau specifically, who got away with for years terrible either lies of omission or directly lying to Canadians and hoping they'd never get caught out. These things always catch up and in a time and a place where everyone is looking for what, who are these people, what are they really like, for any of them to be surprised that old yearbooks surfaced or fudging their resume was there, this should be a life lesson for anybody looking for public office. Not that you have to be perfect, but you have to look for actual redemption, not faux redemption of, hey, I but got Kim, caught out. don't you out. think everyone's going to have a past at some point? You like this is, I think all future candidates are going to have struggle with the fact that they've done something that was documented sure. online. And we're going to, I wonder if these issues will be debated in the same but, way and will take hold over elections the But the, the difference same way. is, Randy, though, is if you are truly mm -hmm. wanting to, look, people do weird things when they're a kid, sure. Maybe they did something stupid. But when you fundamentally uh, have no remorse for them or try to continue to hide from them, you know, Andrew Scheer spent probably the better portion of a week explaining to people whether or not he was an insurance broker or not. If you're explaining, you're losing. They lost so much momentum over things that were ridiculous that they should have cleared out of the way. Whether he was a dual citizen or not is irrelevant. The fact is, the moment he became leader of their party, they sh he should have made his way off well, of that. Well, the fact that the current prime minister could even remember how many times he dressed up in blackface exactly is really in of itself quite troubling um, but I think that we often in in our world get so wrapped up with you know oh my gosh it's too negative oh my gosh it's too this oh my all of these things Randy's point is an important one um, thank you no you two are not, not, not to not <laughs> tweet <laughs> love. not to have social media has changed discourse there's it no question has. about that you and I know that working in the media business mm -hmm. we know that on a daily basis it affects us there's no question but I think that there is we have we have a, a, you know a tiny little pinhole to cram all this information in and there are so many sources to get information from there are so many opportunities for people to learn and hear about this on the, themselves but you're going to always have that 25 to 33 percent of partisans that are going to uh, capitalize on on the entire uh, narrative. Which that will all, that will always happen. Just shouldn't be allowed to use social media, in my opinion. The fact that this campaign has entirely been wrapped up around spectacle. I think, like being a, a person who you know doesn't. I'm not very satisfied with the political status quo. And to your point about uh, you know uh, candidates' backgrounds and past and so forth cropping up in yearbook photos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think you know what 
what the average person who might consider running for office one day is looking at this race and is thinking to themselves, why would I want, ever want to put myself through that? Yeah. Yes, if exactly. I end up becoming the story and not what it is that my party yeah. stands for and what we're going to do for Canadians, why on earth would I yeah. ever yeah. want to run and for office? And what kind of, of candidates office? do we want to attract? Yeah. Do we want people who've and never I, done anything ever? Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at, if, if each one of us actually were under the microscope, would any of us be able to run? Probably not. Well, Probably that's why. Not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I was speaking to a cabinet minister from the Mike Harris days, and yeah. he said to me, I just talked to him a couple of days ago, and he said, I would not run today because I could not handle the political yes. climate and social media. It is yeah. not what I would want to be yeah. doing, and it's not what I signed up for. One uh, quick note, Maxine Bernier did not win his seat. People's yeah. Party Canada, he did not win his seat. And I believe it was picked up by the Conservatives. Yes. 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 So Who that are running is a really good by the sword, surprising. By the sword. It's not surprising. And, you know, I think it's uh, something good to be said about our country. Okay. okay. The Conservatives let me just... a great candidate there. They had a, a former mayor uh, that yeah. they were running. A really, really good, strong candidate there. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to another riding. Janella Massa is at Lisa Raitt's headquarters. I know that's been a very tight race. Janella. Yes, we are in Milton. This is currently Lisa Raitt riding, but whether or not she will hold on to that remains to be seen. Those numbers coming in quickly, uh, about uh, just less than half of the polls reporting are showing that her uh, opponent, the Liberal star candidate Adam Vancouverden, is leading. Now, Lisa Raitt has been the MP here since about 2008. She's also the party's deputy leader, but she won by only five points in the 2015 election. And the Liberals are hoping to widen that gap. And I'm learning now that actually the race has just been called here in Milton, that Adam Vancouverden has won his seat. And that will be an upset here in Milton. I'm not sure that that news has even really hit the folks here behind me because they are watching uh, the, uh, the monitors here behind me. And I'm just getting the, that news moments ago. So it has been kind of subdued here in Milton uh, at the party that was hopefully supposed to be the victory party for Lisa Raitt, but now an upset this evening with Liberals star candidate Adam Vancouverin, former Olympic kayaker, taking this seat. I am with Jean Yip, who has just been re-elected in the riding of Scarborough Agent Court. So how do you feel about that? I feel ecstatic, and I'm just so honoured to represent the folks of Scarborough Agent Court again. Now, you have a very interesting history because this riding has been in your family for, for some time, unfortunately, with the passing of your husband, but then you were able to capture the seat or maintain the seat in a by-election. How does it feel now that you're going to be going into a minority government situation? How do you think that'll be different now? I think that we will have to work harder to uh, with the opposition parties and um, make sure that we can work on common goals to so, serve all of Canada. So what's the first thing that you want to do for this riding and th this area in particular? Continue to advocate for seniors, continue to advocate for families and safe communities. Thank you very much and congratulations. Okay, just a couple of updates for you. Again, Maxime Bernier uh, has not won his seat. The People's Party, uh, goodness knows where that is going to go after that. We can also tell you Renata Ford did not win her PPC seat in Etobicoke. Uh, Justin Trudeau, though, has won his seat in Papineau, Quebec. Sometimes things just work out as they should, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Bernier for a moment and, and what kind of impact he had on this election. We only have a minute and a half none. to go here. Talk about going outside. I mean, uh, obviously mm -hmm. none. It was interesting when we had the mayor of Brampton here, Patrick Brown, talking about his former colleague, because they were in the house together, mm -hmm. that Bernier wasn't so far to, you know, to that, he wasn't that, that extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to, to note oh, that. And we have him up here right now, actually. Um, and this is uh, not too particularly surprising. And the Conservatives certainly um, ran a good candidate, as Kim noted, um, and was not targeting it, but it, they thought, okay, this is one that we can actually pick up mm -hmm. in, in Quebec. But what was he actually trying to accomplish? And did he I really think know. he was he going was, to make I don't a dent? It was ultimately about Max's own ego, which is how he, got, he lost the Conservative leadership by two points, uh, wanted fine to take his marbles and go home, uh, weaseled his way, frankly, in 
into the de the debate commission. Mm -hmm. There should have, there is no reason, given where he was polling, that he should have been anywhere close to that. He was at that point close to the rhinoceros party and the pirate party. I was just going to uh, say like, shout out to the rhinoceros party for running another candidate named Maxime Bernier, who, as I can as I've seen so far, picked up about sixty or seventy votes in that writing. Yeah, I mean, look, he he had no business in there to begin with. It became problematic for Andrew Scheer and the conservatives because they were playing defense on that. But ultimately, uh, you know. It is right. what it is. Karma sometimes works out. There you go. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us for our special online coverage of City Vote 2019. Now you can continue to watch us right here online or on City TV. We will continue to break down the election with my amazing panel. Our coverage continues right now. Tonight on City News, the Liberals will form government once again, knocked down from a majority to a minority. We have the results so far up next. And a deeper look at the GTA four years after it was swept by a red wave. Coming up, how much have they held on to and who have voters chosen? Good evening. There has been a shift in Canada's political landscape, but not as big a change as some had hoped for or expected. The Liberals on the way to forming a minority government. How did we get here? Here's a snapshot. With more than 200 ridings reporting, the Liberals have won more than half, and they are leading in 50 more, still short of that magic majority number of 170. The Conservatives have taken more than 80 ridings and are leading in about 30 more. The NDP picking up uh, right now now they're down, down 21. down 21, and the Greens are up two. And the Bloc Québécois surging back from the ashes to win more than 20 seats. So you can see the seat change there. The Liberals are down five, the Conservatives up four, the NDP up one, Greens and zero. PPC at zero. Many said the election would be won or lost here in the GTA, and that appears to be the case. The Conservatives failed to gain great ground in vote-rich Ontario. Now let's check in with Melanie Ng, who's looking at some of the key results in Toronto and across the GTA. All right, Cynthia, here's a look at the GTA map right now. And uh, not as many people anticipated that this would stay as red as it currently is. So let's have a look at some of the key ridings where there are already declarations. And we're going to begin with a big one. And this is in Milton. Adam Vancouverden taking this riding uh, from Lisa Raitt, who, of course, is deputy leader. So that is a big one here. In fact, a lot of people taking to Twitter to talk about Adam Vancouverden's big win here. Let's bring you back into Toronto. A number of ridings, Scarborough Agent Court declared. Jeannie Yip, who we heard from Christina Howard a little bit earlier uh, about her taking this and the incumbent, of course. More through Scarborough. Let's bring you to Scarborough Guildwood. And John McKay, of course, incumbent liberal, also being declared in this case. Let's bring you to another Scarborough riding. And this one coming up here is Scarborough North. Uh, and Sean Chen, of course, declared in this mm -hmm. riding as well. We'll bring you to more Scarborough Southwest uh, coming up here. And this one, you'll see Bill Blair, incumbent, as you can see, reporting even with 68 of 196 polls being declared the winner in here. Humber River Black Creek, again, going to the Liberals. Judy Scro taking this one, and of course, uh, at the center of some controversy here, but taking this riding here. Toronto St. Paul's, Carolyn Bennett, we are watching a number of former cabinet ministers, and she taking her riding becomes liberal, stays liberal. Staying in the downtown core, we're going to bring you over to Toronto Centre. Bill Morneau, again, being elected the incumbent liberal. And uh, finally, we're going to bring you into Toronto University, Rosedale. And that's where Christopher Freeland is uh, being declared, or it's not officially declared just yet, but by looking at the numbers, uh, this one is uh, fairly uh, not so close to call in this case. And Adrian Gorill standing by at Christopher Freeland's headquarters right now. Adrian, what's the feel like over there? Well, we got some cheers in the background right now, Mel. They've been obviously toasting to Krista Freeland. We are here at her party headquarters tonight. 
on College Street. Though some of those cheers have also been for relief. This was a tight election. I'm joined by former Liberal MPP Deb Matthews. Deb, obviously a, a night for Liberals to celebrate, though this is also a, you know, a close race. How hard does Justin Trudeau have to work in the next couple of years? He's got to work really, really hard because the people of this country weren't so sure they wanted to, uh, to bring him back. In the end, they decided, yes, they did want Liberals back in power with a minority, but there's some terrific new MPs that have been elected. Um, Marie-France Lalonde, Helena Jacek, Han Dong, Adam Van Cooperden. There are taking some, out Lisa Ray. Taking out Lisa Ray. So he's got new, um, new energy, new blood that he's adding to his caucus. And um, I think I think this is pretty exciting. We're going to have, uh, I, you know, I think this government will go four years, I, I hope. This has been a very uh, divisive campaign uh, in the last few, several years. Some say that Justin Trudeau didn't live up to the promises when it comes to Indigenous peoples, when it comes to the environment. Can he push through some of these things with a minority government? Can he get the NDP on side? Can they work together? Can they work with the Conservatives? Well, I think they're going to have to work with the NDP, maybe the Bloc, I don't know, maybe the Green, however many there are there. But he's going to have to build that uh, um, initiative by initiative, uh, um, enough, to keep the, enough to keep the government uh, alive. And I, I don't think that's a problem. I think he's going to have to work at it. And everybody's going to have to come together and say, this is what the people of this country want. They wanted a liberal minority government. They got a liberal minority government with enough strength in the NDP to to um, move us on that progressive agenda. And that's what we are hearing in my ear right now, officially a liberal minority government. Can we see another election, though, in a couple years? And as we stand, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. You're not going to be happy with me. As we're at Krista Freeland's headquarters, yes. could she potentially, uh, and we just heard that Krista Freeland as well has just won, does she have leadership qualities for this party in the future? She's from Alberta. I know she's running here in Toronto tonight, but she's from Alberta. Could she pull some of that vote from the West? So uh, she's an amazing woman. She's an extraordinary leader now. And uh, I think Justin Trudeau has won a mandate, and uh, he will lead, and he will be prime minister. <laughs> a nice way to answer that question. Thank you so much, Deb. We're going to be watching the numbers. We're expecting Krista Freeland, who Deb Matthews will be introducing shortly. She'll be taking the stage behind me. She'll also be speaking with the media. We'll have that for you ahead on City News. We are live in Milton at the headquarters of Olympian turned Liberal Party candidate Adam Van Cooperden. A lot of excitement, a lot of movement happening here right now. It could very well be an upset tonight as Van Cooperden at the moment appears to have a lead on incumbent and Deputy Conservative Party leader Lisa Ray. Now we chatted with Van Cooperden just moments ago. Here's what he had to say. We had a really good day. You know, we knocked on a lot of doors today, like we do every day. We engaged a lot of our neighbors. We had good conversations, and we asked them what they wanted, and we reacted. You know, we made a, a platform like the Liberal does, based on what Canadians want, and I'm proud of that. How confident were you going into this campaign? It's not about confidence. Uh, you know, we work hard. You know, we get out there and we talk to more of our neighbors than any other campaign, and uh, you know, that gives me the confidence because I've got an amazing team, people that work hard every day. If I'm at the office three minutes late, then I've got beat there by 25 people. So. Um, Politics is a team sport, and I'm really, really lucky to have the best team in Canada. Well, so speaking of team, I mean, you, you do have a competitive edge here at, uh, because, uh, you know, you have your celebrity behind your name. Do you think that helped you uh, in this campaign? There's an incumbency factor, too. I, I'm not taking anything for granted. You know, I knocked on a lot of doors and got myself out there. Um, <laughs> I don't think being Olympian is enough. I don't think you, you get elected because you have Olympic medals. Yeah. Um, if I get elected, I hope it's because I talk to more of my neighbours and talk to them about what they'd like to see happen here in Milton and across Canada. And I know that the Liberal Party is the one with the best platform. So certainly a lots of lots of drama here tonight. Uh, Vancouver and of course, one of the Liberal Party's star candidates. This is what they were hoping for. And if he does win tonight, he'll not only unseat rate, but he'll turn a traditionally conservative riding over to Liberal. Very exciting here tonight. And breaking news right now from the Toronto Danforth riding where we are here at the Fox in the Fiddle. We are at the party for NDP candidate Min Suk Lee. However, we have just learned that Julie De Bruzen, who is the Liberal candidate and the incumbent here for this riding, has been declared the official winner. We don't know whether or not word has trickled down to all of the people here who have crowded the restaurant in support of the NDP and Min Suk Lee, hoping that the NDP would be able to take this riding 
sliding back and turn it back to orange from red. But again, the de declaration that has been made right now is that the Liberals have won this riding. Earlier, we did speak with supporters of Minsik Lee who said that they were confident an NDP win was possible and also said that there were several issues that they knew the NDP could tackle for the area. They have to take this riding back. Like, Min Sook has to win this riding. And why is that? I've never seen a candidate so sincere. She works so hard. She's changed policy already and doesn't even have a seat. I, see, I feel like uh, a lot of people that were disillusioned by Justin Trudeau are moving to the NDP. Uh, and I don't think they're swinging to the cons. So, uh, yeah, there's a really great energy, and especially in Toronto Danforth with Min Sook Lee running, because she's incredible. They're neck and neck. Now the energy has started to die down here as word starts to trickle out that the declaration has been made that the Liberals have won this riding and not the NDP. Another riding here in Toronto that was possibly going to go to the NDP is Davenport, but I'm just taking a look now. And there with about 50 of 195 polls reporting, the Liberals, the incumbent Julie Zerowicz is now leading by uh, over 1,200 votes so far. Hasn't been declared just yet, but it looks like that may stay red as well. It might be a little too early to tell. But again, the NDP here in Toronto, they were looking for a couple of seats here to uh, win back. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that is the case for this party. Instead, the Liberals have been declared here in Toronto. Danforth will have the latest, of course, uh, on reaction coming from here as well. And we'll have that for you coming up throughout the show. Todd Barkley is joining me now. She, he has been uh, going door to door in support of Jane Philpott throughout this entire ordeal. First things first, early polls are indicating that she may be in third place at this point. What's your reaction? Well, you said early, so that's my reaction right now. We're still hopeful that uh, we'll end up in a different spot, and uh, it's pretty early, so we're in for a long night. How do you... Um, how do you feel the, the campaign went through and through? Because we knew from the outset that it was going to be tight. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, I feel the campaign went really, really well. In fact, uh, being in her campaign office yesterday, meeting with so many of the different volunteers, many people said, really, there's not much more that could have been done. The, the time that was spent, there were over 400 volunteers helping Jane to get the message out. Uh, so I feel the campaign went pretty well. And certainly, you know, hope that uh, we're going to be in a different situation as the night rolls on. We were talking earlier about uh, the difference between Markham and Stouffville and how that could play into this. It definitely could play in, no doubt. You know, certainly Jane is tremendously well known in Stouffville. She was a physician here for a long time, but she was also a physician in Markham. And certainly Jane has a pretty high profile as a cabinet minister. A lot of people in the community know who she is and, and know what she stands for. She's an incredible lady with incredible integrity. So again, we're it's early, so we're optimistic. Exactly. We'll be wondering and waiting along with the rest of the crowd. Back to you. All right, Mark, thank you so much for that. So we know the Conservatives needed to break through in Brampton and Mississauga tonight in order to win this election. That did not happen. And so let's have a look at a sweep that we were seeing in red. Going through here, you can see through Brampton, Brampton East, also Menindra Sidhu winning in this. These are all declarations here. Uh, more ridings through Brampton, Brampton North, Ruby Sahoda taking this one here. Again, as we continue to move along very quickly here, there are a number that we're going to get through here, both Brampton and Mississauga. Brampton South, Sonia Sidhu taking this one. Uh, 5,300 votes in there, and that's not even all the polls reporting. Kamal Kara taking this one for the Liberals as well in Brampton West. As we move along now into Mississauga, Mississauga Center, Omar Agabra, Agabra rather, taking this one for the Liberals. And then into our next riding, Mississauga Center, which you just saw right there. Mississauga East Cooksville, Peter Fonseca uh, declared the winner of this riding here. Mississauga Aaron Mills. Uh, Khalid wearing, winning this one as well. This is uh, not even close, that riding right there. Mississauga Lakeshore, Sven Spangman. Of course, this is one that we were watching very closely, thinking perhaps this one could have went blue, but of course, this is now staying red. And in Mississauga Malton, Navdeep Baines declared in Mississauga Malton. Finally here, Mississauga Streetsville. Sikan taking this one. Fairly, uh, quite a bit of a lead in this case here. And bringing you to more in Mississauga that is our last one that we're watching for now, at least when it comes to declarations. Let's pipe in right now. Uh, Maxime Bernier with a speech right now. Let's jump into this. Build the foundations of a movement that is just beginning. The, the, 
Hundreds of thousands of Canadians have given support to the popular uh, to the People's Party of Canada. We are the fastest growing party in Canada's history and we will continue to grow in the next months and years. Foundations of a movement. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians supported the People's Party today. We are the fastest growing political party in Canadian history. And we will continue to grow in the coming months and years. The issues that we raise during this election will not disappear. On sustainable immigration, immigration, endless deficit, unfair equalization, pandering, big government policies, high taxes, all these problems will not disappear. And we will be there to criticize, criticize the government and offer better solutions. The issues we raised during this campaign will not disappear overnight. Unsustainable, uncontrolled immigration, uh, deficits without end, unfair equalization, big government uh, policies, high taxes, all those problems will not disappear. And we will be there. We will be there to criticize the next government and to offer better solutions. We will continue fighting for freedom, responsibility, fairness, and respect. We will be stronger next time. This is just the beginning for the People's Party of Canada. For our country, we will, the next time, we will continue to fight for freedom, responsibility, fairness and respect. It's only the beginning for the People's Party. Merci. Thank you. Maxime Bernier acknowledging defeat, but it certainly seems like he is going to try and continue on with his PPC party. Now let me introduce you to the group of political analysts and communications experts who are joining us here tonight, ready to help us make sense of all the results that we have seen here. To my right is Andre Domis, a contributing editor at McLean's Magazine. Next to him is strategic communications specialist Randy Rahamim. And on my left, Adrian Batra, editor and in chief of the Toronto Sun, as well as Kim Wright, who is a political strategist. Thank you all for being here. It's been quite the evening. We have had a lot of discussions here. <laughs> let's start with <laughs> Quebec. Some of it friendly and some of it not so much. All right, let's start with Quebec. 78 cherished seats. Uh, the Liberals have 34 so far elected or pending, and the uh, Bloc Québécois is tied with them at 34. The Conservatives, nine. Green, none. NDP, just one. That hurts the yes. NDP. They had, what, 14 yeah. at dissolution. Yeah. Is a large part of that, well, the surge of the, of the rise of the Bloc Québécois. Nobody expected Blanchet to, to bring this party back from obscurity. But do you think also that there's a, a real problem with Bill 21 and Jagmeet Singh wearing a turban? That, that Quebecers were just not going to accept. I think yes. when you, you have literal video evidence of Quebecers not being able to accept the fact that he wears a turban. I will say, though, that um, I have been paying attention to his French language appearances on, uh, for example, Tout le, uh, Tout le monde en parle. He did very um, well. And in his French language debates, he uh, comported himself fairly well. And uh, people who watched the debates, uh, many of them said that he ended up winning. I, I don't know that I'm willing to write off Quebec as simply racist. I think that what's required is for people in Quebec to get to know him a little bit better. And I think once they get more familiar with somebody with that background who does wear his, uh, an expression of his religion in public that way, I, I think that will end up softening the discourse a little bit, at least in time for the next election. But everybody had written off Jagmeet Singh. Well, they they, did. they, they was... didn't think he had done a great job as, as a leader up till mm -hmm. now. The, the party was broke. They hadn't raised what, I think they only raised about $5 million, whereas yeah. the previous yeah. election they raised 18. No, so. no expectations and you're not disappointed, right? Mm -hmm. But he did, he did perform. He did have he did. a great English language well. debate. 
I think on the notion of Bill 21, it's being played far different outside of Quebec than it is in actual Quebec itself. Um, they don't perceive it as this racist document that the rest of us do. They don't perceive it as, um, you know, offensive. And I think that's in part why you heard so many, all of, frankly, all of the leaders pandering in a way and flip-flopping and saying, well, you know, most of the Q&A, the Quebec National Assembly, have voted in favor of it. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to go anywhere. But polls but, suggested but 60% polls of Quebecers wanted it, too. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so they weren't going to... But I, I think Andre makes an important point that we can't just write Quebec off as a bunch of racists. Uh, I, I think that they have always believed, you know, they, they have their own culture, they have their own values, they're going to keep it and continue to do so. And Blanchet, though he didn't push separatism, really spoke about what it means to be a Quebecer. And yes. I think that mattered. And I also think Jagmeet didn't resonate with Quebecers as much as we thought. I think that he did well relative to low expectations that we had for Jagmeet. I think he did well in the English language debate. And that's when we really started to see him and his message flourish. But let's not, I, I also think that just because he was popular, just because he used creative techniques like TikTok yeah. to reach it out to, to young votes. voters or youth, doesn't mean those people are actually going to the ballot box, and, and especially not in Quebec. So what is, okay, it, let's so turn what to Ontario now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'll let you finish what that. is interesting is a lot of people were writing his obituary six weeks ago. They got mm -hmm. to see a flavor of who he is and the type of leader he wants to be and the type of new Democrat he wants to uh, create and cultivate. He has the time now uh, yes. over the coming two years, three years, four years, to really continue to grow and evolve that in a way not dissimilar to Jack's first campaign right. in 08. But the knives, the NDP knives may not be out for him as much as, as they might have been before, where before they, this. Where they certainly were at the very beginning of this campaign mm -hmm. and going into Labor Day, there were a lot of skeptical new Democrats that Jagmeet needed to win over within his own party. He did that by showcasing the campaign he ran, uh, what he builds on, how he decides to really shine within a minority government situation, that will be the test of his actual leadership. Okay, let's turn to Vote Rich Ontario. 121 seats. This is where the coveted yep. seats are. Uh, we have the breakdown here. Uh, the, on, the Liberals have 78 elected leading, Conservatives 36 elected or leading, NDP 7. The Conservatives did not break through in Ontario the way they were hoping to. And, and many thought internally that their polls showed that they were doing very well in Ontario. And in fact, what? lost their deputy leader. That's right. Yeah. Which is really Lisa Raitt, that's yeah. a big, big it's loss a huge for the loss. Conservative yeah. Party. She, She's a longtime Conservative, mm -hmm. very strong Conservative. Former Cabinet Minister and, you know, performed, I think, very, very well uh, during the uh, SNC-Lavalin scandal and on the Justice Committee and really did a very good job, along so with Nathan Cullen. And holding the Liberals accountable. Why did There's, the Conservatives not break through in well, Ontario? A, a lot of what we talked about earlier is whoever shows up is going to win. And I think there was a motivation by a lot of progressives who were con perhaps considering looking at the NDP came out and voted, uh, ultimately voted Liberal. Do you think there was a lot of strategic voting and people who well, were leaning the NDP went Liberal after all? Remember, perhaps. Remember what was unique but, about the Liberal message in Ontario and that was there was a clear opponent. I mean, you had the Ford. Liberals against it was Ford. It provincial, was Ford. Yeah. our premier, Doug Ford, right? And it became very easy to contrast the liberal identity and what, may, what you may or may not like about Justin Trudeau with what you definitely don't like about Doug Ford for, Doug for Ford many, many people. All those writings in the he election. Did, he did. Yeah. And, 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 and completely ride. squandered yeah. the political capital he built in every single one of those writings by picking fights with the parents of autistic children, mm -hmm. by firing teachers or laying off teachers, however you want to describe that. But the fact that he uh, ended up... Uh, waging a losing battle against the carbon tax, losing in court and wasting millions of taxpayer dollars. And these ridiculous Andre. signs that have to go up on Doug gas Ford's stations. already been elected. We don't yes, need to read it. Yes, he's been elected. Okay, I'm going to hold him over for a moment again. <laughs> just just, just let me get a word in here. Get some new talking you about. Can't you can't answer the question about Ontario without addressing Doug Ford's failure. All right, let's stop when you're there. We're throwing out a Tina Young, Donnie and your Aurora tonight, where conservative Leona, I really had to cut you off there. al has just been elected. Tina. <laughs> yes, yeah, Cynthia, she was just elected. It was a really tight race here in the riding of Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. She beat the Liberal candidate so far by just around 1,000 votes. And she actually was elected as a Liberal candidate in 2015, and she crossed the floor last year. So it was really, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to be happening here tonight. But uh, again, this room is celebrating. She has uh, been re-elected. Joining us now is Aurora's mayor, Tom Marrakis. Tom, were you expecting such a tight race? 
Um, actually, yeah, I think all the candidates were excellent uh, candidates, and uh, it was a it was a tight race. Uh, but you know, uh, I think um, uh, the voters have spoken, and, and they've chosen someone that has done an excellent job representing them over the last four years. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work with uh, Leona and uh, and looking at uh, you know uh, what's important for our community and moving forward uh, in that working relationship and partnership between the federal government and the municipal government. When she first crossed the floor last year, it came as a surprise to a lot of people. What were you hearing from constituents who had initially voted in a Liberal MP who then went Conservative? Uh, I think at the beginning there was a lot of uh, maybe a little bit of an anger uh, amongst the, the voters, but um, I, I guess, you know, as I said, the uh, the people have spoken and I guess uh, they've, they've come to realize that Leona did a wonderful job over the last four years and so they voted for her and then they're bringing her back uh, as the Member of Parliament. And you've had a chance to work pretty closely with her over the, the past four years. What are some of the highlights of, of having worked with her? Uh, you know what, I, I think uh, some of the highlights are she's very passionate, especially about uh, the initiatives that we're having within our riding. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, re, uh, uh, reinvigorating our downtown core, and she's been very big on helping us and with support through some infrastructure, possible some funding that will be coming our way, hopefully. And so it's, uh, I think it's, uh, we're looking at continuing that working relationship, and I'm excited to do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, we're expecting Leona to arrive uh, any any moment now, and we'll have that for you a little bit later in the show. A lot of excitement, a lot of elation here in Milton tonight at the headquarters of Adam Vancouverden, who has just unseated uh, Lisa Raitt uh, for this riding. He is a decorated Olympian turned newcomer Liberal candidate, and now he has uh, done what the Liberals wanted him to do. He was a star candidate, and uh, it's, it's certainly been a dramatic night. I actually uh, spoke to Vancouverden just moments after he won. Take a look. This was a, a tough and long campaign for you. You really hit the pavement. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know that hard work pays off, and I kept hearing at the door over and over and over again that Milton was really desperate for a progressive voice in Ottawa. So we made it happen, and I'm really, really satisfied. Do you think the demographic, what, what do you think helped you in your win tonight? Was it your name? Was it the dem demographic of Milton? Was Milton really uh, ready and, and for a change? I've lived in Halton since I was four years old, and I've witnessed the change that's happened here. Uh, my mom's house used to be the farthest house, house north in, in, in Oakville, and it's not even close anymore. So we've grown a lot. You know, we've changed. We're multicultural. You know, we're cosmopolitan. We're educated, we're young, we're vibrant. We want to move forward, so that's what we chose. You seem cool, cool as a cucumber right now. I was watching you throughout the night. I did see a bit of emotion in those eyes. Do you feel a little bit overwhelmed, or do you feel, you know, how, walk me through what you're, what you're going through? I don't feel overwhelmed. I feel ready to go to Ottawa and advocate for my neighbours. And better than an Olympic win, this political win? There's no comparing an Olympic win to anything else. Vancouver in just moments ago was taking shots <laughs> with his supporters. He's been taking selfies. He's been uh, doing lots of hugging. He's certainly very happy with the results here tonight. And this was a riding that many people were watching. It has been conservative for over a decade now. It's turned over to the Liberals. So quite a dramatic turn of events. And uh, congratulations to Adam Vancouver in. I'm here at the Firkin on Bay Street where there have been dozens of students gathered here all evening for a U of T viewing party and a lot of mixed emotions today as this federal election has been playing out. And joining me now is Anvish. Anvish, this was your first federal election that you voted in yes. and you told me that you spoiled your vote. Yeah, Why is that? Well, I figure in a democracy, if you're unhappy with all of the options, you tell the people in charge that. If you don't like any of the party leaders, and I think it's an option that more Canadians really should have considered this time around considering how historically unpopular a lot of the candidates are, as evidenced by what's happening tonight. More Canadians should have spoiled their ballot if they're unhappy with uh, the options presented before them. Come up with better options. So tell me, what are your issues with the Liberal minority government? With the Liberal minority government? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I think that Justin Trudeau, he's had four years to govern the country, and I think on a number of fronts, he has disappointed. He's disappointed young Canadians, he's disappointed old Canadians. I think at this point it's hard to find a group of Canadians, other than the Liberal diehard, that he hasn't in some way, shape or form insulted or disappointed. And uh, I'm not saying that Andrew Scheer would necessarily be better, but I do know that if you give somebody four years and you give them a government, it's not necessarily the best idea to give them another government. I am happy though that it is a uh, minority government, just because I think there's more of a check and balance on the power of the Trudeau government. I think it's a positive development for the country. 
I think it's important that Trudeau learns to work with other parties. He learns to work with the conservative opposition. He learns, learns to work with the Bloc Quebecois, the NDP, the Greens. It's quite fascinating and interesting that the Bloc is now such a huge force in our parliament. So he's going to have to learn to work with these other parties instead of just pushing his agenda. So what do you hope, in 30 seconds, what do you hope Trudeau does differently? I hope he just listens to young Canadians more. I just want him to do away with the identity politics, do away with the Twitter and the, the Facebook and the social media imaging, and just be a genuine person. Be a real prime minister, sober up, and understand that a lot of Canadians need you to represent us on the world stage. We need to, we're not a joke, and under Trudeau, sometimes I feel like he's not taking this seriously enough. I think he needs to wisen up, and I, need, I think he needs to realize that, you know, his father did a pretty good job as prime minister. He needs to become older. He has a second term that uh, his father had to fight pretty hard to get back in the 80s. So I hope he does better. I hope he does better. Thank you so much, Anvish. Yeah. What I learned is there are a lot of engaged students here. I got a chance to speak to a lot of people who are quite informed and were happy to vote today. It's Richard Southern here in North Etobicoke. We're at Renata Ford's election night headquarters, which is an Asian buffet on Rexdale uh, Boulevard. And uh, not much to celebrate here for Renata and her uh, small uh, crew. Maybe only about 15 people showed up in support of uh, the widow of the... Uh, uh, late mayor of Toronto, Rob Ford, uh, Renata, who had never run for politics before going down in defeat, uh, re-elected here in this riding North Etobicoke is Kirsty Duncan, uh, who has been a cabinet member in the Trudeau government. This is a liberal stronghold, this riding going back to the early 60s, and again, it remains a liberal stronghold. But Renata Ford tells us this is just the beginning for her. She says she's going to run for office again. Well, you know, you know, we have good policies, and it should resonate with the with the uh, public. And unfortunately, some parties have decided to, um, you know, use companies to destroy us, and that's not fair. And even in my own riding, I've had situation where I think there's uh, police investigations on spreading bad rumors about our party with, that we're racist, and we're not because we have people from all different cultures and all different religions. So we represent Canadians. We just want to have more for Canadians that are suffering right now. We should take care of our own backyard before we take care of other people's backyards. And I asked Renata when the last time she talked to Premier Doug Ford was. She didn't give me a straight answer on that. Uh, Renata, it seems, estranged from Doug Ford. She's currently suing him over family finances. Again, it's the Liberals re-elected in North Etobicoke. Renata Ford going down in defeat. Richard Southern City News. I'm in Scarborough, Agent Court. Now, this riding has been liberal for more than 30 years, and tonight we found out that it will remain so. I'm speaking with Gene Yip. You've just been re-elected. How does this feel? Because this is your first time being re-elected. I'm ecstatic, and I'm very thankful that the residents of Scarborough, Agent Court, has chosen to re-elect me again. So, this is going to be your first time walking into a minority government. What types of differences do you think there will be? I think that all parties will have to work together and they'll have to work quickly to also listen to the, what Canadians across the country want. And what do you think one of the most pressing issues is here in Scarborough Agent Court? Well, I think one of the most pressing issues is seniors and income security, transit, pharmacare. And a commanding lead, but we know that you have been re-elected, so congratulations. Thank you. And what's the first thing you're going to do when you head back to the Hill? First thing I'm going to go do is um, make sure that everything that Scarborough Agent Court residents want is voiced. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Thank you. And we need to do it again. I'm okay. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Christina. Let's talk about the 416. Staying red tonight, and Toronto's mayor has reached out to congratulate the Liberal Party. Mayor John Tory released the statement just moments ago, and it reads in part here, I want to congratulate Justin Trudeau and his team on their re-election tonight. His campaign promised to continue investing in transit expansion in Toronto, in affordable housing, and in kids and families as an important element in addressing the roots of gun violence. Three important priorities for our city. I want to show you some of the results in a few of those Toronto ridings, which are key, beginning here in Don Valley East, uh, the incumbent, Ratanzi, uh, being declared in this riding here. More with Don Valley, Don Valley North, Han Dong taking this one here. Uh, and you can see we'll do one more coming in through Don Valley, and that's Don Valley West, Rob Oliphant uh, taking this one by quite the margin as well. 
Bring you to Beaches East York, Nathaniel Erskine Smith taking this one a huge gap in use in the uh, results that you're seeing in these polls reporting. And a few more Parkdale High Park, Arif Arani, all of these are liberal again. Bring you to more through Toronto in Davenport. This is a big one as well and uh, not as big of a margin as some might have anticipated. All right, and let's uh, dip in live right now, actually. Great crowd tonight, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out. It's awesome to see you. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I want to start, first of all, by saying I'd like to reintroduce you to John Collin and Billy, who the last time you may have seen them were a lot shorter and a lot more petite our first time. And I'm delighted that they're here with me tonight as well. I also have with me my husband, Bruce, who's the strong and silent guy who's standing off to the side, letting us have the limelight. But he's here in the house, and we're pleased. I want to thank my volunteers. Oh my gosh, you guys are so awesome. We've gone through so much in the last I don't know how many days, guys. It's been a long, it feels like three months. It may have been a little bit longer. But you've been there for me, and I so appreciate everything that you've done. From everybody who canvassed with me, everybody who came out and made sure we had signs where they needed to be, and everybody, of course, who helped support in the office. I would be nothing without a fantastic team. And I want to thank Sarah Navy, who is a fantastic campaign manager. Thank you, Sarah. I want to thank Allison Haley, who was the chair and the person in charge of all the volunteering, who did a remarkable job. Very proud of you. I want to thank Harry Hall, who did all the signs, and including making sure that our office looked fantastic. Harry, thank you very much. And the Brain Trust, who did all of our advertising around Milton, so my face is immortalized forever, it feels like. Daryl DeMille, chair of our campaign. Thank you very much, Daryl. I had awesome support from everybody that was very, very helpful along the way. My EDA board was extremely helpful. They were fantastic in supporting. They fundraised. They made sure we were ready for this election. But the reality is, guys, it's not the result that we wanted tonight, was it, unfortunately? But I can tell you this. I am so lucky for having had the trust of Miltonians for the past 11 years. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to accomplish together. We have an arts and culture center now. We have a velodrome, the only velodrome here. Second one in North America. And those are things that we can say that we accomplished together and that are gonna make our community so much better for so many more years than just two years of a minority government. I wanna say thank you so very, very much. I had to get something in, right? I want to say thank you very much to our leader, Andrew Scheer, for giving me the opportunity of being the deputy leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. It has been an absolute honor and an absolute pleasure. I've been able to go coast to coast to coast through the leadership process to get to know everybody in Canada, and I love Conservatives, and I know that they work hard and they want to make sure that we're making our communities better, and I want to thank every single one of them across the country as well. So finally, I would like to say this. We worked really hard and we put in a great effort. I did call Adam and I conceded the election and I thanked him for a great campaign. And I also said it's an honor and a privilege to represent Milton. And I know that he's going to go on and represent Milton in a way that will be respectful and give dignity to the hometown. It's my hometown and I want us to be represented well as well. So. With that, we've got some cleanup to do, but we also have a little bit of celebration to do. It's awesome to be amongst each other. I'm delighted to see you. I'm looking forward to getting a lot of hugs out there. And again, I want to thank all the volunteers. And I did forget one other person. I want to thank Fike Farouk. Fike Farouk was a uh, high school student who came out and became the chair of our student volunteers who worked tirelessly on this entire campaign, including a massively fantastic stint on CBC panel at the very early, uh, early of our campaign. So way to go, Fike. So, Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great honor to represent Milton. It's a great honor to sit in the House of Commons, and I want to thank you for the absolute best thing that's ever happened in my life. Thank you very much.
a very gracious speech from Lisa Raitt. Big loss for the Conservative Party. She lost her seat to Adam Vancouverden, the Liberal rising star candidate and former Olympian. Now, as the Western Province's results begin to come in, and some updates for you now from Saskatchewan. First, an upset of a longtime cabinet minister. Veteran Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodell has lost his Saskatchewan riding of Regina, Wisconsin to Conservative Michael Cram. He was an MP for 30 years. And nearby Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has won his riding, no surprise, of Regina Capel. And in Alberta, a solid sea of blue again. This is no surprise. With the exception of one riding, the NDP managing to hang on to stronghold Edmonton Strathcona. While in British Columbia, it is a three-way race. We are waiting for the final results. And the B.C. riding of Saanich Gulf Islands, Green Leader Elizabeth May, has kept her seat. And we're also monitoring NDP leader Jagmeet Singh's riding out in Burnaby, B.C. No results on that one yet, but we will bring them to you as soon as we have them. So, back to our panel. And we have a new panelist at our table with us, Bob Richardson, who is the Senior Counsel of National Public Relations. Bob, you're a longtime Liberal. What are your thoughts tonight? This is a minority. Four years ago, nobody thought Justin Trudeau would have been fighting for his political life and having a minority. Well, my first thought is few. Uh, <laughs> so uh, happy to uh, happy to see a Liberal government elected tonight. Uh, I think uh, it's a very strong minority. They clearly have the right to govern okay, and uh, they're in thought. good shape. I'm so sorry. Krista Freeland is speaking right now. We'll there take we her go. live and we'll come back to you, Bob. I no problem. The sagas of the new credit. Et ça me fait un très, très grand plaisir d'être parmi vous, mes chers amis, après beaucoup, beaucoup de travail écharné et d'être ensemble ce soir. Merci beaucoup, University Rosedale. I'd like to start, before I came here, I had a very nice phone call with Melissa Jean-Baptiste Vaida, uh, and I would like to just start by congratulating Melissa, by congratulating Helen Claire Tingling of the Conservative Party, Melissa, of course, of the NDP, Tim Grant of the Greens, and all of the other candidates who ran here. Uh, it really was a pleasure for me to spend time particularly with Melissa, Tim, and Helen Claire at the All Candidates meetings. And I think we should give them and the volunteers who worked so hard for them a round of applause. <laughs> but of course, the volunteers who I most of all want to thank and who I truly, truly love and am so deeply grateful to are the people in this room and the literally hundreds of other people who worked so hard on this campaign. You guys are amazing, thank you. Over the past 40 days, you have phoned more than 22,000 people, wow, and knocked on nearly 19,000 doors. Amazing! A truly, truly astonishing, truly, truly team effort, and I am so, so grateful. And I am especially grateful because the fact that you guys did such an astonishing job in University Rosedale made it possible for me to travel across the country and help other candidates. Since the writ dropped, I've been to BC, to Alberta, all over Quebec, and all over Ontario. I've supported 39 different candidates that has been from the Sioux to Sherbrooke, from Montreal to Muskoka, from Barrie to Burnaby, and from Edmonton to Etobicoke. 
And that was only possible because there was such an excellent team doing all the hard work that you did here in University Rosedale. So I want everyone here tonight to really appreciate and recognize that they have done remarkable work here in our fabulous community, but everyone here truly has also contributed hugely to a very strong national campaign. So thank you so, so, so much. Christian Freeland winning handily. Okay, Bob Richardson, back to you, and we'll open up the panel. Liberal minority. I mean, we've had 13 minority federal governments in this country, but now Justin Trudeau is going to have to do some fancy footwork to make sure he gets, gets an alignment with other parties to keep going and be able to convince the governor general that he can keep the, the government going. I'm sure he will be able to with 156 seats, but now he's going to have to govern very differently. I think so. I think you, you change your style in a minority government. I, you've got to be a lot more inclusive. You've got to talk to uh, the opposition. You've got to talk to your members. Mm -hmm. This isn't your entirely. Members. Uh, this yeah. isn't entirely a bad thing. So I think you've got to change gears a little bit here. Uh, nobody will want an election because none of the parties have any money. So everybody will want to uh, mind their p's and q's for at least two years or two and a half years, mm -hmm. and then probably go back to the polls after that. But I think it's a good opportunity to get a lot of things done. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity to sit down and talk with the NDP and with other parties, and I think you can put together a good agenda and got, uh, get a lot done. We did it here in Ontario many years ago between David Peterson and Bob Ray. It was a really, really positive, progressive uh, time in government. There's no reason why we couldn't do that in Ottawa today. We talked last week, I believe, you and I, about how toxic this election was and what a horrible campaign it was. Do you think that people all need to go back in their respective corners and, and, and think about that? Yeah, I think so. And I think there's particularly one party uh, that was particularly toxic in this campaign. And I hope that they review their leader and I hope they review their campaign tactics and I hope they clean up their act. That's exactly because what the Liberal Party should do. And that's exactly <laughs> what the Conservative Party should Adrian do. Adrian, I knew you were going to have a comeback yeah. for that. That's this exactly Prime what Minister, the Conservative Party should do. This Prime Minister because it was has divided this country. Just got shut out of Alberta. Basically got shut out of the province of Saskatchewan. Maybe held on to a few in Manitoba. He considers the West flyover provinces. He has according allowed to, the block. According, he has, according he according has allowed just... the block to actually regain some momentum with 34, 35 seats. No, tonight. no, no. You know who let his the block gain momentum? Won. His was because job your party placed fourth. Should be you to actually have some regional um, unity. He came out of the gate. Um, insulting Jason Kenney, going after Doug Ford, and going Jesus after anybody no that was center no right. But the this is a prime oh, minister okay. Okay. that has done this. Let's 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 no, no, let's. <laughs> That's fine. Are we done one the, versus four. I'm, I'm used to it. Are we I'm done the parallel myself. universe now? Can we come back to this planet? Because I would like to do that. Oh, um, is your leader wearing blackface again in that so, Okay, but, but, so, but there you go. picking up on blackface. Okay, Randy. What's the prize? Getting nasty. What surprises me? I mean, the real story of this election is that despite blackface, despite SNC-Lavalin, despite ethics reviews, despite all these transgressions, the leader of the Conservative Party was not able to take it across the finish line and win the election. That is and I and think and that, that is the supposed story to win the majority no, again. Well, our, come on, let's let's be honest with you. Despite the all those problems, how Canadian is it possible? History. I think that the Conservative Party now has to look inside its own its own doors I and start they thinking about will. I hope, and I, I hope, hope you continue on will. Let me actually ask you, yes, what do you predict? Uh, oh, boy. If you ask me to predict, then I think that we will have to burn this tape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that there is... Uh, there's conversations happening right now. Andrew Scheer, like all the other leaders, um, will come and address the country. He will send a message to, to, to voters. It will be instructive to hear what he actually has to say before I will make any prediction as to whether or not the knives will be out um, to, to get rid of him. Often is what's pretty common in most parties. They give their leader a couple of uh, opportunities to do it. Like in 2004 when Harper um, was, was leader of the Conservative Party, Paul Martin was relegated to a minority, and then Harper ended up winning a, a minority in 06. So maybe those are the calculations that they're making. Uh, it, it's very difficult to say. Um, the Tories do have money. 
Um, the, once all the returns come in, they'll have a pretty decent war chest. The NDP will be broke. Everybody else is I right, basically broke. I think this is, without a doubt, but, the worst Conservative leader in 50 years. I would be delighted if they keep him is, because uh, it will be a great election uh, next time out. I think he has been a terrible leader. I think he's been divisive. I think he recruited poor candidates. He had no vision, and he had all the charm of an empty soup can. So I would be delighted if he stays uh, I, I, until I, the next election. I am going to let that Adrian language, respond A lot of you? that language is exactly how those that are center-right and conservative voters would say about the empty suit, which is Justin Trudeau. Okay. And there is going to be a lot of anger in this country tomorrow morning. I, I don't disagree with you on that, particularly in Alberta. Right now, though, we're going to head to Montreal with Tina Tenorello, who is at Justin Trudeau's headquarters. Tina. Yes, and there is only happiness here at the Montreal Convention Centre. Uh, the room has been slowly filling up and a lot of young people here, people cheering up and down and we're joined by one of those students. Congratulations uh, for this win. How are you feeling? What do you think it is that helped the Liberals win? Because if we looked at the polls, it didn't look like they were going to be able to pull this off tonight. It was like everyone volunteering, people coming to volunteer at all the campaign offices every day, every weekend, taking that, just that little hour would help. We did door to door, calling, any, everything made a difference. And you're a student yourself at a local college here in Montreal, Marianopolis. Was there a lot of young people working on this campaign? Yeah, we had several people in my club that were coming to go help Mark Garneau's campaign, Mark Miller's campaign. We just went door to door and calling, it just made such a difference and we brought awareness to the club. Um, to the school about all the platforms and everything, so we really encourage that. Now, the environment was definitely an issue on everyone's mind during yeah. this campaign. Is that why there were a lot of young people going out there and trying to get these Liberal yeah. votes? Yeah, a lot of people were on the fence between choosing Green or Liberal Party, but we, we really like changed their minds after showing them each platform and showed them the pros and cons. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. And uh, here in Montreal, there is Stephen Guilbeault, a very well-known environmental activist who has won his seat and the Liberals only 15 seats away from a majority so doing much better than protecting holding on in BC Quebec and Ontario all right thank you Tina incumbent and independent MP Jane Philpott has lost her seat she of course was running as an independent after the SNC Lavalin scandal she's speaking now and we are going to take you there campaign Entirely, entirely powered by your energy, your hope, and your determination. I am so overjoyed about the over 400 volunteers, all of you and many, many more, who came together, who came together to create a movement for positive change in how we do politics. And you did it. I am humbled by over 600 donors who gave generously to make our campaign possible, who gave so much that we had to shut down donations after two weeks because we didn't need any more money. I am honored by the thousands of messages of support that have come from across the country. So many, I haven't been able to answer them all. From Canadians who believed and continue to believe in our campaign. And I will remember every single day of this campaign how you have worked hard, how you have shown what it's like to do politics differently. And we built a vision together. We built a vision for the people of Markham Stouffville of a strong, independent representative in Ottawa, and you brought the vision to life. And regardless of what the outcome was going to be tonight, my predominant message is the same, and that message is thank you. Thank you to the people of Markham Stouffville for giving me the incredible privilege of representing them for the past four years in Ottawa. 
We ran a campaign based on optimism. We believe politics can be better, can be more collaborative, more inclusive, and more creative. Our goal has been to show Canada what it's like to color outside the party lines. You're, you're not here tonight because of me. You're here tonight because of what our campaign represents. The desire to do something positive together for the good of everyone. And our campaign has been about that. It's been about working side by side with volunteers and supporters from all ranges of political, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. It's been about meeting and talking with thousands of people from Markham Stouffville. And we reached out to 75,000 times by knocking on doors and making phone calls. 75,000 individual outreaches. And we listened, to, we listened to people's hopes and their dreams and their heartaches and their desires. We believe that politicians can work together and we can change the world for the better. We can combat climate change and transition to a clean energy economy. We can solve the housing affordability crisis. We can bring justice to Indigenous peoples. We can change the electoral process so that every vote counts. And we can fill in the missing pieces of universal health care and implement the long-awaited dream of public pharmacare. And I still believe we can do every one of those things as we continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying yes when I said, do you want to go knock on doors in the snow? Saying yes when I said, can you come to the campaign office at 9.30? we got to talk. Thank you for saying yes every time it was cold out or it was hot out or it was wet out. We just went and we did it. We just went and we knocked or we talked. We walked so many kilometers. And I just got to, it's a crazy thing. There's a couple people in here that ran a great distance recently, like a marathon or an ultra distance. <laughs> then there's a, a couple people who are not like decidedly athletes. They walked like 150 kilometers this weekend. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting you're not athletic because that is a feat in itself. Uh, but there's some people that have over 100,000 steps in the last three days standing among us. And this is not possible without you. This would have not been possible I without. For you. I live in Cambridge. <laughs> There's even people who knock from Cambridge. I live in yeah. Ottawa. I'm Greg from Calgary. <laughs> people Greg flew from here Calgary. from Calgary to knock on doors for the Liberals because, well, we don't have to talk about that. I have a list of names to thank, and I'm going to forget a lot of them, but I asked Alex who gets a shout out, he didn't even write his own name down. Um, but there's a lot of important names on here and I'm gonna go through it and I'm gonna miss a whole bunch. And please don't be offended if I miss your name because you're all so, so important. First and foremost, where the heck is Jeff Carpenter? Right here. <laughs> Jeff Carpenter and I met at Starbucks last September. He was wearing Birkenstocks because it was warm out and what I, soon learned is that Birkenstocks are going to be worn at all times, no matter how cold it is, uh, all throughout the winter. And we sat down and he said, so you want to be a politician? I said, no, not really. I would like to be a public servant. And he goes, good answer. And at the time we were watching uh, Better O'Rourke and we had some, you know, common thoughts about that, uh, that Texas race uh, against Ted Cruz. And we talked a little bit about what we like and what we dislike in politics and how we could work together. And we left uh, that meeting uh, knowing that we we're going to work together. We we're going to work together for a year. And before I thank anybody else, I want to thank his wife, Katie, who's in the back. Who's, uh... All right, that was Adam Vancouverden, Olympic star and the Liberal star candidate who took down Lisa Raitt, a longtime strong conservative. Uh, that is a big loss for the Conservative Party. And the results are rolling in nationally now. And while the Liberals have a plurality of seats, 
they are not leading the popular vote. That goes to the Conservatives, though it is still extremely close. You can see that the Conservatives have just over 34% of the popular vote, while the Liberals are sitting at slightly more than 33%. Slim margin to be sure, but that's more than 100,000 votes. This is how it translates into seats. The margin much wider here with the Liberals scooping more than 140 confirmed seats. What you're seeing on the, on the screen is the 157 are confirmed plus leading seats. Now the Conservatives are roughly 25 seats behind the Liberals. Further back are the NDP with about 20 confirmed seats, the Green with two confirmed and the Bloc with 32 seats in the final count. Now, let's pick up our chat. As I was recall, it was getting a little testy between the two of you here. Adrian, oh, I, I was going to give you a I chance to respond. I think people should know we're very dear friends <laughs> off air. <laughs> you can have respectful political discussion uh, and disagreement in this country, Absolutely. as we have repeatedly seen with a lot of these concessions. And I think that's part of what gets forgotten about in our, in our elegant democracy that we have. It's peaceful it's 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 can be elegant in its own way we just heard from dr phil pot which i i think is, is it's unfortunate that she lost and then we with the loss with lisa rayet as well she spoke so so passionately yeah. gracefully let's talk about the popular vote mm -hmm. and and how the conservatives are actually a little bit ahead slightly ahead of the liberals in the popular vote in alberta especially that must really rankle and you have talked about yeah. Alberta. I, I think that the divide is is growing there. The pipeline issue is now what stalled because how will the Liberals ever, if if they can form a minority government, how will they ever push that forward? Well, it's going to be very difficult to do, even with the four and a half billion dollars that they spent on buying the pipeline already. And we've seen that repeatedly stalled and blocked. And I don't generally think safer maybe a handful of things that a significant development like a pipeline we will see that until perhaps the next election and a majority government and i think that's an unfortunate reality that um albertans have to contend with and that hurts them and it hurts ca ca it canadian economy them. well it does anger them but it hurts the co economy in general i mean it puts energy east um you know in jeopardy all sorts of energy issues going are going to be a big challenge well, according to what this is my question. According to what? The pipeline is not built. Why, why operate under the assumption that the pipeline is a done deal when the land that it has to go through doesn't belong to us? I don't understand how it is. If you're not getting unanimous consent from every nation through whose land the pipeline has to go. And keep in mind, the pipeline that already exists didn't get there with unanimous consent. It was built there because the First Nations communities did not have the ability to hire legal counsel to fight the federal government to not violate the treaties. Why do we take it for granted that we can just occupy other people's lands and put pipelines through I them? don't understand why you don't understand the 101 Aboriginal communities that have actually come forward and said that we do want to work with the federal government, we do want to work with the, the land process, wants a highway that we actually going through do their want house. to If your next door neighbor wants a highway going through their house, what does that have to jobs. do with you? That those good paying what does your jobs. Your next door neighbor wanting a highway to go through their home. But I have think to do okay. evidence, evidence, evidence. Let's let's fact. let's move this right. argument yeah. forward to another topic and let's turn to pharmacare. Do you think a minority liberal government, if if it's cobbled together, will be able to push that through? Ready. This is one I actually think they can tackle yeah. because mm -hmm. if, especially if they if they um, join forces with the NDP, of which this was a significant flank in their in their yeah. platform. I think that this is one where they can get an easy win. And when they're looking, when they sit back down, sit down now and they look at what are they going to tackle from a legislative perspective, I think pharmacare is going to be top of the list, there's no question. there's a decent roadmap there. Uh, Dr. Eric Hoskins, okay. a former mm -hmm. Liberal uh, Ontario uh, Health that. Minister, uh, put together a pretty comprehensive report on this. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good piece of the puzzle. So I think that there's an opportunity to work together with Greens and with uh, and with New Democrats to, to get that forward. And on the pipeline issue, the one thing that I, I think we're forgetting here is when uh, Stephen Harper was in, Liberals voted with Stephen Harper sometime. New Democrats mm -hmm. voted with mm -hmm. Stephen Harper sometimes. Mm -hmm. Even the Bloc, I think, voted with Stephen Harper sometimes. So it's not just about one right. party. Yeah. You may yeah. find Conservatives and Liberals uh, uh, going together to yeah. on, on some major economic yeah. or on some major uh, energy, uh, energy projects mm -hmm. to move things forward. If so. the Liberals were smart, I think, uh, as well, We'd reach out to the Conservatives on this particular issue, even if they're regional Conservatives, to say, help us solve this problem. Yeah. And I think, quite honestly, the private sector is going to play a key role yeah. In, yeah. in moving this ahead. It's important yeah. for the economy. All right. How do you think a Liberal minority government will function, Andre? 
And what do you think the NDP's big asks are going to be to prop him up? I think uh, if the NDP is looking to uh, Bill, given, given that they've lost close to half their seats in this election, they're going to have to pick up support from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that it's, it's going to be the, uh, the block of voters that tends to not turn out for the polls uh, because they're disaffected by the process. That generally happens to be young voters. and also happens to be voters who are racialized. So uh, if they, if they uh, bolster their uh, platform with uh, issues that pertain to racial justice. I don't mean like a separate racialized issue. I mean when it comes to environment, uh, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to economic inequality, when it comes to social policies, etc. In some ways it has, they have to be able to sign up for racial justice. Now for the Liberals who came into power in 2015 on promises that had to do with that, then I think they can find some common ground here. For example, if they're able to find a way to make the cannabis industry more inclusive, if they can find a way that uh, pharmacare uh, can be made for, or they can they can find ways to make pharmaceuticals affordable for all families, if they can address the housing issue, which uh, you know in the previous budget housing was addressed by making the purchase of homes more affordable for people, but did nothing for people who are uh, who can't own homes, who want to uh, who want to rent, increasing the available amount of units. Uh, for rent and keeping them affordable as well, I think is an avenue for the, uh, for the NDP to show that they are truly a progressive party and understand the, uh, the working class values of Canadians who, you know, maybe not, don't necessarily belong to the quote unquote middle class, don't have aspirations on getting to the top 1%, just want to be able to like live day to day in this country. All right, we're going to pause just for a moment and I am sending it to Tina in Aurora. Thanks, Cynthia. A lot of excitement here in Aurora tonight. The incumbent Conservative MP Leona Alislev has been re-elected. There was a lot of uncertainty about what would happen here tonight. She was an MP who was initially elected as a Liberal in 2015, and she crossed the floor last year. It was an incredibly tight race, and we had a chance to catch up with Alislev just a few moments ago. Well, obviously, I'm very... Uh, humbled by the opportunity to serve the constituents of Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill again, but I'm obviously very disappointed in the overall results across the country. Was anything, uh, you know, with you crossing the floor last year, did that uncertainty have anything to do with it? Uh, no, because it was a tight race uh, last time, and uh, we'll see what the numbers en end up being, but it looks like the margin that I was successful by will be about the same as it was last time. And so the reason that I decided to cross the floor was because because the commitments that I made in the last election to the citizens of Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill and the country of what I would do was not what the government said they were going to do. So she is obviously very happy she was re-elected but disappointed that a liberal uh, minority is uh, what's going to be happening moving forward and we are expecting to hear from her in just a few moments. We'll have that for you later in the show. All right, Tina, thank you so much. If you missed anything, always you can go to our website, citynews.ca, and have a peek on your individual riding. But we want to bring this to your attention. When you look at the seat count in comparison to the actual popular vote, there's a bit of a discrepancy here. So you can see the Liberals with 156 uh, and Conservatives at 121, but 34% when it comes to the popular vote. So again, you can come back to our website, citynews.ca. You can also type in your individual riding here and see what's happening there. Not all of the ridings, of course, have been declared just yet. Very interesting, though, we are keeping a very close eye on what's happening in Vancouver Granville. Of course, Jody Wilson-Raybould, look at this tight race. We only have 77 of 205 polls reporting, a very slim margin between the two right now. Elected, of course, Jagmeet Singh in Burnaby South, and of course, elected Elizabeth May in her riding as well. Interesting, of course, we only had the one green seat previous, but now the Greens picking up two more seats in Nanaimo, Ladysmith, and also another one in Fredericton. We're going to continue to watch this again. Go to our website, citynews.ca, as more of the results roll in. Meantime, we're checking in with Janella standing by at Conservative incumbent Lisa Raid, again now ousted by Olympian Adam Vancouverton. What's the feel like right now, Janella? 
That's right, Mel. It was supposed to be a victory party tonight. At least that's what uh, Rates supporters were hoping for. But the mood's taken a little bit more of a subdued tone here with an upset after uh, the MP here who's uh, held this area for three terms uh, has been ousted tonight by newcomer Adam Vancouver, Din, a star candidate for the Liberals, a former Olympic kayaker, uh, has won this seat uh, with uh, with most of the polls reporting now, or it's in the thousands uh, dividing the two. Now, we spoke with Lisa Raitt a short time ago when she came in to give her concession speech here uh, about how she's feeling tonight after losing this seat. You know, we ran a really good election here in Milton. I'm proud of what we've done. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for me this time, but the voter always gets it right. So that's the, that's the verdict in Milton, and I'm grateful for the time I had. You were the deputy leader. You were held a number of cabinet positions. What's next for you now? Well, I had a great ride, first of all. I mean, my gosh, I've been very blessed. And some people try to get into Parliament and never make it. And I've been able to attain so much in 11 years. And right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a breath. Um, but, you know, the, there's, an order as ta there's an onerous tax ahead of, of having your office um, make sure it's passed on appropriately to the next member of parliament. I really take very seriously the files and the individuals who have come to us with issues. And I have great people who work in my office, Lynn and Alexandra, and they have real people who are asking them every day how certain things are going. We need to pass that over to the next, to the next member of parliament, Adam Vancouverton. And that's going to be what's on my mind first. As we mentioned there, Lisa Raitt, of course, the deputy leader for the Conservatives, so a big loss for that party tonight. Now, last election, she won by just five points and was one of the few uh, uh, Conservative ridings to win in the 905 during that big Liberal sweep. Uh, this year, it looks like about 5,000 votes are separating her and uh, Adam Vancouver did. So, it well, remains to be seen uh, where she'll head next. Uh, but again, as we mentioned, the deputy leader of the Conservative Federals has lost her seat tonight in Milton. And a race that's being watched with great interest across Canada is out in Vancouver Granville, where former Cabinet Minister Judy Wilson-Raybould is locked in a tight race to keep her seat. Uh, you can see that there is a very slight difference between just a couple hundred seats between her and the Liberal. She, of course, is running as an independent in the wake of the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Raybould uh, won her seat handily as a Liberal in 2015. So far, she is fending off Conservative Zach Segal by just a couple hundred votes. Wow. And that is an interesting one because I think people were expecting her to win a little bit more handily than yeah. than, than yeah. That. people thought it was a slam dunk. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there was some notion that hey, Jody Wilson Rabel for prime minister at one yeah. point or leader of the Liberal Party at one point. But I mean if she ends up winning that, it's purely on her name and and just you know those that maybe maybe felt that she took on, you know, the big bad Trudeau machine and, uh, and, and both all those the, things. Uh, I know that riding relatively well and both the Liberal and the Conservative candidates are both good uh, local candidates too mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, no uh, Taylor yeah. Noor Muhammad was one of the vice presidents of the Vancouver Olympics, has done a lot of work in Vancouver in the tech community and also for a number of charitable organizations, is, is well known, well liked and the Conservative candidate is, uh, is well known uh, local community uh, uh, activist too as well. So it's, that's a good scrap uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite call that one yet. Yeah, How much of a thorn in, in Trudeau's side would she be sitting as an independent in Ottawa? Well she's number 338 so enjoy yourself. <laughs> uh, it's she's uh, with great respect. Um, it's not that important. Yeah, she has no resources. None of the That's none right. of the backing that comes with the political party. It's basically her, and uh, you know she relies on teaming up with other people. So uh, you know she's just going to be basically a seat warmer. She's That's a reminder only assuming, though, though that no other party scam. would be interested in, in absorbing her into the fold. That's right. That's, yeah. That's yeah. true. But she's a reminder of what was a pretty significant scandal within the that Trudeau government. Yet. That isn't over yet. 
And so, yeah, I, but, but, but we shouldn't call this one <laughs> uh, by any means yet. Right. It's, so it's a squeaker. It might be, a, it might be a moot point. <laughs> any other surprises? I mean, Ralph Goodell, he's, he's a yeah. big mm -hmm. uh, conservative, or liberal, excuse me, yeah. who lost Since to conservative. 1974, we talked yeah. about, you know, he's been an MLA or an MP and won and lost for a very, very long time. I'm from Saskatchewan, and I was actually just out there visiting my parents. And, um, but he was a lone to liberal his, in a, a he big was wilderness. Always Right? He was yeah. always just the one, and I think Ralph Goodell often won purely on his name, and yes. he was a good constituency so. MP, and and he was he was very well liked. Um, and was but even they have to centrist, fall, right? Like even I think they that have he... to fall at some point too. So it's um, okay. Yeah. We're just going to send it to Adrian in the field, who's with Christian Freeland right now, celebrating her victory. The result is a strong endorsement of the work our government has been doing in supporting the middle class, in working with Canadians to create 1.1 million jobs since 2015, more than 800,000 Canadians lifted out of poverty, strong action on climate change, and in terms of next steps, let's let people finish counting the ballots. There are a lot of close races across the country, and I think all of us are looking forward to hearing from you. How tough is the job for your party? What, what work do you have left to do in foreign affairs? Yeah, that's all for you. Christian Freeland. Okay, Christian Freeland. How do you think Justin Trudeau is now going to be greeted by his liberal team? I mean, many might, would many, think that he put their, them in jeopardy with some of the scandals and missteps that we've seen over the last couple of years. It's not so much just uh, the scandals. I think it's the uh, the top-down management approach mm -hmm. that has hurt. The, I think when um, in 2015 the strength of his personality did get uh, many of the Liberals elected because I think what Canada needed was sort of a, a hard reset on our approach to immigration, our approach to science and climate policy, etc. And I, he seemed to embody those traits. And then the veneer began to slowly fall off, like like an ablative shield or something beginning to fall apart. And I think when you center your party around uh, your leader that way and don't allow for, let's say, like your, your uh, cabinet to exercise some independence, uh, when, for example, you have that uh, snc Lavalin uh, fiasco and uh, you're, you're basically uh, pressuring one of your cabinet members uh, to, uh, to, to possibly do a favor for a corporation that could do your, your party some favors in the province, it's it's not a good look for the rest of the party, I don't think. And I, I, I would I would say that um, you know for a lot for a lot of MPs that end up losing their seats, there's going to be I think a very long time resentment that he didn't live up to the promises that he made in 2015. But Randy? people vote for people, not parties. And I think that, you know, despite all of the transgressions, all of the issues that came up with Justin Trudeau, despite his leadership style, people actually went out and they cast a ballot for Justin yeah. Trudeau. Mm -hmm. And and they, they didn't cast as yep. many ballots and for I, other and people. I'm and sorry, so but in the last five days of this campaign, hundreds of people, in fact, thousands of people came out, community after community after community, to see this guy. This guy is in good shape with the party. I think he's in relatively good shape with his colleagues. You don't think but they need, some bridges with the they Liberal Party? need to change their management style. I okay. agree with you yeah. on that. I think it was, it, we went from 30 to 180 members of Parliament. You needed to kind of have some control under that circumstance. Mm -hmm. We're now a mature government. Cabinet needs to have more control. Elected people uh, need to have more control. We, we need to listen to Member of Parliament more. And there probably needs to be uh, subsequently a little less centralization in but the I, Prime you know, Minister's I, in office. In fairness to them, and so I'm right. hardly fair to this current Liberal government, um, that's how every Prime Minister's office works. And I'm not saying yeah. it's great, and I'm not saying it's acceptable. It's how Premier's office works. Yeah. And you always will have that sort of cascade of backbenchers and those who haven't felt like they have been, had their voice heard at the table that will be angry and will be frustrated and will be angry and frustrated with this result. You know, what they felt could have been, should have been an easy minor, a majority has now turned into a minority. It's, not, it's a decent one, for sure, no question. But there is going to be that component of the Liberal caucus that is always going to be disgruntled. It doesn't matter what party, if you don't feel you have a say at the table, if you feel it's too to top down from the PMO, which we actually heard from 20 various MPs that didn't run this time around, right. that said that this point PMO is particularly, we heard it from Conservatives, we've heard it before, and I frankly, I don't think that they're going to change it that much. Yeah. Really. Except Let's maybe turn to give them more profile. 
Exactly. And maybe give them a, on a committee and give yeah. them that opportunity to actually, you know, feel that they're representing their residents and their constituents in a, in a meaningful way. Well, let's turn to provincial politics here in Ontario for a moment. Do you think that there are a bunch of conservative MPPs who have been watching these results quite nervously? I, perhaps, but that election is three years away. Mm -hmm. Lots yeah, and can I think change, they have other problems. Will. I don't think that yeah. they see this as sort of indi an indication as to no. how they're going to do in three years. Yeah. I think that they've got to fix their own house and figure out how they're going to position themselves better, at least from a communications perspective, talking about some of the issues that matter, not picking fights with everybody, not even picking fights and then not following through with the fights. So I think they've got their own, their yeah. own challenges. Bob? I, I would agree with that. I, I, these guys have got to get their act together. They seem to have been doing that in the last uh, three or four months. Yeah, They've the turned uh, turned the uh, temperature down. Mm -hmm. Ministers are out working. Uh, definitely a different working relationship. As an example, uh, the Minister of Transportation with Mayor Tory to try to move some transportation mm -hmm. things forward. There were no conversations like that a year ago. Right. So I think things are moving generally in the right direction let's see if they can execute on those things but uh, but I think they need to get their house uh, in order and they're not worried about uh, this election just yet because they got a lot of time on their hands. Have we we'll seen see numbers how, on voter turnout we'll yet see, for yeah, this? Uh, yeah, we're yeah, waiting yeah, for that, that to be in. I'll so say yes, on the last yeah, point, Bob, sure. you probably want to wait to see how, you know, new, like freshman students that are going into school this fall yeah. that are getting a lot less money from OSAP I, I than agree. they thought they would. Yeah. And teachers, let's see how they feel next time around because those feelings linger. Yeah. It's interesting to see if what will unfold, though, on the, the provincial liberal leadership mm -hmm. and, you know, looking at some of the people that may... Not that a lot of people lost tonight, and, but certainly some liberal MPs um, that did um, go down in defeat may dip their toe in that. I mean, is that is that race even open anymore? Uh, or there's is the polls closed on that There's one? four or five candidates, I think. The race to get in closes in the next month. I, I, I don't think we will see any federal any of these names. Uh, MPs. And why would we want a defeated M federal MP? Uh. Uh, is this going to be some sort of messiah that I'm missing? Because uh, I'd rather elect to Michael Cotto, the candidate I'm supporting, or Stephen Del Duca, or a number of these people uh, who are putting uh, their names forward. Good uh, plugs for them. An MP <laughs> that, that went down in flames going on to possibly lead a province. When has that ever happened before? <laughs> Could it be happening right now? I don't know about that. All right, let's go to Victoria now on that note, where Green Party leader Elizabeth May spoke about her campaign and her party winning three seats. Let's take a listen. I'm certainly gratified that voters of Sandwich Gulf Islands did something really brave in 2011 when they defeated a sitting Conservative cabinet minister to, to give what they knew would be the only Green Party seat in Parliament and to elect me then and then re-elect me in 2015. I'm deeply honoured and I'm deeply grateful that the voters in Sandwich Gulf Islands have given me another... They've hired me on, right? Basically, it's a public service job. I work hard and I, I'm very grateful and honoured to have the continued um, choice of the voters in Saanich Gulf Islands. I, I'm deeply, deeply moved. Now, also expected tonight, but I'm sure also relief, Nanaimo Ladysmith has gone to Paul Manley. He won that seat in a by-election earlier this year. Have we called that one? Uh, Nobody I, told me yet, but I, I think we will. I, I think they're feeling pretty sure about that one. That's wonderful. One that I think was a bigger surprise was Fredericton, New Brunswick. Yeah. Talk to me what you think about, uh, about that win. Well, Jenica Atwin is a terrific candidate. She's worked really hard. You might notice as well that in the Maritimes, we had quite a few uh, coming in second, coming in second a few riders and PEI coming in second uh, with uh, Laura Rainsborough against Dominic LeBlanc. So we had strong campaigns across the Maritimes and really a strong campaign in Fredericton where uh, in my visits there, I've been there twice during the RIP period campaigning for Jenica and I felt a really strong sense of a green surge. Just to give you one indication, the campaign manager for Jenica told me that in the last election, we thought we'd really had a chance with Mary Lou Babineau, who was our candidate last time. They had 400 34 lawn signs up and the campaign manager told me this time we have a thousand lawn signs up and we've ordered more so I had that feeling that Fredericton was really in play and I couldn't be happier than to know that Jenica Atwin is going to be coming to join a larger green caucus in Ottawa. Now when we talked earlier you said you would be over the moon if you got six or more candidates. If it holds 
or seats, I should say, if it holds at three seats tonight, will you be satisfied? Well, I, I, what really matters is what we can do for the country and what we can do for Parliament, and that's a determination we really can't make till we have the final numbers from everyone. Right? One, one of my colleagues, because I work a lot with the Greens around the world, and uh, the former leader of the Green Party of Australia, Bob Brown, once had balance of power with one seat, one seat in Melbourne, Australia. That's all they had to determine who formed government, the far right or the far left. So in, in here in British Columbia, as we all know, We've three seats it. in 2017. So what, what we're hoping for is a position of what Adam Olson, my MLA, calls the balance of responsibility, where you can exercise a, a maturity, uh, an approach that tries to build consensus among the different parties, and that the bottom line is that we don't sell out our kids for short-term political advantage. We actually stick to our principles on climate action. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That's Green Party leader Elizabeth May. And so far, it's looking like they have three seats and waiting to see what happens throughout the rest of the night. Okay, I just want to bring you to this map. Of course, we've been watching the GTA all night long, and you can see at least the 416 all lit up in red, uh, not different from what we saw in 2015, liberal red. I want to bring you to a couple, though, uh, that we have been watching uh, right now. Uh, apologies. This one, of course, we've been following Jody Wilson-Raybould. But I want to bring you to two different Toronto ridings that we have been watching specifically, and that was uh, Davenport and Toronto Danforth, mm -hmm. which we thought could potentially have gone orange, and they are staying red. Uh, these ones are from previous, of course, uh, the incumbent, uh, Jagmeet Singh, uh, taking this in orange which we knew before. Now here's what we've been looking at. Toronto Danforth, here's where it stands right now. Uh, Julie DeRozan taking this one, and we thought potentially this might have been a little bit closer, taken by the NDP, uh, the former riding of the late Jack Layton. And uh, Richmond Hill, this is something that's been uh, very, very close right now, and we've been watching. We've got 212 of 237 polls reporting, and you can see a small, small margin between the two. So we will be watching to see what happens here. Meanwhile, our Mark McAllister is standing by live right now. Let's check in with you, Mark. Yeah, this was one of those ridings that we were watching as well. It's one of those ridings where obviously it was high profile because Jane Philpott was seeking her seat as an independent after losing it as part of the cabinet and the caucus, but lost that in the wake of the SNC-Lavalin affair. She came into this entire thing talking about trying to trying to party thing or how to uh, color things outside those color lines. Uh, that was her campaign slogan and so she wanted to talk about doing things differently and being able to get back to Ottawa and change the way things are done. When she came out here to uh, concede the fact that she's lost this riding in the end, she talked about that change and we had a chance to speak with her just a few minutes ago. You talked about a culture of change. What makes you think that the change can happen? Well, the response that we got from across the country was extraordinary. Have you ever heard of a politician that after two weeks after the election uh, comes in has to say, please don't send me any more money because the money was rolling in. That was a message from Canadians that say, we want to see something different. I got thousands of email messages, handwritten notes, cards, letters. Canadians want to see change. They want to see politics done differently. And we'll see what this has unleashed. Now that said, Helena Jasek is taking the seat as the Liberal candidate and she'll be joining uh, Justin Trudeau in Ottawa as a result. So perhaps it's party politics as usual, but she leaves here saying that this was a positive process in going through uh, her campaign and trying to make things change. And the one line that I'm going to walk away from this uh, campaign and uh, this evening, she says she's freeing from the prison of the status quo. We shall see with a minority government and how much things have actually changed. All right, Mark, we are back to check in on the national picture where the Conservatives are still leading the popular vote. The Conservatives uh, have, are sitting with more than 34 percent, while the Liberals are more than 1 percent behind. But they are being, not being rewarded. The Conservatives are not being rewarded in seats where the Liberals lead them by more than 30. Trudeau's party scooping up about 150 confirmed seats. Then further back are the NDP with just over 20 confirmed seats. The Green with three confirmed and the Bloc with 32 seats rising from the ashes. Nobody saw that one at the start of the campaign. Now, we'll, let's pick up this uh, chat with our panel. 
Elizabeth May, what is her future? I mean, <laughs> she ran a terrible, she ran a terrible Awful. campaign. She should continue as the member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Yeah. She's an important uh, environmental voice in, in the country, and it's time for her to move on from being the Green leader. They need to renew themselves. They need to renew their party. Think, yeah, the Green so. Party has a real... Uh, I think finally has the ear of the nation. This and, and should have been the breakthrough for and them. And especially for the youth. Be, yeah. It should be a breakthrough. They have the wrong person leading the charge. Their message isn't resonating. They don't speak clearly about what it is that they, they, what their platform is. I think that they need better people. And I think there's a time for change. But who's going who's gonna to push that forward? I mean, she's been there, what? Over a decade. She's been there a very long time. And every time we start a new campaign, in this one in particular, it was... <laughs> Let's, you know, everyone's ticked off with everybody else. Well, I had to heck with it. I'm going to vote green. You know, this was going to be Elizabeth May's opportunity. This was going to be all of these things. I mean, you saw it in the debate. She has an extraordinary depth when it comes to knowing the policies. She knows and the her issues. policy. Yes. But then she just yeah, keeps and it's going, and it's, it's an excessive amount of things. I just wanted just to say one observation. Um, with the board you just showed with respect to the popular vote, mm -hmm. you know who's breathing the biggest sigh of relief tonight? Julie Payette. The Canada, Canada's yes, governor general. You're absolutely right. She can right. send all of her constitutional yeah. lawyers home. We're not going to have this Phew, big dramatic. To, yes. um, you know, should he, shouldn't he resign or whatnot? But, but, but particularly on the Greens, um, they do have some thoughtful uh, policies, and they, they, they are not prepared to, you know, light our economy on fire to accomplish those. They, they can be reasonable. But who leads that? Is it Mike Schreiner, the guy that we had here with us earlier, uh, the leader of the Ontario Greens? I don't know. I don't know what is it a David membership? Miller? Is it, is a, it membership? Like a, a, a membership? You know, sort of former situation. mayor of Toronto, David Miller. I mean, there are lots of candidates right now that would pick up the the torch mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. you know, environmental that can add some value. Yeah. 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 The unfortunate thing with Elizabeth May is, like as you mentioned, she does have a, a, a deep understanding of policy mm -hmm. and how you know uh, green-based policy would affect Canadian business. Mm -hmm. The problem is, it's not, I don't think they said that she goes too deep. It's that she comes up with some very kooky ideas as to how they're going to be <laughs> what implemented. Was that the chain gang for... Uh, That's the official term. Yeah, 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 for SNC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, apparently she was one of sentence SNC to, uh, to community yeah. service, building um, water infrastructure for First Nations communities. And it's like, well, did you have a consultation with any of them first? But then it was also like really weird things like popping up on the Green Party <laughs> website and you know not being able to answer straightforwardly about a woman's right to choose and any of them like a dozen of other issues where and there's a kind of a, a straight foil foil section yeah. to her party too it's wing nut central they got to clear all that <laughs> out yeah. they, gotta clear they the need to get a, a leader that's like more mainstream <laughs> and she's impenetrable from a communications perspective i don't even understand her half the time like a tune yeah. out right away yeah. she started the, the, it, like it, she's it, into it, page 74 the appendix yeah. in it's a report powerpoint me don't but me like but, it's, but in a in, in a constant um, conversation everybody has had that we haven't talked about policy we haven't dealt she's actually tried she <laughs> has really right. genuinely tried she should try and less. it just goes to show you perhaps maybe this isn't uh, what they want to people want to hear interesting well, well that will be an interesting one to unfold we'll have to wait and see what the conservatives want to do and andrew Shear yeah. wants to do i think jagmeet singh has you know will live another day as the leader no of question the NDP. about that and and then trudeau is going to be walking a bit of a tightrope for the next uh, few months or so uh, he'll he'll have a very strong endorsement uh by the party mm -hmm. uh the party has to have a convention i think and usually after an election um, to kind of reconfirm the leader, at, at least that's been the rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the past, I don't know if it continues to be, but if it did, it wouldn't be a problem. He would win handily anyway. Oh, I wasn't trying to, I, I should correct myself, I wasn't yeah. trying to imply that he wasn't going to be the leader, uh, but I just think with a minority, he has to walk oh, a different yeah, I get it. a yeah. different Certainly. walk uh, For sure. now as, as prime minister. He's got minister. to find champions. He's got to find champions across the aisle, across all the aisles, and find the right people to that will, you know, within each party, that, that he can work with you know those people that are sort of more centrist whether they be you know center left or center right people that he can work with that can that when he thinks about prioritizing his legislative agenda he's got to find allies beyond the you know those within his circle within the party and i don't think it's going to be hard for him if these numbers hold ostensibly where they are it's 14 mm -hmm. votes right to get to that magical 170 yeah. it's possible it's with depending on the issue because you can be situational like Prime Minister Harper was like Paul Martin was um, in those minority government situations it's it's, it's eminently doable.
because okay. no one wants to go back to an election anytime well, soon. Uh, well, <laughs> and most of them are broke. <laughs> exactly, especially the NDP, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, Bob, you're a strategist. What would you say to Justin Trudeau right now to try and win over and, and, and ease the divide in the country? I think I think we probably need a little humility. I think we need to reach out to people in regions where we don't have seats. This has happened before in our country. Quite frankly, it happened to his father when he was yes, the prime minister. Right. So I think we we need to do a good job reaching out and talking to a number of people. Uh, and if the provinces don't want to talk, there's certainly lots of cities in those areas where you can go out and talk to to mayors and business leaders and others. Uh, but I think it's important really to spend some time to reach out and make sure that people feel that you're listening to them, uh, particularly when you don't have elected representation there. What do you think this will do to gun control? I mean, Trudeau wants to give municipalities the, the chance themselves to decide whether or not they should ban handguns, for example. How do you think that will be navigated going forward. I think the NDP is very supportive of that. So I think, I think they are. As are and the I also Greens, think it's so. a flash in the pan issue. I think yeah. it's one of those things that the the, yeah. the Liberals aren't going to really want to burn a whole bunch of political capital yeah. to try to see that through. I think that's there right. are other issues they Good care point. more about. Yeah. That said, um, they're they're probably that's one of the issues where I think they could find support. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a no-brainer. I think you could get quite a, a, a good chunk of votes uh, in. Uh, in the House of Commons to pass that. I'm but curious how many municipalities would actually take them up on it, though. I think one's well, Toronto would be one. Toronto, but across the country, how many? The major urban centers, mm -hmm. the major mm -hmm. urban centers yeah. certainly would. But on the notion of humility, um, he's going to have to learn that. We're going to have to hear a part of that tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's he's going to be speaking. You know, we will hear the typical, you know, thank you to supporters, et cetera, thank you, country. But I now recognize that this is a situation where I am. You know, we have work to do out west. We have work to do across this country to make sure everyone's tr feeling like they're part of our, our, um, you know, united nation, so to speak. But that's that will be challenging for Justin Trudeau, and I think that's perhaps one of the biggest knocks against him internally, externally, that he doesn't show any semblance of hubris or humility. Well, right, I think on that note, yeah, let sorry. me just interrupt, sorry. We'll come back on that. Uh, we're joined now by Adrian Gobriel from Christian Freeland's riding of University of Rosedale, where the crowd is celebrating a big oh, win for the Liberals. Adrian. Yes, uh, Sin, the drinks are flowing tonight here on College Street. Earlier, as you heard live, Krista Freeland in her exception speech, thanking a lot of these volunteers who are here tonight. They say that Krista, rather, Krista says that they enabled her to travel coast to coast. Similar to Justin Trudeau, she helped 39 candidates across the country, and there's many who have been talking about her leadership qualities. We'll have to wait and see what the future holds when it comes to her place with the Liberal Party. Obviously, we know she had a massive file of foreign affairs during the last four years, uh, and uh, tonight she didn't really want to speak too much about what the future holds for the Liberals, as you've been discussing tonight on the panel and as you've been hearing at home. Uh, you know, it's a very different Liberal government we're going to see in Ottawa, a minority government. We tried to ask Krista tonight what that means for her party, the challenges they're facing. She simply just wanted to enjoy the night. She said votes are still being counted. The one big win for the Liberals tonight is they continued the trend from the last election. Every single riding in Toronto, all 25 seats going Liberal red. That wasn't a sure thing heading into tonight. Many thought the NDP might slip in into a few ridings. The Conservatives were pushing hard in certain spots, but as we saw, a Liberal tidal wave again across Toronto, though, a minority government. Though here tonight, there was a sense of tension at the beginning of the evening, and then that turned, I think, a lot to relief. So lots of people out here tonight. Krista Freeland, along with her volunteers, were out pulling the vote this evening. She still won this riding comfortably, and people are enjoying themselves tonight. All right, Adrian, thank you very much. Okay, when we finished our last panel discussion, Adrian Batra was talking about how she feels Justin Trudeau has a lack of humility. Randy, I'm going to give you the floor on that one now. I was just going to agree with Adrian that that's exactly what he has to do. He has to get, go out there and actually make people feel like he understands that he's been given a bit of a slap on the wrist. And I think that the challenge is he might be okay with the words. But he, he's not good at actually making people, and I think he said those words before. He's tried to come to come across as, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I think so. But it doesn't ring true. So I think it's going to be like a real, yeah, the, let's see if, uh, if, if you know. Actions meet the words. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Andre? I, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't really have a lot of uh, confidence that the the empathy that uh, Justin Trudeau has to exude to Canadians from different regions to to really like begin to solve this regionalism problem that has dogged this country for uh, for literally since since uh, since Confederation. Mm -hmm. um, Adrian, you kept alluding to the idea that uh, you know Albertans are dissatisfied, could be upset. There's talk about separation, etc. I don't think that that's what has to be spoken to. I think it's really just to like the average Canadian who doesn't dial into politics as heavily as the rest of us do. You basically, like catch it on the news as they come home from work, and they've just been having a very hard time getting ahead in this country. I think those are the people that uh, the prime minister has to go out and speak to. I don't think where it comes, even for like you know commies like myself. Or, uh, or, other, <laughs> other, or other other pundits. I, I don't think that he has to come out and speak to us and, and, and satisfy us. I think he has to satisfy the needs of the average Canadians who feel like they just can't get ahead in this country. Bob? Uh, yeah, I think he's got a he's got a big task. He's got a he's got to take on the whole issue of regionalism. I think he's got a he does particularly have to speak to Albertans if we've been shut out. So I think they need to feel that he is listening. I think it's also important for him to speak to some Quebecers. The bloc went from being inconsequential to right. 35, mm -hmm. 36 seats. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, and it's a big chunk of people off the island of Montreal uh, who are out in rural parts of Quebec particularly. It'll be important for him to be speaking to them and reaching out to them too as well. I'm pretty confident he can do that. I think he... Uh, He's shown his abilities to speak to people and 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 act on their uh, on their concerns before, uh, but I think he, they've got to double down and get focused and and really make sure they do it because if they don't, I think things could get inflamed over a period of time. It can't be business as usual. I think is what we're all saying in our own way. I think so. Yeah, yeah. and I think Canadians have sent that message that they're not prepared to give any one of them the confidence of the country in a majority situation that they will have to work together. I mean, Canadians don't, pl you can't plan to give you a minority government, there's no question about that, but this is the situation in which we find ourselves in. And it's workable, and it can, and, and it can function. Um, it's going to matter how long it lasts, and I think it's all going to be based on the actions of the Prime Minister. That's, I think, will be the measure of, of how long this minority will last. Uh, to your point earlier that Julie Payette is the happiest person Probably. after this election. Um, <laughs> it is interesting because the scenarios were so wild That's and right. and and Sheer himself was saying, hey, if I get, you know, the most seats, I am I should be the one ruling a, a minority government, not mm -hmm. him, even if he can cobble together some sort of agreement. Mm -hmm. So that has been averted, it, it appears, and Trudeau has some time to be able to, to get an agreement with other parties. Uh, let's talk about Gerald Butts for a moment, who stepped down after the SNC-Lavalin scandal. He and Trudeau are old friends, and he he was very a very big part of the inner circle. Is he still going to be out, or is he still going to have a say in this government? I think he's moved on with his life, and he's got lots of uh, uh, great opportunities in the private sector, and I think he's uh, doing well and appears to be pretty happy. I think liberals across the country owe him a debt of gratitude for coming back for the campaign. He did a good job working with the Prime Minister and the campaign uh, team. Uh, he was a good defender of the government on Twitter and uh, a whole variety of other areas. He's a smart communicator. He did a good job. I hope for his sake and his family's sake he stays out and enjoys himself. Uh, but I think if he wanted to come back, I'm sure he'd be welcome to, to as well. I also think he's, he's a lightning rod, right? He's mm -hmm. a lightning rod of attention mm -hmm. for those that support the Prime Minister, for those that don't support the Prime Minister. And I think that it's in every Everybody's probably best interest if he just moved on, Be not because he's necessarily done anything wrong, yeah. but just because he is a lightning rod for this issue. He's a constant mm -hmm. reminder of the SNC Lavalin scandal yeah. to some degree through media, and I think that you know, to the extent that we can put that in a box, that would be a good thing. Even yeah. in caucus, though, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the other. That's the other thing. It is. There's always the rumors that um, there will be change in staffing in this. I mean, we hear. I mean, but it's not an unreal, unreasonable thing. Being a political staffer is exhausting and, and it takes hours and it takes away from your family and it takes away from so many things. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of those senior staffers that have been very close with Justin Trudeau since he became an MP many years ago or even when he became Prime Minister in 2015. It's to move on. I, I would expect a huge, a yeah, huge a change, change, change just because it's, it's time for that to happen. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm sorry, am I throwing to Mel? 
I think now, no, we're going to keep going. We have uh, Jagmeet Singh very soon coming up, who's going to give his speech, and it will be interesting to hear from him. Again, you know, there were very low expectations for him at the start of this campaign, and I think he surpassed all of them and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. So I think he's he's held himself with, with a lot of grace and style throughout this campaign and had some really interesting moments along the way. I would say that uh, there's a lot of credit that he gets for running the kind of campaign that he's run. Or uh, The more Canadians got to know him, the more they seemed to like him. As far as positive to negatives, he is the most popular leadership uh, candidate out of all the, uh, the major parties right now. He came across as the most authentic, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he, he comes across like somebody who's not uh, it, it overly polished. He doesn't come across like a politician. He's, he comes across like your average human thrust into the position of party leadership. That being said, he did experience a tremendously long and I think overly long decline in terms of the party fortunes, his, uh, his own image with the rest of Canada, the, drag, uh, the dragged out by-election scenario, the, uh, the, the, uh, the interview that he gave with uh, CBC in regards to the, uh, the Khalistani movement. There were just so many negatives going into the campaign that I think a lot of people had doubts as to whether he was going to be able to pull this off or whether he would be remaining on board as party leader after this election. Luckily, he's been able to turn that around, but I think this is the opportunity right now for the NDP to show what kind of party they can be. I was saying to Bob earlier off camera that the NDP has a tremendous task ahead of itself. And that's counter, it's uh, balancing two interests. One is, you know, the interests of uh, downtown progressives in metro poles like Toronto, uh, like the one that you're talking to right now. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, you know, uh, people who are oil and gas workers, people who work in, let's say, the, uh, the GM plant in Oshawa, which is, uh, there's a threat of it closing down. The blue-collar working class people that have made up for the majority of the NDP's existence, the bulk of that party, managing to balance those two interests, I think, is going to be very interesting and perhaps difficult for, uh, for Jagmeet. So it's, and the it'll be interesting to see how that goes forward. the governments have really almost eaten away yeah. at that base. And the interesting thing, I think, from my perspective with Jagmeet is he was very charismatic, he was very personable, but he was a great third party leader he never mm -hmm. actually made like I felt like he could just couldn't punch at their weight and and you know I think he needs to shift his tone shift his way shift his personality uh, slightly he, he, in order to contend with that he did, I thought he did a very good job for the NDP uh, during the election period I thought he was a good leader yeah. but uh, I also thought he got up pretty much of a free ride yes, from the yeah. media for oh, the last two, two weeks and also he's great on the first question not so good on the second on the or third up, yeah so he's got to do a lot of work uh, yeah. in terms of uh, uh, raising his knowledge on issues and being able to uh, participate in the cut yeah. and thrust if of those you, sort of you, a few shots he's just too. not ready how did that go last time uh, what's, you what's know, that? <laughs> i actually liked the guy i thought okay. he was and i thought he was a good mpp I thought he was a terrible leader of, of the NDP until the election was called. That's right. And then I thought he did a, a good job in that period. You know, he's he's pretty, pretty consistent. Too. On that note, yeah. I'm just going to throw it to Mel, Melanie Ng over here. She's got some updated numbers for us, Mel. Cynthia, thank you so much. Uh, this tweet just coming in from U.S. President Donald Trump. Congratulations to Justin Trudeau on a wonderful and hard-fought victory. Canada is well served. He says, I look forward to working with you toward the betterment of both of our countries. So again, this tweet just coming in a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot to be proud of with a Liberal Party with none of the cabinet ministers in the GTA actually losing their seats, including Bill Morneau, of course, was finance minister. Christa Freeland as foreign minister. Amal Hussein, who's minister of immigration also winning a seat there bill blair for border security and crime also winning for the liberals carolyn bennett crown indigenous relations winning her seat for the liberals as well uh, when it comes to science and sport christy duncan winning her seat as well and moving a little bit outside of toronto moving through the gta karina gould who is democratic institutions minister winning her seat and navdeep baines minister of innovation and science winning as well for the liberals so uh, a lot to uh, be proud of, at least for the Liberal Party here. Happening now, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Let's dip in.
You are watching the crowd, a jubilant crowd, as NDP leader Jagmeet Singh goes to make his speech. He, of course, won his riding, but didn't do quite as well as, of course, his party was hoping with 25 seats. Those Not, people didn't so do hard. quite. Look how happy they are. Didn't do quite well. I think <laughs> it's got wiped out in Quebec. I mean, all the gains that Jack Layton, of course, made. Yep. Um, have wiped been out. eroded by Thomas Mulcair and now, of course, by um, Jagmeet Singh. But nonetheless, this is I'm this saying, is a moment. This is a moment. All right, we are going to listen in to what Jagmeet Singh has to say with his wife by his side. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you so much. Oh, man, the love. The love is real. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I appreciate the love. Merci infiniment pour votre présence, votre implication. C'est vraiment un honneur d'être ici parmi vous. For your involvement. Thank you for all that you did. Uh, Before friend, I go any further, I want to acknowledge the traditional territories that we're gathered upon. <laughs> the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, the Kwikwetlem, the First Nations. <laughs> My friends, this has been an incredible night. It's been an incredible campaign, an incredible journey, and it is such an amazing honor to be home here in British Columbia with all of you. I also want to take a moment to congratulate Mr. Trudeau and the Liberal Party for their the evening's results. I want to congratulate them, the new Prime Minister. And I, and I spoke with Mr. Trudeau, the Prime Minister, earlier tonight, and I let him know that we'll be working hard on making sure we deliver the priorities that Canadians have, that all of you have, and we're working on that. We're going to make sure that the energy that we built over this campaign, the excitement that we built, and the focus that we put on people, on people's struggles, continues, and so that we can play a constructive and positive role in the new parliament that Canadians have chosen. I want you to know, this is always going to be our focus. When we get back to Ottawa, every single day that we're in parliament, New Democrats are going to be working hard to make sure your life is better, so that Canadians' life is better, so that people's life are better. I also want to congratulate the other leaders, the parties, Mr. Scheer, Ms. May, and Mr. Blanchet. I want to congratulate anyone, anyone who allowed their name to stand for any party. It's a tough thing to do, and I want to thank you all. I got to tell you, I'm really proud to have been able to lead a team that is the most diverse, that represented women, that represented LGBTQ.
This team, this team was one of the most caring and the most diverse team that we've been able to run, and I'm so honored to be able to lead that team. And I want to thank, I want to thank the tens of thousands of volunteers that came out to support our campaigns and our teams across this country. There are far too many people for me to name. I'm sure you can imagine that. <laughs> but I'm just going to name just a couple. Uh, first off, someone who's been beside me, by my side throughout this journey, throughout this adventure, uh, my wife, my life partner, Grikidin. She stole the show. She stole the show once already. I would love for her to steal the show again. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank my family, uh, my brother, my, my mom and dad, and my sister, everyone who's been uh, such a big support to me throughout my life, my friends, uh, and my team in Ottawa, my team here in BC, my team across the country. Thank you so much. Now, now, again, there's far too many people for me to name, but if I can just name two people that, that can represent the entire team that I have, it's hard to do that, but there's two people I think you wouldn't mind if I, re if I recognize. Uh, they don't know I'm doing this, but I want to recognize two people, in fact, two incredible women that were uh, integral to this campaign, and I'm proud to say they're women. It's something that's really powerful in our, in our party. Uh, <laughs> My, my campaign director, Jennifer Howard. And my national director, Melissa Bruno. Two of the most powerful positions in our party were young, or not young, well, kind of youngish. <laughs> Young, powerful women. Let's just say they're powerful women. Either Melissa or Jennifer are going to get really mad at me over that one. Now. <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the, uh, the incredible people of Burnaby South for re-electing me, giving me the honor. I, I'm humbled. I'm humbled that you put your trust in me. Thank you. And I'm going to continue to work inc incredibly hard for you, to work with you, to work for you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I got to tell you, I've met throughout this campaign some incredible people, some inspirational people. Uh, and I'm inspired by them. Their stories have stuck with me. I've met these folks across the country, folks that, that inspire the work that we do as New Democrats. And one of those people is a young man, a young boy, barely 10 years old, who lives with a chronic illness, and told me that he wasn't worried about the chronic illness, wasn't worried about the medication and the injections, wasn't worried about the fact that if he didn't stay up on, on top of his medication or his blood work, he might, he might die. He told me he wasn't worried about any of that. He was just worried that his medication was costing a lot to his mom and dad. He worried about being a burden to his family. I, I remember that young, that young man. And I remember that young man and the fact that someone as young as that felt like he was a burden in a country as rich as ours. And that's a part of the reason why we're fighting. We're fighting for that young man. I also want to talk about Gracineros, a community, a community that represents the injustice historically and ongoing that Indigenous people continue to face. There are people of Gracineros who are so resilient in the face of neglect and negligence, 
and being ignored, and being told they don't matter, being ridiculed. We brought the national campaign to Gracieneros to let them know that they do matter, that they are worthy. And that indigenous reconciliation is sometimes as simple as basic respect and dignity for the first people of this land. And that means clean drinking water. That means... That means not taking indigenous kids to court. That means equal funding for child welfare, for education and quality homes. Mes amis, j'ai rencontré des jeunes. My friends, I have met young people from all walks of life who went through such difficult periods and they had become cynical with politicians. They weren't convinced, but they told me, you look like us, you speak like us, you're like us, you see us. So I want to say thank you to people from Quebec. Thank you. Of course, the results didn't meet our expectations. However, I was greeted in such, with such warmth in Quebec that I was moved by it. And this first electoral appointment enabled us to discover one another. And I was able to show you that we were sharing the same values. And I'm grateful for the support that we received tonight, uh, but that wasn't enough. We will continue to fight for you. Thank you, thank you. We will not let Quebec down. We will continue to be here, and I, I will continue to be present in Quebec. And I said that we will bring together progressive people from Quebec and from the rest of Canada, and together we can do it, we can make it, and we will do it. Jack, Jack had started the work, and we must continue the work that was started by Jack, because progressive people, that's us. Thank you, my friends, and see you very soon. And we will continue. Friends, throughout this Friends, campaign, I've heard a lot of stories about Canadians, from Canadians, who are struggling and just want to build a good life, but are finding it harder and harder to do so. And to those Canadians, I want to say to you this tonight. You Democrats are going to Ottawa to fight for you. Yeah. And friends, in the days ahead, I'll be meeting my new caucus, and we're going to sit together and talk and discuss about how we can deliver for the people of this country. Because the real winner of this election is not a party or a leader. The real winner of any election should always be the people, and that means Canadians. And Canadians, and Canadians sent a pretty clear message, a clear message tonight that they want a government that works for them, not for the rich and the powerful, not for the well-connected. And if, and if, exactly, exactly. And if all MPs, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk. I'm sorry about that. 
And, and if all MPs elected tonight hear that message and act on that message, then the real winners of this election will be the people. Les Canadiens, merci. Les Canadiens et Canadiennes ont envoyé un message clair ce soir. Ils veulent Tonight, they want a government that works for them, not for the rich and not for the multinationals, but for them, the men and women of Canada. Et, et si tous les députés élus ce soir and if all the members who have been elected tonight hear that message and act accordingly, the real winners of tonight's election will be the people. So, uh, I so wanna, I let you I know, New Democrats you know, are going to work hard to deliver the following results. We're going to work hard to make sure young people have a future with, that's filled with hope. We want, that's right, we want young people to be filled with hope. We want to make sure that Canada is a leader in the global fight against the climate crisis. We want, we want families to have a more affordable life. And we want a Canada that's a nation that takes reconciliation seriously. And, and you know this, with New Democrats, for us, reconciliation is more than just a word. It requires real action. Real action. So, so here's what New Democrats are going to seek to do when we work with other parties to achieve. These are our commitments. These are the things that we want to continue to fight for. If you need medication in our country, we want to make sure you use your health card, not your credit card. That means a national, publicly delivered, single-payer, pharmacare for all. We want to help Canadians be able to get a home that they can afford. And what we mean by making life afford more affordable is not a, a tax cut for the richest Canadians, but tackling student debt by waiving all interest on student loans. That's right. That means, that means taking on the big telecom companies and putting a cap on cell phone bills. real and urgent action to fight the climate crisis, which includes ending fossil fuel subsidies and reinvesting in clean, renewable energy. And to make sure, absolutely, we've got to invest in housing. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And we're also going to make sure we're going to make sure we, we're going to do something that no one else is uh, ready to say, but we're proud to say, and we're going to say it again and again because we're going to get it done. We're going to make sure that the super wealthy start paying their fair share. We're on it. <laughs>
That's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> My friends, that's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> these, these are the priorities of people. These are the priorities of people that New Democrats will put at the heart of the conversations that we're going to have in the days and weeks to come. And if, and if the other parties work with us, we have an incredible opportunity to make the lives of all Canadians so much better. And even, we even have, a, we even have an opportunity to even change the way we do politics in this country. I want to talk to the many Canadians that rejected the call to vote out of fear and thank them for voting for hope. And if, if any elections show the importance of this issue, this election showed it, with electoral reform, we can make sure... And there you have it. Just as Jagmeet Singh is wrapping up his speech, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer takes the stage and he is about to make his speech. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. It is always so great to be back in Saskatchewan. <laughs> now, first and foremost, I want to thank the voters of Regina Capel for once again electing me as your member of parliament. And thank you to all the volunteers that worked hard in the campaign office and who knocked on doors, put up signs. Joan Bayless, thank you so much for running a campaign <laughs> while well, I was... Being the Member of Parliament for Regina Capella is an honour that I will never take for granted, and I will work hard every day to repay the trust that you have put in me. I also say thank you to all 336 Conservative Party candidates for your hard work during this campaign. And a special note of congratulations for my two new colleagues here in Regina, Warren Steinle in Regina Louvan and Mike Cram in Regina Wascana. And while Andrew Scheer speaks, Liberal leader and, and Prime Minister the country who designate, I suppose, well, the, the winner years, of the minority government, door, Justin Trudeau, is now about to give his victory speech as well. From coast to the coast to the coast, tonight Canadians rejected division and negativity. They rejected cuts and austerity, and they voted in favor of a progressive agenda and strong action on climate change. I have heard you, my friends. You are sending our Liberal team back to work, back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. We will make life more affordable. We will continue to fight climate change. We will get guns off our streets, and we will keep investing in Canadians. Les Canadiens nous ont confié la responsabilité de continuer à gouverner. Mais rien de tout ça n'aurait été possible sans les efforts et les sacrifices de beaucoup, beaucoup de monde. People, I have a tremendous number of people to thank, so I spent a lot of time, or I should, will be spending a lot of time on the phone 
in the next few days. But there are a few people I have to thank right now. First of all, my Sophie. We started this political adventure together over 10 years ago because we believed in a better future, because we knew that it was worth fighting for, fighting for a Canada that was stronger and more prosperous. Sophie, I am so lucky to have you by my side. Thank you. I love you. Thank you, my love. I love you. To my children, Xavier, Ella, Grace, and Adrien, they're asleep right now. Every day, you inspire me to do more and to do better. And everything I do, I do for you and your generation. Every day, you remind me to take a few moments to appreciate the life that we have together and the luck we have. And out of everything that I do, my favorite thing to be is your father. I love you so very much. And to the very best campaign team ever assembled in Canada, our incredible candidates, staff, and volunteers. None of this would have been possible without you. Thank you for the early mornings and the late nights. You've sacrificed a lot, taking time away from your families and friends to move Canada forward. And I cannot thank you enough, so instead I'll simply say this. You did it, my friends. Congratulations. To the leaders of the other parties and their families, thank you for being a part of this essential exercise in democracy. You have chosen to serve. Thank you for stepping up in this campaign and in this political life. Je dois bien sûr remercier les gens de Papineau. Papineau. You have put your trust in me for over 10 years now, and it is a great privilege for me to continue representing you and to remain a strong voice for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can count on you. Thank you. And of course, to my fellow Canadians. It has been the greatest honor of my life to serve you for these past four years, and tonight you're sending us back to work for you. We take this responsibility seriously, and we will work hard for you, for your families, and for your future. To those who voted for our party, thank you for putting your trust in our team. Thank you for having faith in us to move this country in the right direction. And to, those, and to those who did not vote for us, know that we will work every single day for you. We will govern for everyone. And regardless of how you cast your ballot, ours is a team that will fight for all Canadians. Mes chers Québécois, j'ai entendu votre message ce soir. Quebecers, I heard your message tonight. You want to continue moving forward with us, but you also want to ensure that Quebec's voice sounds out even louder in Ottawa. And I give you my word that my team and I will be there for you. And to Canadian Alberta and Saskatchewan, know that you are an essential part of our great country. I've heard your frustration, and I want to be there to support you. Let us all work hard to bring our country together. Yeah. 
For the past four years, we've done everything we can to improve every Canadian's life, and that is what we will continue doing in the coming years. Dear friends, you've sent us back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. Keep moving this country forward. You have asked us to invest in Canadians, to continue our process of reconciliation with Indigenous people, and to make that a priority. You have asked us to show even more vision and ambition as we tackle the greatest challenge of this era, climate change. That is exactly what we will do. We know that there is a tremendous amount of work yet to be done, but I give you my word that we will continue what we have begun. Because the Liberals know, as all Canadians know, that it is always possible to do better. One of my favorite Prime Ministers, Wilfrid Laurier, often talked about patriotism and the unifying power of common goals and aspirations. And I've thought about that a lot since getting into politics. In my conversations with Canadians right across the country, I've seen firsthand that there is so much more that unites us than divides us. Canadians expect us all to focus on our shared vision of a stronger Canada, and I intend to work hard to make that a reality. We all want safer communities, a cleaner planet, and a good quality of life. We want this for ourselves, for our neighbours, and for our kids and grandkids. We seek hardship for none and prosperity for all. That is the world we're working toward. And if we unite around these common goals, I know we can achieve them. In in the years ahead, our team will work hard to build on the progress made by the Canadians who came before us. We will champion Canada in all its diversity. We will give voice to the voiceless. And in every decision we make as your government, we will always put this country and its people first. On va aider la veuve. We will help uh, widows who have lost their spouses after 40 years. We will do more for students who marched uh, for climate. We will be there for mothers who have to have two jobs and three children and who need a bit of help at the end of the month. People, including people like Dean. These last few days, I've done rallies across the country, and in a few of them, I've told Dean's story. Dean had voted Conservative his entire life, but this time around, he decided to vote Liberal on behalf of his daughter. You see, he understood that this election was about so much more than just the next four years, that this election is about the next 40 years. It's about the kind of Canada that his daughter and her kids will grow up in. But tonight, I want to say this to Dean. I need to earn your vote, not just your daughter's. And over the coming years, I plan on doing exactly that. My friends, this election was about you, about the world your kids will inherit. And tonight, we chose to move Canada forward. Tonight, Canadians have charted a path for the future, and I know we will walk it together. Nous allons avancer ensemble vers un avenir meilleur. Together, toward a better future. Thank you all. Thank you, Montreal. Thank you.
Justin Trudeau concluding his victory speech. A minority win, so he went from 184 seats down to 157, shy from the 170 seats that he needed for a majority. That was highly unusual that Justin Trudeau would have been speaking over Andrew Scheer, who had just taken his the stage to give his speech. I've only seen that once before, and it was it was really criticized. And that was when Doug Ford took the stage the same time Kathleen Wynne was speaking after she lost uh, party status, even yeah. and was and was giving a speech. So I don't know how that happens, but it is bad form. It is just absolutely it's bad not, form. But I think it's I think this was more poor coordination because I don't think anyone anticipated that Jagmeet Singh would have gone on as long. So yeah. aren't they talking to each other? Aren't they no. communicating? But they should yeah. be. The staff you know. usually talk to each other, but yeah. maybe there's something got lost in translation had, and had the NDP not uh, ventured on the Gettysburg address <laughs> you think we might have had an organized speaking thing not, so. not a if, start if, to a minority if, parliament if there's somebody Some who needs to be enough. singled out here I think it's Mr. Singh and his advisors uh, <laughs> for going too long we for going too long. the Dave Chappelle for, wrap it up box for that one yeah. for yeah. our viewers we are going to in a moment we're just queuing up uh, Andrew Shear's speech and we will have mm -hmm. that for you in a moment in fact we have it right now it's ready Let's listen to what Andrew Scheer had to say that we were unable to listen to. And while tonight's result isn't what we wanted, I am also incredibly proud. Proud of our team, proud of our campaign, and proud of the bigger and stronger conservative team that we will send to Ottawa. Now, there are still a number of really close races, so we don't know for sure how many more Conservatives Canadians will send to Ottawa tonight. But what we do know is that after the 2015 election, when Justin Trudeau looked unstoppable, when all the pundits and experts said it was the beginning of another Trudeau dynasty, that he would have eight or even 12 years in power. But tonight, Conservatives have put Justin Trudeau on notice. And Mr. Trudeau, when your government falls, Conservatives will be ready and we will win. And there you have it, Andrew Scheer laying down the gauntlet in his final moments of that speech. Interesting to note, Jagmeet Singh, who gave a very long speech, was also giving his laundry list of what yes. he wanted mm -hmm. from Justin right. Trudeau. Pharmacare, help for Grassy Narrows, affordable home, climate crisis, end fossil fuel subsidies, uh, and, and more and more and more. Uh, that's a big list that yeah. he wants it's, from you Justin got, Trudeau. You got to pay to play. Then it's expensive. You got to pay to play, Justin Trudeau. I think that's the message he's saying. Yeah. I'm happy to play. Let's start those conversations, but it's gonna. Yeah, that message wasn't for NDP supporters tonight. That was directly at Trudeau and his advisors and saying that this is what my cost of support right. will be. And or it's going else. To be a huge cost to Canadians financially. Well, I mean, these are also uh, many of them promises that the Liberals made in 2015 that hadn't yet been followed up on. So, Interesting really, enough. it's just Interestingly a, enough. It's a matter mm -hmm. of keeping promises, is it? And when you talk about cost, I mean, come on now. As we've, we've already been through this one in the press, when we're talking about, say, water infrastructure for First Nations, are we really going to? put a price tag on that or no one's is... talking about putting that i mean you're the yeah. self-professed communist tonight you should know <laughs> you should know okay. that all of those individuals that you talk about that you want to May help in this canadians canadians want to help them everybody wants to pay their their fair share in this country to ensure mm -hmm. that the, those dollars go to those who need it mm -hmm. the challenge has always happened with especially in the last four years Taxpayers' dollars haven't been spent properly. They've been wasted. They've been squandered. They should be going to First Nations communities. Yeah, they should be going to, to uh, looking at affordable housing. They should be going to those things that actually help the average Canadian. That's just not happening. And so no one's talking about not paying their fair share. But someone has to pay the bill. Andre, at mm -hmm. some point it comes due. Maybe if we stopped, uh, you know, allocating money for oil and gas subsidies and perhaps hadn't bought the pipeline, we wouldn't have to have, have this given, conversation. All right, let's, let's move this conversation issue. forward to some of the other things. Uh, Jagmeet Singh also said that he wants the wealthy to pay their fair share and he wants electoral reform. So mm -hmm. there's, there's, the you know, a big reform. part of his laundry list. How much is Justin Trudeau going to dance with him well, on that? Well, let's uh, get some proportionality here. 
somebody just went from 40 seats in the House of Commons down to 25. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, uh, well, somebody, mind, somebody, somebody, right, somebody just went from 40 seats. Somebody Jack just went first. from 40 seats okay. down to 25. He's not getting a blank check. Nobody gets a blank check. But nobody's talking uh, about He'll a blank have check. an opportunity to have discussions with in the duly elected government, and, and he'll seats. and we'll see. And by the way, if if you can't uh, do a deal with him, maybe we go back to the people. But there'll be a, there'll be an opportunity to have discussions. There's a progressive agenda here. We can make progress, but no one leader or no one party, particularly one that just lost 40% of its members of parliament, mm -hmm. gets to dictate everything that goes on. That's an excellent point. Except Justin Trudeau is going to need his help. You know he what? Just really he will. can also get help from the Conservative Party. That's right. He and can get help from the Bloc. He can get help from the Greens. Would, yeah. Certainly happened under Mr. Harper, happened under Mr. That's Martin, it, happened in a variety of other minority situations. This guy doesn't have a blank uh, check, and we don't want to give anybody a blank check. Well, the cool yeah, thing about the block is that they also have a bunch of progressive policy solutions as well. So they, they have many good uh, they have yeah. uh, many good progressive policies too as well. Okay, well, it's definitely going to be a very interesting next couple of years. If if history repeats mm -hmm. itself, we've got a couple of years, perhaps, of a minority government. Uh, we have a couple of minutes to just wrap up your final thoughts. I'll give you a few seconds each. Randy, we'll start with you. I think it was interesting, uh, just just uh, maybe touching upon the concession speech, that or not concession speech, the speech that Justin Trudeau mm. um, just gave to the Canadian people. You know, I think that we talked about the task that he had before him, which was to, you know, appeal to voters everywhere. I think he said the right words. I think he talked about, uh, he, you know, singled out Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular. He singled out Quebec as well. Um, I think he said the right words. I think that, you know, he's still going to have, I think the biggest challenge for this government is going to be to get the right people on side, whether that be the right people on the ground in terms of constituents or whether that be the right people in terms of uh, members of parliament who can support his platform. That's going to be this government's biggest challenge. Okay, we have about 20 seconds. Adrian, I'm going to give you the final 20. Well, I just, I'm just going to simply say, um, and I, I hope that most of us will agree on this, the big job facing this uh, Liberal government right now is mending those issues in terms of our national unity, dealing with those regional challenges that are certainly they are facing. And yes, he said the right words, but the rhetoric has to match the actions. And that means not picking fights with every Conservative Premier across this country. Well, that'll be interesting because there are a lot more Conservative Premiers right. when, than when he started his first exactly. term. Thank you very much to my amazing panel for thank sticking you. it out with me. Thank you. One thirty in the morning. I was worried I was going to be here alone. So thank you very much for thank your you. insight, your expertise, and and your humor. <laughs> if you would like to watch any of tonight's speeches from the leaders, including Elizabeth May, who will be speaking shortly in Victoria, head to citynews.ca. That is where you will find also the riding by riding results and analysis. We'll also have extensive coverage in just a few hours on BT, in just a few hours really, beginning at 5.30. Thank you very much for watching. Good morning.